Harper Audio presents Darkness Take My Hand by Dennis Lehane Performed by Jonathan Davis When I was a kid, my father took me up on the roof of a freshly burned building. He'd been giving me a tour of the firehouse when the call came in, and I got to ride beside him in the front seat of the fire engine, thrilled to the feel of it turning corners as its back half buckled and the sirens rang and the smoke poured blue and black and thick ahead of us. An hour after they'd doused the flames, once my hair had been ruffled by his fellow firemen a dozen times, and I'd been fed my limit of street vendor hot dogs as I sat in the curb and watched them work. My father came and took my hand and led me up the fire escape. Oily wisps of smoke curled into our hair and caressed the brick as we climbed. And through broken windows I could see charred, gutted floors. Gaps in the ceiling rained dirty water. I was terrified of that building. And my father had to pick me up when he stepped out on the roof. Patrick, he whispered, as we walked across the tar paper. It's okay, don't you see? I looked out and saw the city rising steel blue and yellow beyond the stretch of neighborhood. I could smell the heat and damage below me. Don't you see? My father repeated. It's safe here. We stopped the fire in the low floors. It can't reach us up here. If you stop it at its base... It can't rise. He smoothed my hair and kissed my cheek, and I trembled. Prologue Christmas Eve, 6.15 p.m. Three days ago, on the first official night of winter, a guy I grew up with, Eddie Brewer, was one of four people shot in a convenience store. Robbery was not a motive. The shooter, James Fahey, had recently broken up with his girlfriend, Laura Stiles, who was a cashier on the 4-12 to shift. At 11.15, as Eddie Brewer filled a styrofoam cup with ice and Sprite, James Fahey walked through the door and shot Laura Stiles once in the face and twice in the heart. Then he shot Eddie Brewer once in the head and walked down the frozen food aisle and found an elderly Vietnamese couple huddling in the dairy section. Two bullets each for them, and James Fahey decided his work was complete. He walked out to his car, sat behind the wheel, and taped the restraining order Laura Stiles and her family had successfully filed against him to the rearview mirror. Then he tied one of Laura's bras around his head, took a pull from a bottle of Jack Daniels, and fired a bullet into his mouth. James Fahey and Laura Stiles were pronounced dead at the scene. The elderly Vietnamese man died en route to Kearney Hospital, his wife a few hours later. Eddie Brewer, however, lies in a coma. And while doctors say his prognosis isn't good, they also admit his continued existence is all but miraculous. The press have been giving that description a lot of play lately, because Eddie Brewer, never anything close to a saint when we were growing up, is a priest. He'd been out jogging the night he was shot, dressed in thermals and sweats. So Fahey didn't know his vocation, though I doubt it would have mattered much. But the press, sensing both a nostalgia for religion so close to the holidays and a fresh spin on an old story, played his priesthood for all it was worth. TV commentators and print editorialists have likened Eddie Brewer's random shooting to a sign of the apocalypse, and around-the-clock vigils have been held at his parish in Lower Mills and outside the Kearney. Eddie Brewer, an obscure cleric and a completely unassuming man, is heading for martyrdom, whether he lives or not. None of this has anything to do with the nightmare that descended on my life and that of several others in this city two months ago. A nightmare that left me with wounds the doctors say have healed as well as can be expected, even though my right hand has yet to regain most of its feeling and the scars on my face sometimes burn under the beard I've grown. No, a priest getting shot and the serial killer who entered my life 
and the latest ethnic cleansing being wrought in a former Soviet republic, or the man who shot up an abortion clinic not far from here, or another serial killer who's killed ten in Utah and is yet to be caught. None of it is connected. But sometimes it feels like it is. As if somewhere there's a thread to all these events, all these random, arbitrary violences. And that if we can just figure out where that thread begins, we can pull on it, unravel everything, make sense of it. Since Thanksgiving, I've grown the beard, the first one of my life. And while I keep it trimmed, it continues to surprise me in the mirror every morning, as if I spend my nights dreaming of a face that is smooth and unruptured by scars, flesh that is clean the way only a baby's is, skin untouched by anything but sweet air and a mother's tender caresses. The office, Kenzie Gennaro Investigations, is closed, gathering dust, I assume. Maybe the first stray cobweb in a corner behind my desk. Maybe one behind Angie's, too. Angie's been gone since the end of November, and I try not to think about her. Or Grace Cole, or Grace's daughter May, or anything at all. Mass has just ended across the street, and with the unseasonably warm weather, still in the low 40s, though the sun's been down for 90 minutes, most of the parishioners mill about outside and their voices are sharp in the night air as they wish each other good cheer and happy holidays. They remark on the strangeness of the weather, how erratic it's been all year, how summer was cold and autumn warm and then just as suddenly bitter and icy, how no one should be surprised if Christmas morning were to bring a Santa Ana and a Mercury reading in the 70s. Someone mentions Eddie Brewer, and they speak about it for a moment, but a brief one and I sense they don't want it to spoil their festive mood. But oh, they say, what a sick, crazy world. Crazy is the word, they say. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I spend most of my time sitting out here lately. From the porch I can see people, and even though it's often cool out here, their voices keep me here as my bad hand stiffens with cold and my teeth begin to chatter. In the mornings, I carry my coffee out, sit in the brisk air and look across the avenue to the schoolyard and watch the small boys in their blue ties and matching blue pants and the small girls with their plaid skirts and glinting barrettes run across the yard. Their sudden shrieks and darting movements, their seemingly bottomless supply of frenetic energy can be wearying or invigorating depending on my mood. When it's a bad day... Those shrieks ride my spinal column like chips of broken glass. On good days, though, I get a flush of something that may be a memory of what it was like to feel whole, when the simple act of breathing didn't ache. The issue, he wrote, is pain, how much I feel, how much I parcel out. He came during the warmest, most erratic autumn on record, when the weather seemed to have flipped completely off its usual course when everything seemed upside down, as if you'd look at a hole in the ground and see stars and constellations floating at the bottom. Turn your head to the sky and see dirt and trees hanging suspended, as if he had his fingers on the globe and he slapped it, and the world, or at least my portion of it, spun. Sometimes Baba or Richie or Devin and Oscar drop by, sit out here with me and we talk about the NFL playoffs or the college bowls or the latest movies in town. We don't talk about this past autumn or Grace and May. We don't talk about Angie. And we never talk about him. He's done his damage and there's nothing left to say. The issue, he wrote, is pain. Those words, written on a piece of white 8 by 11 copy paper, haunt me. Those words, so simple, sometimes seem as if they were written in stone. Chapter One Angie and I were up in our belfry office trying to fix the air conditioner when Eric Galt called. Usually in the middle of a New England October, a broken air conditioner wouldn't be a problem. A broken heater would. But it wasn't turning out to be a normal autumn. At two in the afternoon, the temperature hung in the mid-70s, 
and the window screen still carried the damp, baked odor of summer. Maybe we should call someone, Angie said. I thumped the window unit on the side with my palm, turned it on again. Nothing. I bet it's the belt, I said. That's what you say when the car breaks down, too. <laughs> I glared at the air conditioner for about 20 seconds, and it remained silent. Call it foul names, Angie said. Maybe that'll help. I turned my glare on her. Got about as much reaction as I got from the air conditioner. Maybe I needed to work on my glare. The phone rang and I picked it up, hoping the caller knew something about mechanics, but I got Eric Galt instead. Eric taught criminology at Bryce University. We met when he was still teaching at UMass, and I took a couple of his classes. You know anything about fixing air conditioners? You try turning it on and off and then back on? He said, yes. And nothing happened? Nope. Hit it a couple of times. I did. Call a repairman, then. You're a lot of help. Is your office still in the Belfry, Patrick? Yes, why? Well, I have a prospective client for you. And? I'd like her to hire you. Fine, bring her by. The Belfry? Sure. I said I'd like her to hire you. I looked around the tiny office. That's cold, Eric. Can you stop by Lewis Wharf, say, about nine in the morning? I think so. What's your friend's name? Deandra Warren. What's her problem? I'd prefer it if she told you face to face. Okay. I'll meet you there tomorrow. See you then. I started to hang up. Patrick. Yeah. Do you have a little sister named Moira? No, I have an older sister named Erin. Oh, why? Nothing. We'll talk tomorrow. See you then. I hung up, looked at the air conditioner, then at Angie, back at the air conditioner, and then I dialed a repairman. DeAndra Warren lived in a fifth-story loft on Lewis Wharf. She had a panoramic view of the harbor, enormous bay windows that bathed the east end of the loft with soft morning sunlight, and she looked like the kind of woman who'd never wanted for a single thing her whole life. Hair the color of a peach hung in a graceful sweeping curve over her forehead and tapered into a page boy on the sides. A dark silk shirt and light blue jeans looked as if they'd never been worn, and the bones in her face seemed chiseled under skin so unblemished and golden it reminded me of water in a chalice. She opened the door and said, Mr. Kenzie, Miss Gennaro, in a soft, confident whisper, a whisper that knew a listener would lean in to hear it if necessary. Please come in. The loft was precisely furnished. The couch and armchairs in the living area were a cream color that complemented the blonde Scandinavian wood of the kitchen furniture, and the muted reds and browns of the Persian and Native American rugs placed strategically over the hardwood floor. The sense of color gave the place an air of warmth, but the almost Spartan functionalism suggested an owner who wasn't given to the unplanned gesture or the sentimentality of clutter. By the bay windows, the exposed brick wall was taken up by a brass bed, walnut dresser, three birch file cabinets, and a Governor Winthrop desk. In the whole place, I couldn't see a closet or any hanging clothes. Maybe she just wished a fresh wardrobe out of the air every morning, and it was waiting for her fully pressed by the time she came out of the shower. She led us into the living area, and we sat in the armchairs as she moved onto the couch with a slight hesitation. Between us was a smoked glass coffee table with a manila envelope in the center, and a heavy ashtray and antique lighter to its left. DeAndre Warren smiled at us. We smiled back. Have to be quick to improvise in this business. Her eyes widened slightly, and the smile stayed where it was. Maybe she was waiting for us to list our qualifications, show her our guns, and tell her how many dastardly foes we'd vanquished since sunup. Angie's smile faded, but I kept mine in place for a few seconds longer. Picture of the happy-go-lucky detective, 
putting his prospective client at ease. Patrick Sparky Kenzie, at your service. DeAndre Warren said, I'm not sure how to start. Angie said, Eric said you may be in some trouble we could help you with. She nodded, and her hazel irises seemed to fragment for a moment, as if something had come loose behind them. She pursed her lips, looked at her slim hands, and as she began to raise her head, the front door opened and Eric entered. His salt and pepper hair was tied back in a ponytail and balding on top, but he looked ten years younger than the 46 or 7 I knew he was. He wore khakis and a denim shirt under a charcoal sport coat with the lower button clasped. The sport coat looked a bit strange on him, as if the tailor hadn't counted on a gun sticking to Eric's hip. Hey, Eric. I held out my hand. He shook it. Glad you could make it, Patrick. Hi, Eric. Angie extended her hand. As he leaned over to shake it, he realized he'd exposed the gun. He closed his eyes for a moment and blushed. Angie said, I would feel a lot better if you placed that gun on the coffee table until we leave, Eric. I feel like a fool, he said, trying to crack a smile. Please, Deandra said. Just put it on the table, Eric. He unsnapped the holster as if it might bite and put a Ruger thirty eight on top of the manila envelope. I met his eyes, confused. Eric Galt and a gun went together like caviar and hot dogs. He sat beside Deandra. We've been a little on edge lately. Why? Deandra sighed. I'm a psychiatrist, Mr. Kenzie, Miss Gennaro. I teach at Bryce twice a week and provide counseling for staff and students in addition to maintaining my practice off campus. You expect a lot of things in my line of work, dangerous clients, patients who have full psychotic episodes in a tiny office with you alone, paranoid dissociative schizophrenics who find out your address. You live with those fears. I guess you expect them to be realized one day. But this, she looked at the envelope on the table between us. This is, I said, try telling us how this started. She sat back on the couch and closed her eyes for a moment. Eric placed a hand lightly on her shoulder, and she shook her head, eyes still closed, and he removed it, placed it on his knee and looked at it as if he wasn't sure how it had gotten there. A student came to see me one morning when I was at Bryce. At least she said she was a student. Any reason to think otherwise? Angie said. Not at the time. She had a student ID. Deandra opened her eyes. But once I did some checking, I found there was no record of her. What was this person's name? I said. Moira Kenzie. I looked at Angie and she raised an eyebrow. You see, Mr. Kenzie, when Eric said your name, I jumped on it hoping you're related to this girl. I thought about it. Kenzie isn't a terribly common name. Even back in Ireland, there's only a few of us around Dublin, and a few more scattered up near Ulster. Given the cruelty and violence that festered in the hearts of my father and his brothers, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing that the bloodline looked to be close to its end. You said this Moira Kenzie was a girl. Yes, so she was young. Nineteen, maybe twenty. I shook my head. Then no, I don't know her, Dr. Warren. The only Moira Kenzie I know is a cousin of my late father. She's in her mid-sixties and she hasn't left Vancouver in twenty years. Deandra nodded, a curt, bitter one. And her pupils seemed to dim. Well then, Dr. Warren, I said. What happened when you met this Moira Kenzie? She pursed her lips and looked at Eric then up at a heavy ceiling fan above her. She exhaled slowly through her mouth, and I knew she decided to trust us. Moira said she was the girlfriend of a man named Hurley. Kevin Hurley, Angie said. Deandra Warren's golden skin had paled to eggshell in the last minute. She nodded. Angie looked at me and again raised her eyebrows. Eric said, you know him? Unfortunately... I said, we've met Kevin. Kevin Hurley, he grew up with us. 
He's pretty silly looking. A gangly tall guy with hips like doorknobs and unruly brittle hair that looks like he styles it by sticking his head in a toilet bowl and flushing. When he was 12 years old, a cancerous growth was successfully removed from his larynx. The scar tissue from the surgery, however, left him with a cracked, high-pitched mess of a voice that sounds like the perpetual angry whine of a teenage girl. He wears Coke bottle glasses that make his eyes bulge like a frog's, and he has the fashion sense of an accordionist in a polka band. He's Jack Rouse's right-hand man, and Jack Rouse runs the Irish mafia in the city. And if Kevin looks and sounds comical, he isn't even close. What happened? Angie said. Deandra looked up at the ceiling and the skin over her throat trembled. Maura told me Kevin scared her. She told me he had her followed constantly, forced her to watch him have sex with other women, forced her to have sex with associates, how he beats men who even look at her casually, and how she swallowed, and Eric placed a tentative hand on top of her own. Then she told me how she'd had an affair with a man and Kevin found out and how he killed the man and buried him in Somerville. She begged me to help her. She. Who contacted you? I said. She wiped her left eye, then lit a long white cigarette with the antique lighter. As afraid as she was, her hand only betrayed the slightest tremor. Kevin, she said the word popping out of her mouth like it was sour. He called me at four in the morning. When the phone rings at four in the morning, do you know how you feel? Disoriented, confused, alone, and terrified. Just the way a guy like Kevin Hurler he wants you to feel. He said all these foul things. He said, and I quote, How's it feel to be living your last week on earth, you useless cunt? Sounded like Kevin. Class all the way. She inhaled with a hiss. I said, when did you receive this call? Three weeks ago. Three weeks, Angie said. Yes, I tried to ignore it. I called the police, but they said there was nothing they could do since I had no proof it was Kevin who called. She ran a hand through her hair, curled into herself a bit more on the sofa, looked at us. When you talked to the police, I said, did you mention anything about this body buried in Somerville? No. Good, Angie said. Why have you waited so long before seeking some help? She reached over and slid Eric's gun off the manila envelope. She handed the envelope to Angie, who opened it and pulled out a black and white photograph. She looked at it, then handed it to me. The young man in the photo looked to be about 20, handsome with long, sandy brown hair and two days beard stubble. He wore jeans with rips in the knees, a t-shirt under an unbuttoned flannel shirt, and a black leather jacket. The college grunge uniform. He had a notebook under his arm and was walking past a brick wall. He seemed unaware his picture was being taken. My son Jason, Deandra said. He's a sophomore at Bryce. That building is the corner of the Bryce Library. The photograph arrived yesterday by regular mail. Any note? She shook her head. Eric said, Her name and address are typed on the front of that envelope, nothing else. Two days ago, Deandra said, When Jason was home for the weekend, I overheard him telling a friend on the phone that he couldn't shake the feeling someone was stalking him. Stalking. That's the word he used. She pointed at the photo with her cigarette, and the tremor in her hand was more noticeable. The next day that arrived. I looked at the photo again. Classic mafia warning. You may think you know something about us, but we know everything about you. I haven't seen Moira Kenzie since that first day. She isn't enrolled at Bryce. The phone number she gave me is for a Chinese restaurant. And she's not listed in any local phone directories. But yet she came to me. And now I have this in my life. 
and I don't know why. Christ. She slapped both palms down into her thighs and closed her eyes. When she opened them, all the courage she'd presumably been sucking out of the thin air for the last three weeks was gone. She looked terrified and suddenly aware of how weak the walls we erect around our lives truly are. I looked at Eric, his hand on Deandra's, and tried to gauge their relationship. I'd never known him to date a woman and always assumed he was gay. Whether true or not, I'd known him for ten years and he'd never mentioned a son. Who's Jason's father? I said. What? Why? When a child's involved in a threat, Angie said, we have to consider custody issues. Deandra and Eric shook their heads simultaneously. Deandra's been divorced almost 20 years, Eric said. Her ex-husband is friendly but distant with Jason. I need his name, I said. Stanley Timpson, Deandra said. Suffolk County District Attorney Stan Timpson? She nodded. Dr. Warren, Angie said. Since your ex-husband is the most powerful law enforcement officer in the Commonwealth, we'd have to assume that no. Deandra shook her head. Most people don't even know we were married. He has a second wife, three other children, and his contact with Jason and me is minimal. Believe me, this has nothing to do with Stan. I looked at Eric. I'd have to agree. He said, Jason has taken Deandra's name, not Stan's, and he has almost no contact with his father outside of a birthday phone call or Christmas card. Will you help me? Deandra said. Angie and I looked at each other. Hanging out in the same zip code as people like Kevin Hurley and his boss Jack Rouse isn't something either Angie or I consider healthy. Now we were being asked to cruise right up to their dinner tables and ask them to stop bothering our client. What fun. If we took DeAndre Warren's case, it would go down as one of the more patently suicidal decisions we'd ever made. Angie read my mind. What, she said, you want to live forever? Chapter Two as we left Lewis Wharf and walked up commercial, the schizophrenic New England autumn had turned an ugly morning into a glorious afternoon. When I woke up, a breeze so chilly and mean, it seemed the exhalation of a Puritan god was hissing through the cracks under my windows. The sky was hard and pale as baseball leather, and people walking to their cars on the avenue were hunched into thick jackets and oversized sweaters, breath steaming around their faces. By the time I left my apartment, the temperature had risen into the high 40s, and the muted sun trying to push through the sheet of hard sky looked like an orange trap just beneath the surface of a frozen pond. Walking up Lewis Worth toward DeAndre Warren's apartment, I had removed my jacket as the sun finally broke through, and now as we drove back to the neighborhood, the mercury hovered in the high 60s. We drove past Copse Hill, and the warm breeze sweeping off the harbor rustled the trees overlooking the hill, and several handfuls of burnished red leaves crested the slate headstones and fluttered down into the grass. On our right, the stretch of wharfs and docks glinted under the sun, and to our left, the brown, red, and off-white brick of the north end hinted of tile floors and old open doorways and the smells of thick sauces and garlic and freshly baked bread. Can't hate the city on a day like this, Angie said. Impossible. She grasped the back of her thick hair with one hand and twisted it into a makeshift ponytail, tilting her head toward the open window to catch the sun on her face and neck. Watching her with her eyes closed and a small grin on her face, I was almost prepared to believe that she was completely healthy. But she wasn't. After she left her husband, Phil, left him in a bloody heap, retching off her front porch, payment for having tried to batter her body one time too many. Angie passed the winter in the midst of an increasingly short attention span, 
and a dating ritual which left a succession of males scratching their heads as she abandoned them without notice and moved on to the next. Since I've never been a paragon of moral virtue, I couldn't say much to her without sounding like a hypocrite. And by early spring, she seemed to have bottomed out. She quit bringing warm bodies home and started to participate fully in casework again, even fixed up her apartment a bit, which for Angie meant she cleaned the oven and bought a broom. But she wasn't whole, not like she used to be. She was quieter, less cocky. She'd call or drop by my apartment at the oddest hours to talk about the day we just shared. She also claimed she hadn't seen Phil in months, but for some reason I couldn't fully explain. I didn't believe her. This was all compounded by the fact that for only the second time in all the years we've known each other, I couldn't always be there for her at a moment's notice. Since July, when I met Grace Cole, I'd been spending whole days and nights, sometimes full weekends with her, whenever we could get time together. Occasionally, I'm also enlisted into babysitting duty for Grace's daughter, May, and so I'm often beyond the reach of my partner except in the case of an absolute emergency. It wasn't something either of us ever really prepared for, since, as Angie once put it, there's a better chance of seeing a black guy in a Woody Allen movie than seeing Patrick in a serious relationship. She caught me watching her at a light, opened her eyes fully and looked at me with a tiny smile playing on her lips. Worrying about me again, Kenzie? My partner, the psychic. Just checking you out, Gennaro. Purely sexist, nothing more. I know you, Patrick. She leaned back from the window. You're still playing big brother. And, and, she said, running the backs of her fingers along my cheek. It's time for you to stop. I lifted a strand of hair out of her eye just before the light turned green. No, I said. We stopped inside her house long enough for her to change into a pair of cut-off denim shorts and for me to take two bottles of rolling rock from her fridge. Then we sat out on her back porch listening to her neighbor's overstarched shirts crack and snap in the breeze and enjoyed the day. She leaned back on her elbows, stretched her legs out in front of her. So, we have a case suddenly. We do, I said, glancing at her smooth olive legs and faded denim cutoffs. There might not be much good in this world, but show me anyone who has a bad thing to say about denim cutoffs, and I'll show you a lunatic. Any ideas how to play it? She said. Then, stop looking at my legs, you pervert. You're practically a married man now. I shrugged, leaned back myself looked up at the bright marble sky. Not sure. Know what bothers me? Besides Muzak infomercials and New Jersey accents? About this case. Pray tell. Why the name Moira Kenzie? I mean, if it's a fake, which we can probably assume, why my last name? There's something known as coincidence. Maybe you've heard of it. It's when the, okay, something else. Yes. Kevin Hurley, he seemed like the type of guy who'd have a girlfriend to you. Well, no, but it's been years, really, since we've known him. Still. Who knows, she said. I've seen a lot of weird, ugly guys with beautiful women and vice versa. Kevin's not just weird, though. He's a sadist. So are a lot of professional boxers. You always see them with women. I shrugged. I guess... Okay, so how do we deal with Kevin? And Jack Rouse, she said. Dangerous guys, I said. Fairy, she said. And who deals with dangerous people on a daily basis? Certainly not us, she said. No, I said. We're wusses. And proud of it, she said. Which leaves... She turned her head, squinted into the sun to look at me. You don't mean, she said. I do. Ah, oh, Patrick. We must visit Bubba, I said. Really? 
I sighed, not real happy about it myself. Really? Damn, Angie said. Chapter 3 Left, Bubba said. Then, about eight inches to your right. Good. Almost there. He was walking backward a few feet ahead of us, his hands held up near his chest, his fingers wiggling like he was backing in a truck. Okay, he said. Left foot. About nine inches to your left. That's it. Visiting Bubba in the old warehouse where he lives is a lot like playing Twister on the edge of a cliff. Bubba's got the first 40 feet of the second floor wired with enough explosives to vaporize the eastern seaboard, so you have to follow his directions to the letter if you want to breathe without artificial assistance for the rest of your life. Both Angie and I have been through the process countless times before but we've never trusted our memories enough to cross those 40 feet without Bubba's help. Call us overly cautious. Patrick, he said, looking at me gravely as my right foot hovered a quarter inch off the ground. I said six inches to the right, not five. I took a deep breath and moved my foot another inch. He smiled and nodded. I set my foot down. I didn't blow up. I was glad. Behind me, Angie said, Bubba, why don't you just invest in a security system? Bubba frowned. This is my security system. This is a minefield, Bubba. You say tomato, Bubba said. Four inches left, Patrick. Angie exhaled loudly behind me. You're clear, Patrick he said as I stepped onto a patch of floor about ten feet away from him. He narrowed his eyes at Angie. Don't be such a sissy, Ange. Angie was standing with one knee raised, looking a lot like a stork. A very put-out stork, actually. She said, When I get there, I'm shooting you, Bubba Rogowski. Who? Bubba said. She used my full name just like my mom used to. You never knew your mother, I reminded him. Psychically, Patrick, he said and touched his protruding frontal lobe. Psychically. Booby traps aside, sometimes I worry about him. Angie stepped into the patch of floor I'd just vacated. You clear, Bubba said and she punched his shoulder. Anything else we should worry about, I said. Spears falling from the ceiling, razor blades in the chairs. Not unless I activate them. He walked back toward an old fridge which sat beside two worn brown sofas, an orange office chair, and a stereo system so old it had an eight-track deck. In front of the office chair was a wooden crate, and its several cousins were stacked on the other side of a mattress thrown down just beyond the couches. A couple of the crates were open, and I could see the ugly butts of oiled black firearms sticking up through yellow straw. Bubba's daily bread. He opened the fridge, pulled a bottle of vodka from the freezer. He produced three shot glasses from the trench coat I'd never seen him without. Dead of summer or hot of winter, it doesn't matter. Bubba and his trench coat do not part. Like Harpo Marx with a really bad attitude and homicidal tendencies. He poured the vodka and handed us each a glass. I hear it steadies the nerves. He tossed his back. It steadied mine. By the way Angie closed her eyes for a moment, I think it steadied hers. Bubba showed no reaction. But then Bubba doesn't have nerves, or as far as I know, most other things humans need to function. He plopped his 230-plus pounds down onto one of the sofas. So... Why you need to meet with Jack Rouse? We told him. Doesn't sound like him. That picture shit, I mean, maybe it's effective. But it's far too subtle for Jack. What about Kevin Hurley? Angie said. If it's too subtle for Jack, he said, then it's completely beyond Kevin. 
He drank from the bottle. Come to think of it, most things are beyond Kev. Addition and subtraction, the alphabet, shit like that. Hell, you guys must remember that from the old days. We'd wondered if he'd changed. Bubba laughed. Nope. Gotten worse. So he's dangerous, I said. Oh, yeah, Bubba said. Like a junkyard dog. Knows how to rape and fight and scare hell out of people, and that's about it. But he does those things well. He handed me the bottle and I poured another shot. I said, so two people who normally took a case that pitted them against him and his boss would be morons. Yeah. He took the bottle back. I glared at Angie and she stuck her tongue out at me. Bubba said, want me to kill him for you? And stretched out on the couch. I blinked. Um, Bubba yawned. It's not a problem. Angie touched his knee. Not at the moment. Really? He said, sitting up. No sweat. I built this new thing. And what you do is clamp it around the guy's skull right here. And we'll let you know, I said. Cool. He lay back on the couch, looked at us for a moment. I didn't figure a freak like Kevin for having a girlfriend, though. He seems like a guy that pays for it or takes it by force. That bothered me, too, I said. Anyway, Bubba said, you don't want to meet Jack Rouse and Kevin alone. We don't? He shook his head. You go up to them and say, back off our client, they'll kill you. They'd have to. They ain't real stable. A guy who used a minefield for home protection was telling us Jack and Kevin weren't stable. This was good news. Now that I knew just how dangerous they really were, I considered walking back into that minefield, doing a jig, getting it over with quick. We'll go through Fat Freddy, Bubba said. Are you serious? Angie said. Fat Freddy Constantine was the godfather of the Boston Mafia, the man who wrested control from the once preeminent Providence outfit and consolidated his power. Jack Rouse, Kevin Hurleyhe, anyone who so much as sold a nickel bag in this city, answered to Fat Freddy. It's the only way, Bubba said. You go through Fat Freddy, you're showing him respect. And if I set up the meat, they know your friends. They won't whack you. Bonus, I said. When you want the meat, as soon as possible, Angie said. He shrugged and picked up a cordless phone off the floor. He dialed and took another swig from the bottle as he waited. Lou, he said. Tell the man I called. He hung up. The man, I said. He held out his hands. They all watch Scorsese movies and cop shows, think it's the way they're supposed to talk. I humor them. He reached across his whale's hump chest and poured another shot into Angie's glass. You officially divorced yet, Gennaro? She smiled and downed the shot. Not officially. When? He raised his eyebrows. She propped her feet up on an open crate of AK-47s and leaned back in her chair. The wheels of justice turn slowly, Bubba, and divorce is complicated. Bubba grimaced. Smuggling surface-to-air missiles from Libya is complicated. But divorce? Angie ran both hands through the hair along her temples, looked up at the peeling heating pipe stretched across Bubba's ceiling. A relationship in your hands, Bubba, lasts about as long as a six-pack. So what do you know about divorce? Really? He sighed. I know people seem to go out of their way to fuck up things usually should be snapped off clean. He swiveled his legs off the couch, dropped the soles of his combat boots to the floor. How about you, homeboy? Moi, I said. See, he said. How was your divorce experience? Piece of cake, I said. Like ordering Chinese. 
One phone call and everything's taken care of. He looked at Angie. See? She waved a dismissive hand in my general direction. You take his word for it, Mr. Introspection? I doth protest, I said. You doth full of shit, Angie said. Bubba rolled his eyes. Would you guys just bang each other and get it over with? There was one of those awkward pauses that comes up every time someone suggests there's a lot more than friendship between me and my partner. Bubba smiled, getting a charge out of it. And then, thankfully, his phone rang. Yeah, he nodded at us. Mr. Constantine, how you doing? He rolled his eyes as Mr. Constantine elaborated on just how he was. Glad to hear it, Bubba said. Listen, Mr. C., I got a couple friends need to speak with you. Take a couple minutes. I mouthed Mr. C., and he shot me the bird. Yes, sir, they're good folks. Civilians. But they may have stumbled onto something could maybe interest you. Has to do with Jack and Kevin. Fat Freddy began talking again, and Bubba made the universal masturbatory gesture with his fist. Yes, sir, he said eventually. Patrick Kenzie and Angela Gennaro. He listened, then blinked and looked at Angie. He put his hand over the mouthpiece and said, You related to the Patrizo family? She lit a cigarette. Afraid so. Yes, sir. Bubba said into the phone. The very same Angela Gennaro. He raised his left eyebrow at her. Ten to night. Thanks, Mr. Constantine. He paused, looked at the wooden crate Angie was using as a footstool. What? Oh, yeah. Lou knows where. Six cases tomorrow night, you bet. As a whistle, Mr. Constantine. Yes, sir. Take care. He hung up and sighed loudly, shoved the antenna back into the phone with the heel of his hand. Fucking wops, he said. Everything's yes, sir, no, sir, how's the wife? At least the heart mobs, they're too mean to give a fuck how the wife is. Coming from Bubba, this was high praise for my ethnicity. I said, where do we meet him? He was looking at Angie with something akin to awe on his rubbery face. At his coffee shop on Prince Street, ten to night. How come you never told me you were connected? She flicked her cigarette ash on his floor. It wasn't disrespectful, it was Bubba's ashtray. I'm not connected. According to Freddy, you are. Well, she said, he's mistaken. An accident of blood, that's all. He looked at me. You know she was related to the Patrizo mob? Yep. And? And she never seemed like she cared, so I didn't either. Baba, she said. It's not something I'm proud of. He whistled. All these years, all the scrapes you two been in, and you never called on them for backup. And she looked at him through the long bangs that had fallen in her face. Never even considered it. Why? He was genuinely confused. Because you're all the mafia we need, handsome. He blushed. Something only Angie can get him to do. Something that's always worth the effort. His huge face swelled like an overripe grape. And for a moment he looked... Almost harmless. Almost. Stop, he said. You're embarrassing me. Back at the office, I brewed some coffee to counteract the vodka buzz, and Angie played back the messages in our answering machine. The first was from a recent client, Bobo Gedmanson, owner of Bobo's yo-yo chain of under-21 dance clubs and a few strip joints out in Saugus and Peabody, with names like Dripping Vanilla and The Honey Dip. Now that we'd located Bobo's ex-partner and returned most of the money he'd embezzled from Bobo, Bobo was suddenly questioning our rates and crying poor mouth. People, I said, shaking my head. Suck. Angie agreed as Bobo beeped off. I made a mental reminder to toss the collection job to Bubba, and then the second message played. Hello. 
Just thought I'd wish you a jolly good luck on your new case and all that rubbish. I gather it's a splendid one, yes? Well, I'll be in touch. Cheerio. I looked at Angie. Who the hell was that? I thought you knew. I don't know anyone British. Me either. I shrugged. Wrong number? Good luck on your new case. Sounds like he knew what he was talking about. Accents sound fake to you? She nodded. Like someone who watched a lot of Python. Who do we know who does accents? Beats me. The next voice was Grace Cole's. In the background, I could hear the assault of human noise and babble of the emergency room where she worked. I actually got ten minutes for a coffee break, so I tried to catch you. I'm here till at least early tomorrow morning, but call me at my place tomorrow night. Miss you. She beeped off and Angie said, So when's the wedding? Tomorrow. Didn't you know? She smiled. You're whipped, Patrick. You do know that, don't you? According to who? According to me and all your friends. Her smile faded a bit. I've never seen you look at a woman the way you look at Grace. And if I am? She looked out her window at the avenue. Then I say more power to you, she said softly. She tried to get the smile back, but it cracked weakly and disappeared. I wish you both all the best. Chapter Four by ten that night, Angie and I were sitting in a small coffee shop on Prince Street, learning more than we ever wanted to know about prostates from Fat Freddy Constantine. Freddy Constantine's coffee shop on Prince Street was a narrow shop on a narrow street. Prince Street cuts across the north end from Commercial to Moon Street, and like most of the streets in that neighborhood, it's barely wide enough to squeeze a bicycle through. The temperature had dropped into the mid-fifties by the time we arrived. But up and down Prince Street, men sat in front of shops and restaurants wearing only T-shirts or tank tops under open short sleeves, leaning back in lawn chairs and smoking cigars, or playing cards and laughing suddenly and violently, as people do in neighborhoods they're sure they own. Freddy's coffee shop was nothing but a dark room with two small tables out front and four inside, on a white and black tile floor. A ceiling fan rotated sluggishly and flipped the pages of a newspaper back and forth on the counter as Dean Martin warbled from somewhere behind a heavy black curtain drawn across the back doorway. We were met at the front door by two young guys with dark hair and bodies by Bally and matching pink champagne v-necks and gold chains. I said, Is there like a catalog all you guys shop from? One of them found this so witty that he patted me down extra hard, the heels of his hand chopping between my ribcage and hips like they expected to meet in the middle. We'd left our guns in the car, so they took our wallets. We didn't like it. They didn't care. And soon they led us to a table across from Don Federico Constantine himself. Fat Freddy looked like a walrus without the mustache. He was immense and smoke gray and he wore several layers of dark clothing, so that his square chopping block head on top of all that darkness looked like something that had erupted from the folds of the collar and spilled toward the shoulders. His almond eyes were warm and liquid, paternal, and he smiled a lot. Smiled at strangers on the street, at reporters as he came down courtroom steps, presumably at his victims before his men kneecapped them. He said, Please, Sit down. Except for Freddy and ourselves, there was only one other person in the coffee shop. He sat about 20 feet back, at a table beside a support beam, one hand on the table, legs crossed at the ankles. He wore light khakis and a white shirt and gray scarf under an amber canvas jacket with a leather collar. He didn't quite look at us, but I couldn't swear he was looking away either. His name was Pine, no first name that I ever heard. And he was a legend in his circles. The man who'd survived four different bosses, three family wars, and whose enemies had a habit of disappearing so completely, people soon forgot they'd ever lived. Sitting at the table, 
He seemed a perfectly normal, almost bland guy. Handsome, possibly, but not in any way that stuck in the memory. He was probably 5'11", or 6 feet, with dirty blonde hair and green eyes and an average build. Just being in the same room with him made my skull tingle. Angie and I sat down and Fat Freddy said, Prostates. Excuse me? Angie said, Prostates, Freddy repeated. He poured coffee from a pewter pot into a cup, handed it to Angie. Not something your gender has to worry about half as much as ours. He nodded at me as he handed me my cup, then nudged the cream and sugar in our direction. I'll tell you, he said, I've reached the height of my profession. My daughter just got accepted to Harvard, and financially, I want for little. He shifted in his chair, grimaced enough so that his huge jowls rolled in toward the center of his face and completely obscured his lips for a moment. But I swear, I'd trade it all in tomorrow for a healthy prostate. He sighed. You? What? I said. Have a healthy prostate? Last time I checked, Mr. Constantine. He leaned forward. Count your blessings, my young friend. Count them twice. A man without a healthy prostate is... He spread his hands on the table. Well, he's a man without secrets, a man without dignity. Those doctors, Jesus, they flop you down on your stomach and they go in there with their evil little tools and they poke and they prod, they tear and they... Sounds terrible, Angie said. It slowed him down, thank God. He nodded. Terrible isn't quite the word. He looked at her suddenly as if he'd just noticed her. And you, my dear, are far too exquisite to be subjected to such talk. He kissed her hand, and I tried not to roll my eyes. I know your grandfather quite well, Angela. Quite well. Angie smiled. He's proud of the association, Mr. Constantine. I'll be sure to tell him I had the pleasure of meeting his lovely granddaughter. He looked at me, and his twinkling eyes faded a bit. And you, Mr. Kenzie, you're keeping a careful eye on this woman, making sure she keeps out of harm's way? This woman does a pretty good job of that herself, Mr. Constantine. Angie said. Fat Freddy's eyes stayed on me, growing darker by the second, like he wasn't too keen on what he saw. He said, Our friends will join us in just a minute. As Freddy leaned back to pour himself another cup of coffee, I heard one of the bodyguards out front say, Go right on in, Mr. Rouse. And Angie's eyes widened slightly as Jack Rouse and Kevin Hurley came through the door. Jack Rouse controlled Southie, Charlestown, and everything between Savin Hill and the Neponset River in Dorchester. He was thin, hard, and his eyes matched the gunmetal of his close-cropped hair. He didn't look particularly threatening, but he didn't have to. He had Kevin for that. I've known Kevin since we were six, and nothing that lives in his brain or his bloodstream has ever been stained by a humane impulse. He walked through the door, avoided looking at Pine or even acknowledging him, and I knew Pine was who Kevin aspired to be. But Pine was all stillness and economy. While Kevin was a walking exposed nerve, his pupils lit with a battery charge, the kind of guy who might shoot everyone in the place simply because the idea occurred to him. Pine was scary because killing was a job to him, no different than a thousand others. Kevin was scary because killing was the only job he wanted. And he'd do it for free. The first thing he did after shaking Freddy's hand was sit down beside me and put a cigarette out in my coffee cup. Then he ran a hand through his coarse, thick hair and stared at me. Freddy said, Jack, Kevin, you know Mr. Kenzie and Ms. Gennaro, don't you? Old friend, sure, Jack said as he took the seat beside Angie. Neighborhood kids like Kevin. Rouse shrugged off an old blue members-only jacket and hung it behind him on his chair. Ain't that the God's truth, Kev? 
Kevin was too busy staring at me to comment. Fat Freddy said, I like everything to be above board. Rogowski says you two are okay, and maybe you got a problem I can help you with. So be it. But you two come from Jack's neighborhood, so I asked Jack if he'd like to sit in. You see what I'm saying? We nodded. Kevin lit another cigarette, blew the smoke into my hair. Freddy turned his palms up on the table. We're all agreed then. So tell me what you need, Mr. Kenzie. We've been hired by a client, I said. Who? How's your coffee, Jack? Freddy said. Enough cream? It's fine, Mr. Constantine, very good. Who, I repeated, is under the impression she annoyed one of Jack's men. Men? Freddy said and raised his eyebrows, looked at Jack, then back at me. We're small businessmen, Mr. Kenzie. We have employees. But their loyalty stop with their paychecks. He looked at Jack again. Men, he said, and they both chuckled. Angie sighed. Kevin blew some more smoke into my hair. I was tired, and the last vestiges of Bubba's vodka were chewing at the base of my brain, so I really wasn't in the mood to play cute with a bunch of cut-rate psychopaths who'd seen The Godfather too many times and thought they were respectable. But I reminded myself that Freddy, at least, was a very powerful psychopath who could be dining on my spleen tomorrow night if he wanted to. Mr. Constantine, one of Mr. Rouse's associates then, has expressed anger at our client, made certain threats. Threats, Freddy said. Threats. Threats, Jack said, smiled at Freddy. Threats, Angie said. Seems our client had the misfortune of speaking with your associate's girlfriend who claimed to know of her boyfriend's criminal activities, including the, how can I put it? She met Freddy's eyes. The waste management of some formerly animate tissue. It took him a minute to get it, but then his small eyes narrowed and he threw back his massive head and laughed, booming it up into the ceiling, sending it halfway down Prince Street. Jack looked confused. Kevin looked pissed off but that's the only way Kevin's ever looked. Fine, Freddy said. You hear that? Pine made no indication he'd heard anything. He would made no indication he was breathing. He sat there immobile, simultaneously looking and not looking in our direction. Waste management of formerly animate tissue, Freddy repeated, gasping. He looked at Jack, realized he hadn't gotten the joke yet. Fuck, Jack, go out and pick up a brain, huh? Jack blinked and Kevin leaned forward on the table and Pine's head turned slightly to look at him and Freddy acted like he hadn't noticed any of it. He wiped the corners of his mouth with a linen napkin, shook his head slowly at Angie. Wait till I tell the guys at the club that one, I swear... <laughs> You might have taken your father's name, Angela, but you're a Patrizio. No question. Jack said, Patrizio? Yeah, Freddy said. This is Mr. Patrizio's granddaughter. You didn't know. Jack hadn't known. It seemed to annoy him. He said, Give me a cigarette, Kev. Kevin leaned across the table, lit the cigarette for him, his elbow about a quarter inch from my eye. Mr. Constantine, Angie said, our client doesn't wish to make the list of what your associate considers disposable. Freddy held up a meaty hand. We're talking about what here exactly? Our client believes she may have angered Mr. Hurley. What? Jack said. Explain, Freddy said, quickly. Without using Deandra's name, we did. So what? 
Freddy said. Some coups Kevin's bumping tells the psychiatrist some bullshit about. I got this uh, body or something. And Kevin gets a little hot and calls her and makes some noise. He shook his head. Kevin, you want to tell me about this? Kevin looked at Jack. Kevin, Freddy said. Kevin's head turned. You got a girlfriend? Kevin's voice sounded like ground glass running through a car engine. No, Mr. Constantine. Freddy looked at Jack and they both laughed. Kevin looked like he'd been caught buying pornography by a nun. Freddy turned toward us. You're kidding me with this. He laughed harder. With all due respect to Kevin, he ain't exactly a ladies' man, if you understand me. Angie said, Mr. Constantine, please see our position. This isn't something we made up. He leaned in and patted her hand. Angela, I'm not saying you did. But you've been duped. Some broad claim she was threatened by Kevin because of his girlfriend. Come now. This, Jack said, is what I left a card game for, this shit? He snorted and started to stand up. Sit down, Jack, Freddy said. Jack froze half in, half out of his chair. Freddy looked at Kevin. Sit, Jack. Jack sat. Freddy smiled at us. Have we cleared up your problem? I reached into the inside pocket of my jacket for the photo of Jason Warren. And Kevin's hand dove into his jacket, and Jack leaned back in his chair, and Pine shifted slightly in his seat. Freddy's eyes never left my hand. Very slowly, I withdrew the photo and placed it on the table. Our client received this in the mail the other day. One of the mustaches above Freddy's eyes arched. So... So, Angie said, we'd thought it might be a message from Kevin letting her client know that he knew her weaknesses. Now we assume it isn't, but we're confused. Jack nodded at Kevin and Kevin's hand came out of his jacket. If Freddie noticed, he gave no indication. He looked down at the photo of Jason Warren and sipped his coffee. This kid, he your client's son? He's not mine, I said. Freddy raised his huge head slowly, looked at me. Someone know you, asshole? Those once warm eyes of his seemed about as comforting as ice picks. Don't you ever talk to me like that. Understood. My mouth suddenly felt like I'd swallowed a wool sweater. Kevin chuckled softly under his breath. Freddy reached into the folds of his jacket, his eyes never leaving my face, as he produced a leather-bound notepad. He opened it, leafed through a few pages, found the one he was looking for. Patrick Kenzie, he read. Age 33, mother and father deceased. One sibling, Erin Margolis, aged 36, lives in Seattle, Washington, Last year you grossed $48,000 as part of your partnership with Ms. Gennaro here. Divorced seven years. Ex-wife currently resides in parts unknown. He smiled at me. But we're working on it, believe me. He turned to Paige, pursed his fat lips. Last year you shot a pimp in cold blood under an expressway overpass... He winked, reached out, and patted my hand. Yes, Kenzie, we know about that. You kill someone again, here's simple advice. Don't leave a witness. He looked back at the notebook. Where were we? Ah, uh, all right. Favorite color is blue. Favorite beer is St. Pauli girl. Favorite food is Mexican. He turned another page, glanced up at us. How am I doing so far? Boy, Angie said, are we impressed? He turned toward her. Angela Gennaro, currently estranged from husband Philip DeMasi, 
Father deceased, Mother Antonia lives with second husband in Flagstaff, Arizona. Also involved in killing of pimp last year. Currently residing on House Street in a first floor apartment with a weak deadbolt on the back door. He closed the notebook, looked at us benignly. Me and my friends can come up with information like this. Why the fuck would we need to mail someone a photograph? My right hand was pressed against my thigh, the fingers digging into the flesh, telling me to stay calm. I cleared my throat. It seems unlikely. Fucking right it is, Jack Rouse said. We don't send photographs, Mr. Kenzie, Freddy said. We send our messages a bit more directly. Jack and Freddy stared at us with predatory humor in their eyes. And Kevin Hurley had a shit-eating grin on his face the size of a canyon. Angie said, I have a weak deadbolt on my back door. Freddy shrugged. So I hear. Jack Rouse's fingers rose to the tweed scally cap on his head, and he tipped it in her direction. She smiled, looked at me, then at Freddy. You'd have to have known her for a while to realize exactly how irate she was. She's one of those people whose anger you can gauge by her reduction in movement. By the statue's position she'd taken at the table, I was pretty sure she'd cruised past the extremely pissed-off point about five minutes ago. Freddy? She said, and he blinked. You answer to the Imbruglia family in New York, correct? Freddy stared at her. Pine uncrossed his legs. And the Imbruglia family, she said, leaning to the table slightly, they answer to the Moliak family, who in turn are still considered glorified capo regimes to the Patrizo family. Correct? Freddy's eyes were still in flat, and Jack's left hand was frozen halfway between the edge of the table and his coffee cup. And beside me, I could hear Kevin taking long, deep breaths through his nose. And you, do I have this right? Sent men to find security weaknesses in the apartment of Mr. Patrizzo's only granddaughter? Freddy, she said and reached across the table and touched his hand. Do you think Mr. Patrizzo would consider these actions respectful or disrespectful? Freddy said, Angela. She patted his hand and stood. Thanks for your time. I stood. Nice seeing you guys. Kevin's chair made a loud scraping noise on the tile as he stepped in my path, looked at me with those depth charge eyes of his. Freddy said, sit the fuck down. You heard him, Kev, I said. Sit the fuck down. Kevin smiled, ran his palm across his mouth. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Pine cross his legs at the ankles again. Kevin, Jack Rouse said. In Kevin's face, I could see years of howling class rage and the bright sheen of true psychosis. I could see the little pissed-off kid whose brain had been stunted and blighted sometime during the first or second grade and had never grown beyond that point. I could see murder. Angela, Freddy said. Mr. Kenzie, please, sit down. Kevin, Jack Rouse said again. Kevin placed the hand that had wiped the smile off his face on my shoulder. Whatever passed between us in the second or two it lay there wasn't pleasant or comfortable or clean. Then he nodded once, as if answering a question I'd asked, and stepped back by his chair. Angela, Freddy said. Could we have a nice day, Freddy? She came around behind me, and we walked out onto Prince Street. We reached the car and commercial a block from DeAndre Warren's apartment, and Angie said, I got some things to do, so I'm going to cab it home from here. You sure? She looked at me like a woman who just backed down a room full of mafioso and wasn't in the mood to take any shit. What are you going to do? 
talk to Deandra, I guess. See if I can find out any more about this Moira Kenzie. You need me? Nope. She looked back up Prince Street. I believe him. Kevin? She nodded. Me too, I said. He has no reason to lie, really. She turned her head, looked over at Lewis Wharf at the single yellow light glowing in DeAndra Warren's apartment. So where's that leave her? If Kevin didn't send that photograph, who did? Having a clue. Some detectives, she said. We'll figure it out, I said. It's what we're good at. I looked up Prince and saw two men walking down toward us. One was short and thin and hard and wore a scally cap. The other was tall and thin and probably giggled when he killed people. They reached the end of the street and stopped at a gold diamante directly across from us. As Kevin opened the passenger door for Jack, he stared at us. That guy, a voice said, doesn't like you too much. I turned my head, saw Pine sitting on the hood of my car. He flicked his wrist and my wallet hit me in the chest. No, I said. Kevin came around the driver's side of the car, still looking at us, then climbed in and they pulled out onto commercial, drove up around Waterfront Park, and disappeared at the curve of Atlantic Ave. Mr. Naro, Pine said, leaning forward and handing her her wallet. Angie took it. That was a very nice performance in there. Bravo. Thank you, Angie said. I wouldn't try it twice, though. No? That would be stupid. She nodded. Yes. That guy, Pine said, looking off to where the Diamante had disappeared and then back at me. He's going to cause you some grief. Not much I can do about it, I said. He came off the car hood fluidly, as if he were incapable of an awkward gesture or the embarrassment of a stumble. It was me, he said. And he looked at me like that. He wouldn't have made his car alive. He shrugged. That's me, though. Angie said, we're used to Kevin. We've known him since kindergarten. Pine nodded probably should have killed him back then. He passed between us and I felt ice melting in the center of my chest. Good night. He crossed commercial and went up Prince, and a crisp breeze swept the street. Angie shivered in her coat. I don't like this case, Patrick. Me either, I said. Don't like it at all. Chapter 5 Except for a single white track light in the kitchen where we sat, Deandra Warren's loft was dark, the furniture rising out of the empty spaces in hulking shadows. Lights from neighboring buildings glazed her windows, but barely penetrated the interior. And across the harbor, Charlestown's lights checkered the black sky in hard squares of yellow and white. It was a relatively warm night, but it seemed cold from Deandra's loft. Deandra placed a second bottle of Brooklyn lager on the butcher block table in front of me, then sat down and idly fingered her wine glass. You're saying you believe these mafioso? Eric said. I nodded. I'd just spent 15 minutes telling them about my meeting at Fat Freddy's place. A meeting only Angie's relationship with Vincent Patrizio. I said, They don't gain much by lying. They're criminals. Eric's eyes widened at me. Lying is second nature to them. I sipped my beer. This is true. But criminals usually lie out of fear or to maintain an edge. Okay? And these guys, believe me, have no reason to fear me. I'm nothing to them. If they were threatening you, Dr. Warren, and I came around on your behalf... Their response would have been, fine, we're threatening her. Now mind your own business or we'll kill you. End of discussion. But they didn't say that. She nodded to herself. 
No. Add to this that Kevin just isn't the type to have a steady girlfriend, and it seems unlikelier by the second. But, Eric started. I held up a hand, looked at Deandra. I should have asked this at our first meeting, but it never occurred to me that this could be a hoax. The guy who called claiming to be Kevin, was there anything odd about his voice? Odd how? I shook my head. Think. It was a deep voice, husky, I guess. That's it? She took a sip of wine, then nodded. Yes. Then it wasn't Kevin. How do you? Kevin's voice is ruined, Dr. Warren. Has been since he was a kid. It sounds like it's perpetually cracking. Like the voice of a teenager going through puberty. That wasn't the voice I heard on the phone. No. Eric rubbed his face. So if Kevin didn't make the call, who did? And why? Deandra said. I looked at both of them and held out my hands. Frankly, I have no idea. Either of you have any enemies? Deandra shook her head. Eric said, How do you define enemies? Enemies, I said. As in people who call up to threaten you at 4 a.m. or send you pictures of your child without a note of explanation or generally wish you dead. Enemies. He thought about it for a moment, then shook his head. You sure? He grimaced. I have professional competitors, I guess, and detractors, people who disagree with me. In what sense? He smiled somewhat ruefully. Patrick, you took my courses. You know that I don't agree with a lot of the experts in the field and that people disagree with my disagreements, but I doubt such people wish me physical harm. Besides, wouldn't my enemies come after me, not Deandra and her son? Deandra flinched, lowered her eyes, and sipped her wine. I shrugged. Possibly. You never know, though. I looked at Deandra. You said that in the past you feared patients. Any of them recently released from wards or prisons who might hold a grudge? I'd have been notified. She met my eyes and hers were vibrant with confusion and fear, a deep encompassing fear. Any current patients who might have the motive and resourcefulness to do this? She spent a good minute thinking about it, but eventually shook her head. No, I'll need to speak to your ex-husband. Stan, why? I don't see the point. I need to rule out any possible connection to him. I'm sorry if it upsets you, but I'd be a fool if I didn't. I'm not obtuse, Mr. Kenzie, but I promise you Stan has no connection to my life and hasn't for almost two decades. I have to know everything I can about the people in your life, Dr. Warren, particularly anyone with whom you have a relationship that is not picture perfect. Patrick, Eric said, come on, what about privacy? I sighed, fuck privacy. Excuse me? You heard me, Eric. I said, fuck privacy. Dr. Warren's and yours, too, I'm afraid. You brought me into this, Eric, and you know how I work. He blinked. I don't like the way this case feels. I looked out at the darkness of Deandra's loft, at the icy sheen on her windows. I don't like it, and I'm trying to catch up on some details so I can do my job and keep Dr. Warren and her son out of danger. To accomplish that... I need to know everything about your lives, both of you. And if you refuse me that access, I looked at Deandra. I'll walk away. Deandra watched me calmly. Eric said, You'd leave a woman in distress just like that? I kept my eyes on Deandra. Just like that, Deandra said, Are you always this blunt? For a quarter second, an image flashed through my brain of a woman cascading down onto hard cement, her body filled with holes, my face and clothes splattered with her blood. Jenna Angeline, dead before she hit the ground on a soft summer morning as I stood an inch away. I said, 
I had someone die on me once because I was a step too slow. I won't have that happen again. A small tremble rippled the skin at the base of her throat. She reached up and rubbed it. So you definitely think I'm in serious danger. I shook my head. I don't know, but you were threatened. You did receive that photo. Someone's going to a lot of trouble to screw with your life. I want to find out who that is and make them stop. That's why you hired me. Can you call Timpson for me, set up an appointment for tomorrow? She shrugged. I suppose. Good. I also need a description of Moira Kenzie. Anything you can remember about her, no matter how small. As Deandra closed her eyes for a full minute to conjure up a complete image of Moira Kenzie, I flipped open a notepad, uncapped a pen, and waited. She was wearing jeans, a black river driver shirt under a red flannel shirt. She opened her eyes. She was very pretty with long, dirty blonde hair, a bit wispy, and she chain-smoked. She seemed authentically terrified. Height? Five-five or so? Weight? I'm guessing about one-ten. What kind of cigarettes did she smoke? She closed her eyes again. Long with white filters. The pack was gold. Deluxe something or other? Benson and Hedges deluxe ultralights? Her eyes snapped open. Yes. I shrugged. My partner switches to them every time she tries to quit by cutting back. Eyes? Green? Any guesses on ethnic background? She sipped her wine. Northern European, maybe, a few generations back, and maybe mixed. She could have been Irish, British, even Slavic. She had very pale skin. Anything else? Where did she say she was from? Belmont, she said with a note of mild surprise. Does that seem incongruous for any reason? Well, if someone's from Belmont... Usually they go to the finer prep schools, etc. True. And one of the things they lose if they ever had it is a Boston accent. Maybe they have a light one. But not a, if you come to my party, don't forget the beer type of accent. Exactly. But Moira did. She nodded. It didn't register at the time, but now, yes, it does seem a bit odd. It wasn't a Belmont accent. It was Revere or East Boston or... She looked at me. Or Dorchester, I said. Yes. A neighborhood accent. I closed my notebook. Yes. What will you do from here, Mr. Kenzie? I'm going to watch Jason. The threats to him. He's the one who feels stalked. It was his picture you received. Yes. I want you to limit your activities. I can't keep your office hours and appointments, I said, but take some time off from Bryce until I have some answers. She nodded. Eric, I said. He looked at me. That gun you're carrying, you know how to use it? I practice once a week, I'm a good shot. It's a little different shooting at flesh, Eric. I know that. I need you to stick as close as you can to Dr. Warren for a few days. You can do that? Certainly. If anything happens, don't waste time trying to get a headshot or put one in some attacker's heart. What should I do then? Empty the gun into the body, Eric. Six shots should put down anything smaller than a rhino. He looked deflated. As if his time spent at the gun club had just been revealed for the futile exercise it usually was. And maybe he really was a good shot but I doubted anyone who attacked Deandra would be wearing a bullseye in the center of his forehead. Eric, I said, would you walk me out? He nodded and we left the loft, walked down a short hall to the elevator. Our friendship can't get in the way of how I do my job. You understand that, don't you? He looked at his shoes, nodded. What's your relationship with her? He met my eyes and his were hard. Why? No privacy, Eric. 
remember that. I have to know what your stake is here. He shrugged. We're friends. Sleepover friends? He shook his head and smiled bitterly. Sometimes, Patrick, I think you need a little polish. I shrugged. I'm not paid for my table manners, Eric. Deandra and I met when I was at Brown working on my doctorate and she was just entering the graduate program. I cleared my throat. Again, are you too intimate? No, he said. We're just very good friends. Like you and Angie. You understand why I made the assumption? He nodded. Is she intimate with anyone? He shook his head. She's... He looked up at the ceiling, then back at his feet. She's what? She's not sexually active, Patrick. By philosophical choice. She's been celibate for at least ten years. Why? His face darkened. I told you, choice. Some people aren't ruled by their libidos, Patrick. Hard as that concept may be for someone such as yourself to understand. Okay, Eric. I said softly. Is there anything you're not telling me? Like what? Skeletons in your closet, I said. A reason why this person would be threatening Jason to get to you. What are you implying? I'm not implying anything, Eric. I asked a direct question. Yes or no is all that's required. No. His voice was ice. Sorry I have to ask these questions. Are you? He said, then turned and walked back to the apartment. Chapter 6 It was close to midnight when I left DeAndres, and the city streets were quiet as I drove south along the waterfront. The temperature was still in the mid-fifties, and I rolled down the windows on my latest hunk of shit and let the soft breeze cleanse the musty confines. After my last company car suffered a coronary on a bleak, forgotten street in Roxbury, I found this 86 nut brown Crown Victoria at a police auction my friend Devin, a cop, had told me about. The engine was a work of art. You could drive a Crown Vic off a 30 story building, and the engine would keep chugging long after the rest of the car had shattered into small pieces. I spent money on everything under the hood and I had it outfitted with top-of-the-line tires. But I left the interior the way I'd found it. Roof and seats yellowed by the previous owner's cheap cigars, back seats torn and spilling foam rubber, broken radio. Both rear doors were sharply dented, as if they'd been squeezed by forceps. And the paint on the trunk was torn off in a jagged circle that revealed the primer underneath. It was a hideous eyesore. But I was reasonably certain no respectable car thief would want to be caught dead in it. At the traffic light by the harbor towers, the engine hummed happily as it guzzled a few gallons of gas a minute, and two attractive young women crossed in front of the car. They looked like office workers. Both wore tight but drab skirts and blouses under wrinkled raincoats. Their dark pantyhose disappeared at the ankles into identical white tennis shoes. They walked with just a hint of uncertainty, as if the pavement were sponge, and the quick laugh of the redhead was a bit too loud. The brunette's eyes met mine, and I smiled the innocuous smile of one human soul acknowledging another on a soft, quiet night in an often bustling city. She smiled back, and then her friend hiccuped loudly, and they both fell into each other and laughed uproariously as they reached the curb. I pulled away, slid onto the central artery with the dark green expressway girded above me, found myself thinking, I was a pretty odd guy if a smile from a tipsy woman could still lift my spirits as easily as it had. But it was an odd world, too often populated with Kevin Hurleyhees and fat Freddy Constantines, and people like a woman I'd read about in the paper this morning, who'd left her three children to fend for themselves in a rat-infested apartment while she went on a four-day bender with her latest boyfriend. When child welfare officials entered her apartment, they had to pull one of the kids screaming from the mattress his bed sores had fastened him to. 
It sometimes seemed in a world like this, on a night when I was filled with a growing sense of dread about a client who was being threatened for unknown reasons by unknown forces whose unknown motives couldn't possibly be good enough, that a smile from a woman shouldn't have any effect. But it did. And if her smile picked up my spirits, it was nothing compared to what Grace's did when I pulled up to my three-decker and saw her sitting on the front porch. She was wearing a forest green canvas field jacket that was four or five sizes too big for her, over a white t-shirt and blue hospital scrub pants. Usually the bangs of her short auburn hair fanned the edges of her face, but she'd obviously been running her hands through it during the last thirty hours of her shift, and her face was drawn from too little sleep and too many cups of coffee under the harsh light of the emergency room. And she was still one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. As I climbed the steps, she stood and watched me with a half-smile playing on her lips and mischief in her pale eyes. When I was three steps from the top, she spread her arms wide and tilted forward like a diver on a high board. Catch me. She closed her eyes and fell forward. The crush of her body against mine was so sweet it bordered on pain. She kissed me and I braced my legs as her thighs slid over my hips and her ankles crossed against the backs of my legs. I could smell her skin and feel the heat of her flesh and the tidal pull of each one of our organs and muscles and arteries hanging as if suspended beneath our separate skins. Grace's mouth came away from mine and her lips grazed my ear. I missed you, she whispered. I noticed I kissed her throat. How'd you escape? She groaned. It finally slowed down. You've been waiting long? She shook her head and her teeth nipped my collarbone before her legs unwrapped themselves from my waist, and she stood in front of me, our foreheads touching. Where's May? I said. Home with Annabeth. Sound asleep. Annabeth was Grace's younger sister and live-in nanny. You see her? Just long enough to read her a bedtime story and kiss her goodnight. Then she was out like a rock. What about you? I said, running my hand up and down her spine. You need sleep? She groaned again and nodded, and her forehead hit mine. Ouch. She laughed softly. Sorry. You're exhausted. She looked into my eyes. Absolutely. More than sleep, though, I need you. She kissed me. Deep, deep inside me. You think you can oblige me, detective? I'm a hell of an obliger, doctor. I've heard that. You going to take me upstairs, or are we going to put on a show for the neighbors? Well, her palm found my abdomen. Tell me where it hurts. A little lower, I said. As soon as I closed the apartment door behind me, Grace pinned me against the wall and buried her tongue in my mouth. Her left hand grasped the back of my head tightly, and her right ran over my body like a small hungry animal. I'm usually on the perpetually hormonal side. But if I hadn't quit smoking several years ago, Grace would have put me in intensive care. The lady is in command tonight, I take it. The lady, she said and nipped my shoulder not very lightly, is so horny, she might have to be hosed down. Again, I said. The gentleman is happy to oblige. She stepped back and stared at me as she pulled off her jacket and tossed it somewhere into my living room. Grace wasn't a big neat freak. Then she kissed my mouth roughly and spun on her heel and started walking down my hallway. Where you going? My voice was a tad hoarse. To your shower. She peeled off her t-shirt as she reached the door to the bathroom. A small shaft of streetlight cut through the bedroom into the hall and slanted across the hard muscles in her back. She hung the T-shirt on the doorknob and turned to look at me. Her arms crossed over her bare breasts. You're not moving, she said. 
I'm enjoying the view, I said. She uncrossed her arms and ran both hands through her hair, arching her back, her rib cage pressing against her skin. She met my eyes again as she kicked off her tennis shoes, then peeled off her socks. She ran her hands over her abdomen and pulled the drawstring on her scrub pants. They fell to her ankles and she stepped out of them. Coming out of your stupor yet? She said. Oh yeah. She leaned against the door jamb, hooked her thumbs in the elastic band of her black panties. She raised an eyebrow as I walked toward her. Her smile, a wicked thing. Oh, would you like to help me remove these, detective? I helped. I helped a lot. I'm swell at helping. It occurred to me as Grace and I made love in my shower that whenever I think of her, I think of water. We met during the wettest week of a cold and drizzly summer, and her green eyes were so pale, they reminded me of winter rain. And the first time we made love, it was in the sea, with the night rain bathing our bodies. After the shower, we lay in bed, still damp, her auburn hair dark against my chest, the sounds of our lovemaking still echoing in my ears. She had a scar the size of a thumbtack on her collarbone, the price she had paid for playing in her uncle's barn near exposed nails when she was a kid. I leaned over and kissed it. Mmm, she said. Do that again. I ran my tongue over the scar. She hooked her leg over mine, ran the edge of her foot against my ankle. Can a scar be erogenous? I think anything can be erogenous. Her warm palm found my abdomen, ran over the hard rubber scar tissue in the shape of a jellyfish. What about this one? Nothing erogenous about that, Grace. You keep evading me about it. It's obviously a burn of some sort. What are you, a doctor? She chuckled. Allegedly. She ran her palm up between my thighs. Tell me where it hurts, detective. I smiled, but I doubt it was much of one. She rose up on her elbow and looked at me for a long time. You don't have to tell me, she said softly. I raised my left hand, used the backs of my fingers to brush a strand of hair off her forehead, then allowed the fingers to drop slowly down the edge of her face, along the soft warmth of her throat, and then the small, firm curve of her right breast. I grazed the nipple with my palm as I turned the hand, moved it back up to her face and pulled her down on top of me. I held her so tightly for a moment that I could hear our hearts drumming through our chests like hail falling into a bucket of water. My father, I said, burned me with an iron to teach me a lesson. Teach you what? She said. Not to play with fire. What? I shrugged. Maybe just that he could. He was the father. I was the son. He wanted to burn me. He could burn me. She raised her head and her eyes filled. Her fingers dug into my hair and her eyes widened and reddened as they searched mine. When she kissed me, it was hard, bruising as if she were trying to suck my pain out. When she pulled back, her face was wet. He's dead, right? My father? She nodded. Oh, yeah. He's dead, Grace. Good, she said. When we made love again a few minutes later, it was one of the most exquisite and disconcerting experiences of my life. Our palms flattened against each other and our forearms followed suit, and at every point along my body, my flesh and bone pressed against hers. Then her thighs rose up my hips and she took me inside of her as her legs slid down the backs of mine and her heels clamped just below my knees, and I felt utterly enveloped, as if I'd melted through her flesh and our blood had joined. She cried out, and I could feel it as if it came from my own vocal cords. Grace, I whispered as I disappeared inside her. 
Grace. Close to sleep, her lips fluttered against my ear. Night, she said sleepily. Night. Her tongue slid in my ear, warm and electric. I love you, she mumbled. When I opened my eyes to look at her, she was asleep. I woke to the sound of her showering at six in the morning. My sheet smelled of her perfume and her flesh, and a vague hint of hospital antiseptic and our sweat and lovemaking. Imprinted into the fabric, it seemed, as if it had been there a thousand nights. I met her at the bathroom door and she leaned into me as she combed back her hair. My hand slid under her towel and the beads of water on her lower thighs glided off the edge of my hand. Don't even think about it. She kissed me. I have to go see my daughter and get back to the hospital and after last night I'm lucky I can walk. Now, go clean up. I showered alone as she found clean clothes in a drawer we'd agreed she could come and dear. Found myself waiting for that usual sense of discomfort, I feel, when a woman has spent more than, oh, an hour in my bed. But I didn't. I love you, she'd mumbled as she drifted off to sleep. How odd. When I came back to the bedroom, she was stripping the sheets from the bed, and she'd changed into a pair of black jeans and a dark blue Oxford shirt. I came up behind her as she bent over the pillows. Touch me, Patrick, she said, and you die. I put my hands back by my sides. She smiled as she turned with sheets in hand and said, Laundry, is that something you're familiar with? Vaguely. She dropped the pile in a corner. Can I expect that you'll remake the bed with fresh sheets, or are we sleeping on a bare mattress next time I come over? I will do my best, madam. She slid her arms around my neck and kissed me. She hugged me fiercely, and I hugged back just as hard. Someone called when you were in the shower. She leaned back in my arms. Who? It's not even seven in the morning. That's what I thought. He didn't leave his name. What'd he say? He knew my name. What? I unclasped my hands from her waist. He was Irish. I figured it was an uncle or something. I shook my head. My uncles and I don't talk. Why not? Because they're my father's brothers, and they aren't any different than he was. Oh, Grace. I took her hand, sat her beside me on the bed. What did this Irish guy say? He said, You must be the lovely Grace, grand to meet you. She looked at the pile of bedclothes for a moment. When I told him you were in the shower, he said, Well, just tell him I called, and I'll be dropping in on him sometime. And he hung up before I can get a name. That's it? She nodded. Why? I shrugged. I don't know, not many people call me before seven, and when they do, they usually leave a name. Patrick, how many of your friends know we're dating? Angie, Devin, Richie and Sherry Lynn, Oscar, and Bubba. Bubba? You met him, big guy, always wears a trench coat. The scary one, she said. The one who looks like he might just walk into a 7-Eleven one day and kill everyone inside because the slurping machine isn't working. That's the guy. You met him at that party last month, I remember. She shuddered. He's harmless. Maybe to you, she said, Christ. I tilted her chin toward me. Not just me, Grace. Anyone I care about. Bob was insanely loyal that way. Her hands ran the wet hair hack off my temples. He's still a psychopath. People like Bubba fill emergency rooms with fresh victims. Okay. So I don't ever want him near my daughter. Understand. There's a look a parent gets when she's feeling protective of her child, and it's an animal's look. 
and the danger that steams off it is palpable. It's not something that can be reasoned with, and even though it stems from the depths of love, it knows no pity. Grace had that look now. Deal, I said. She kissed my forehead. Still doesn't solve the identity of the Irish guy who called. Nope. He say anything else? Soon, she said as she came off the bed. Where'd I leave my jacket? Living room, I said. What do you mean, soon? She paused on her way to the doorway and looked back at me. When he said he'd be dropping by your place, he waited a few seconds and then he said, soon. She walked out of the bedroom and I heard a weak floorboard creak in the living room as she walked through. Soon. Chapter 7 Shortly after Grace left, Deandra called. Stan Timpson would give me five minutes on the phone at eleven. Five whole minutes, I said. For Stan, that's generous. I gave him your number. He'll call you at eleven on the dot. Stanley's prompt. She gave me Jason's class schedule for the week and his dorm room number. I copied it all down as fear made her voice sound tiny and brittle. And just before we hung up, she said, I'm so nervous. I hate it. Don't worry, Dr. Warren. This will all work out. Will it? I called Angie and the phone was picked up on the second ring. Before I heard a voice, there was a rustling noise, as if the phone were being passed from one hand to another, and I heard her whisper, I got it. Okay? Her voice was hoarse and hesitant with sleep. Hello? Morning. Uh-huh, she said. It's that. There was another rustling noise from her end, a disentangling of sheets, and a bedspring groaned. What's up, Patrick? I gave her the rundown of my conversation with Deandra and Eric. So it definitely wasn't Kevin who called her. Her voice was still sluggish. This makes no sense. Nope, you got a pen? Somewhere, let me find it. More of that rustling sound and I knew she dropped the phone on the bed as she rummaged around for a pen. Angie's kitchen is spotless because she's never used it. And her bathroom sparkles because she hates filth. But her bedroom always looks like she just unpacked from a trip in the middle of a windstorm. Socks and underwear spill from open drawers, and clean jeans and shirts and leggings are strewn across the floor or hang from doorknobs or the posts of her headboard. She's never, as long as I've known her, worn the first wardrobe she's considered in the morning. Amid all this carnage, books and magazines, spines bent or cracked peek up from the floor. Mountain bikes have been lost in Angie's bedroom, and now she was looking for a pen. After several drawers were banged open and change and lighters and earrings were moved around on the tops of nightstands, someone said, what are you looking for? A pen. Here. Yeah. She came back on the line. Got a pen. Paper, I said. Oh, shit. That took another minute. Go ahead, she said. I gave her Jason Warren's class schedule and dorm room number. She'd tail him while I waited for Stan Timpson's call. Got it, she said. Damn, I gotta get moving. I looked at my watch. His first class isn't until 10.30, you got time. Nope. Got an appointment at 9.30. With who? Her breathing was slightly labored and I assumed she was tugging on jeans. My attorney. See you at Bryce whenever you get there. She hung up and I stared out at the avenue below. It seemed cut from a canyon. The day was so clear, striped hard as a frozen river between rows of three deckers and brick. Windshields were seared white and opaque by the sun. An attorney. Sometimes in the heady flush of my past three months with Grace, I'd remember with something like surprise 
that my partner was also out there living a life, separate from my own. Her life with its attorneys and entanglements and mini-dramas and men who handed her pens in her bedroom at 8.30 in the morning. So who was this attorney? And who was the guy who handed her the pen? And why should I care? And what the hell did soon mean? I had 90 minutes or so to kill before Timson called. And after I exercised, I still had over an hour. I went looking for something in my fridge that wasn't beer or soda and came up empty. So I walked up the avenue to the corner store for my coffee. I took it back out into the avenue and leaned against a light pole for a few minutes, enjoyed the day, and sipped my coffee as traffic rolled by and pedestrians rushed past on their way to the subway stop at the end of Crescent. Behind me I could smell the stench of stale beer and soaked in wood whiskey, wafting from the Black Emerald Tavern. The Emerald opened at eight for those getting off the graveyard shift, and now, close to ten, it sounded no different than it did on a Friday night. A gaggle of slurred, lazy voices punctuated by the occasional bellow or the sharp crack of a pool cue making impact with a rack of balls. Hey, stranger. I turned and looked down into the face of a petite woman with a hazy, liquid grin. She had her hand over her eyes to block the sun, and it took me a minute to place her because the hair and clothes were different, and even her voice had deepened since the last time I'd heard it, though it was still light and ephemeral, as if it might lift off into the breeze before the words had time to dig in. Hi, Kara, when'd you get back? She shrugged. A while ago. How you doing, Patrick? Fine. Kara pivoted back and forth on her heel and rolled her eyes off to the side, her grin playing softly up the left side of her face, and she was instantly familiar again. She'd been a sunny kid, but a loner. You'd see her in the playground, scribbling or drawing in a notepad while the other kids played kickball. As she grew older and took her place on the corner overlooking the Blake yard, her group filling the place my group had abandoned ten years earlier. You'd notice her sitting off to herself against a fence or porch post, drinking a wine cooler and looking out at the streets as if they seemed suddenly foreign to her. She wasn't ostracized or labeled weird because she was beautiful. More beautiful by half than the next most beautiful girl. And pure beauty is valued in this neighborhood like no other commodity, because it seems more accidental than even a cash windfall. Everyone knew from the time she could walk that she'd never stay in the neighborhood. It could never hold the beautiful ones, and the leaving was entrenched in her eyes like flaws in the irises. When you spoke to her, some part of her, whether it was her head, her arms, her twitching legs, was incapable of remaining still, as if it were already moving past you and the boundaries of the neighborhood into that place she saw beyond. As rare as she would have seemed to her circle of friends, a version of Kara came along every five years or so. In my days on the corner, it was Angie. And as far as I know, she's the only one who thwarted the strangely defeated neighborhood logic and stuck around. Before Angie, there was Eileen Mack, who hopped an Amtrak in her graduation gown and was next seen a few years later on Starsky and Hutch. In 26 minutes, she met Starsky, slept with him, gained Hutch's approval, though it was touch and go there for a while, and accepted Starsky's stumbling marriage proposal. By the next commercial break, she was dead, and Starsky went on a rampage and found her killer and blew him away with a fierce, righteous look in his face, and the episode ended with him standing over her grave in the rain, and we were left knowing he'd never get over her. By the next episode, he had a new girlfriend, and Eileen was never mentioned or seen again by Starsky or Hutch or anyone in the neighborhood. Kara had gone to New York after a year at UMass, and that's the last I'd heard of her, too. Angie and I had actually seen her board the bus as we came out of Tom English's one afternoon. It was the middle of summer, and Kara stood across the avenue at the bus stop. Her natural hair color was a wispy, weedy blonde, 
and it blew in her eyes as she adjusted the strap on her bright sundress. She waved and we waved back, and she lifted her suitcase as the bus pulled in and scooped her up and took her away. Now her hair was short and spiky and ink black, and her skin was pale as bleach. She wore a sleeveless black turtleneck tucked into painted on charcoal jeans, and the nervous, half-gasping sound, almost a hiccup, punctuated the ends of her sentences. Nice day, huh? I'll take it. Last October we had snow by this time. New York, too. She chuckled, then nodded to herself and looked down at her scuffed boots. Hmm. Yeah. I sipped some more coffee. So how are you doing, Kara? She put her hand over her eyes again, looked at the slow-motion morning traffic. Hard sunlight glanced off the windshields and shafted through the spikes of her hair. I'm good, Patrick. Really good. How about you? No complaints. I glanced at the avenue myself, and when I turned back, she was looking into my face intently, as if trying to decide whether it attracted or repelled her. She swayed slightly from side to side, an almost imperceptible movement, and I could hear two guys shouting, something about five dollars and a baseball game through the open doorway of the Black Emerald. She said, You still a detective? Uh Uh-huh. Good living? Sometimes, I said. My mom mentioned you in a letter last year, said you were in all the papers, a big deal. I was surprised Kara's mother could climb out of the inside of a scotch glass long enough to read a paper, never mind write her daughter a letter about the experience. It was a slow news week, I said. She looked back at the bar, ran a finger above her ear as if tucking back hair that wasn't there. What do you charge? Depends on the case. You need a detective, Kara? Her lips looked thin and oddly abandoned for a moment, as if she'd closed her eyes during a kiss and opened them to find her lover gone. No. She laughed, then hiccuped. I'm moving to L.A. soon. I landed a part on Days of Our Lives. Really? Hey, congrats just to walk on, she said, shaking her head. I'm the nurse who's always fiddling with papers behind the nurse who stands at the admitting desk. Still, I said, it's a start. A man stuck his head out of the bar, looked to his right, then to his left, saw us through bleary eyes. Mickey Doog, part-time construction worker, full-time coke dealer. A former local heartthrob from Kara's age group. Still trying to hold the line of his youth against the advance of a receding hairline and softening muscles. He blinked when he saw me, then stuck his head back inside. Kara's shoulders tensed, as if she'd felt him there. Then she leaned in toward me, and I could smell the sharp odor of rum floating from her mouth at ten in the morning. Crazy world, huh? Her pupils glinted like razors. Uh, yeah, I said. You need help, Kara? She laughed again, followed it with a hiccup. No, no. No, I just wanted to say, hey, Patrick. You're one of the big brothers to our crew. She tilted her head back toward the bar so I could see where some of her crew had ended up this morning. I just wanted to, you know, say hi. I nodded and watched tiny tremors ripple the skin along her arms. She kept glancing at my face as if it might reveal something to her, then looked away when it didn't, only to come back to it a second later. She reminded me of a kid with no money, standing in a group of kids with plenty at an ice cream truck, as if she were watching cones and chocolate eclairs pass over her head into other hands, and half of her knew she'd never get one, and the other half held out hope that the ice cream man might hand her one out of error or pity, bleeding inside from the embarrassment of wanting. I pulled out my wallet and extracted a business card. She frowned at it, then looked at me. Her half-smile was sarcastic and a bit ugly. 
I'm fine, Patrick. You're half in the bag at ten in the morning, Kara. She shrugged. It's noon somewhere. Not here, though. Mickey Duke stuck his head out of the door again. He looked directly at me, and his eyes weren't as bleary, emboldened by some blow or whatever else he was selling these days. Hi, Kara, are you coming back inside? She made a little movement with her shoulders, my car dampening in her palm. Be right in, Mick. Mickey seemed ready to say more, but then he patted the door in a drumbeat, nodded once and disappeared inside. Kara glanced at the avenue, stared at the cars for a long time. You leave a place, she said. You expect it to look smaller when you come back. She shook her head and sighed. It doesn't? She shook her head. Looks just the fucking same. She took a few steps backward, tapping my card against her hip, and her eyes widened as she looked at me and rolled her shoulders elaborately. Take care, Patrick. You too, Kara. She held up my card. Hey, now I got this, right? She tucked it into the back pocket of her jeans and turned toward the open doorway of the Black Emerald. She stopped then, turned and smiled at me. It was a wide, gorgeous smile, but her face seemed unaccustomed to it. Her cheeks quivered around its edges. Be careful, Patrick, okay? Careful of what? Of everything, Patrick. Everything. I gave her what I'm sure was a quizzical look, and she nodded at me as if we shared a secret. And then she ducked into the barn and was gone. Chapter 8 My father, even before he entered the arena himself, had been active in local politics. He was a sign holder and a door knocker, and the bumpers of the various Chevys we'd owned throughout my childhood and adolescence had always borne stickers attesting to my father's partisan loyalty. Politics had nothing to do with social change to my father, and he didn't give a shit what most politicians promised in public. It was the private bonds that drew him. Politics was the last great treehouse. And if you got in with the best kids on the block, you could roll the ladder up on the fools below. He'd supported Stan Timpson when Timpson, fresh out of law school and new to the DA's office, had run for alderman. Timpson was from the neighborhood, after all, a comer. And if things went right, Soon he'd be the guy to call when you needed your street plowed or your noisy neighbors rousted or your cousin put on the union doll. I vaguely remembered Timpson from my childhood, but couldn't completely separate where my own recollection of Timpson differed from the one I'd seen on TV. So when his voice filtered through my phone receiver, it seemed strangely disembodied, as if it were pre-recorded. Pat Kenzie, he said heartily. Patrick, Mr. Timpson. How are you, Patrick? Just fine, sir. How about yourself? Great, great. Couldn't be better. He laughed warmly as if we'd shared a joke I somehow missed. Deandra tells me you have some questions for me. I do, yes. Well, fire away, son. Timpson was only ten or twelve years older than I was. I wasn't sure how that made me son. Deandra told you about the photo of Jason she received? She sure did, Patrick. And I gotta tell you, it seems a bit strange. Yes, well, personally I think someone's playing a trick on her. Pretty elaborate trick. She told me you dismissed the mafia connection. At the moment, yes. Well, I don't know what to tell you, Pat. Is there anything your office is working on, sir, which could have caused someone to threaten your ex-wife and son? That's the movies talking, Pat. Patrick. I mean, maybe in Bogota they'd go after their district attorneys on personal vendettas. Not in Boston. Come on, son. That's the best you can do? Another hearty laugh. Sir, your son's life may be in danger, and protect him, Pat. I'm trying to, sir, but I can't do that if... You know what I think this is? I'll tell you the truth. It's one of DeAndra's crazies. 
Forgot to take his Prozac and decided to make her nervous. You look over her patient list, son. That's my suggestion. Sir, if you just... Pat, listen to me. I haven't been married to Deandre in almost two decades. When she called last night, that's the first time I'd heard her voice in six years. No one knows we were ever married. No one knows about Jason. The last campaign, believe me, we were waiting for the issue to be raised. How I left my first wife and baby boy and have maintained very little contact. Guess what, though, Pat? It never came up. A dirty political race in a dirty political town, and it never came up. No one knows about Jason or Deandra in relation to me. What about? It's been a pleasure talking to you, Pat. Tell your father Stan Timpson said hi. I miss that old guy. Where's he hiding these days? Cedar Grove Cemetery. Got himself a groundskeeper job, did he? Well, gotta run. Take care, Pat. This kid, Angie said, is an even bigger slut than you used to be, Patrick. Hey, I said. Our fourth day of following Jason Warren, and it was beginning to feel like tailing a young Valentino. Deandra had stressed that we not let Jason know we were tailing him, citing a male's reluctance to let anyone else control or alter his destiny, and Jason's own formidable sense of privacy, as she called it. I'd be private, too, I guess, if I averaged three women in three days. A hat trick, I said. What? Angie said. The kid scored a hat trick on Wednesday. That officially puts him in the Hound Hall of Fame. Men, she said, are pigs. This is true. Wipe that smirk off your face. If Jason were being stalked, the most likely suspect was a jilted lover. Some young woman who didn't much appreciate being a notch on a belt, the number two of three. But we'd been watching him almost nonstop for over 80 hours, and we'd seen no one following him but us. He wasn't hard to find either. Jason spent his days in class, usually arranged a nooner in his dorm room an arrangement he seemed to have worked out with his roommate, a stoner from Oregon who held bong parties every night at seven when Jason was out of the room, studied on the lawn until sunset, ate in the cafeteria with a table full of women and no men, then hit the bars around Bryce at night. The women he slept with, at least the three we'd seen, all seemed to know of one another without jealousy. All were somewhat of a type, too. They wore fashionable clothing, usually black, with even more fashionable rips in them somewhere. They wore tacky costume jewelry, which, given the cars they drove and the soft imported leather of their boots, jackets, and knapsacks, they presumably knew was tacky. So unhip as to be hip, I guess. Their ironic postmodern wink at a hopelessly out of touch world. Or something. None of them had boyfriends. They were all enrolled in the School of Arts and Sciences. Gabrielle majored in literature. Lauren majored in art history, but spent most of her time playing lead guitar in an all-female ska-punk speed metal band, which seemed to have spent far too much time taking Courtney Love and Kim Deal seriously. And Jade, small and lean and self-consciously foul-mouthed, was a painter. None of them appeared to bathe much. This would have been a problem for me, but it didn't seem to bother Jason. He didn't bathe much either. I've never been particularly conservative when it comes to my taste in women, but I do have one rule about bathing and one rule about clitoral rings, and I'm pretty unyielding about both of them. Makes me a killjoy with the grunge set, I guess. Jason made up for the slack, though. Jason, from what we'd seen, was the male campus pump, Wednesday. He climbed out of Jade's bed and they both went to a bar called Harper's Ferry, where they met Gabrielle. Jade stayed in the bar, but Jason and Gabrielle retired to Gabrielle's BMW. There they had oral genital contact, which I had the misfortune to observe. When they returned, Gabrielle and Jade went into the ladies' room where, 
According to Angie, they gleefully compared notes. Thick as a python, allegedly. Angie said, It's not the size of the wand. Keep telling yourself that, Patrick. Maybe one day you'll believe it. The two women and their boy toy then moved on to T.T., the bear's place, in Central Square, where Lauren and her band played like tone-deaf whole wannabes. After the show, Jason took a ride home with Lauren. They went to her room, lit incense, and fucked like sea otters to old Patty Smith CDs until shortly before dawn. On the second night in a bar on North Harvard, I bumped into him as I was coming out of the bathroom. I had my eyes on the crowd trying to spot Angie, and I didn't even notice Jason until my chest hit his shoulder. Looking for someone? What? I said. His eyes were full of mischief, but without malice, and shone a bright green in the light shafting from the stage. I said, are you looking for someone? He lit a cigarette, drew it from his mouth with the same fingers that held his scotch glass. My girlfriend, I said. Sorry I bumped you. No problem, he said, shouting a bit over the band's tepid guitar riffs. You looked a little lost is all. Good luck. What's that? Good luck, he shouted into my ear. Finding your girl or whatever. Thanks. I cut into the crowd as he turned back to Jade said something in her ear that made her laugh. At first it was fun, Angie said on our fourth day. Which? The voyeurism. Don't knock voyeurism. American culture wouldn't exist without it. I'm not, she said. But it's getting kind of, well, sodden watching this kid fuck everything that isn't nailed down, you know? I nodded. They seem lonely. Who? I said. All of them. Jason, Gabrielle, Jade, Lauren. Lonely. Huh. Well, they seem to be doing a good job hiding it from the rest of the world. So did you for a long time, Patrick. So did you. Ouch, I said. The end of the fourth day, we split the duties. For a kid who packed so many women and so many bars into his day, Jason was very structured. You could predict almost to the minute where he'd be at any given moment. That night I went home, and Angie watched his dorm room. She called while I was cooking dinner to tell me that Jason seemed to have settled in for the night with Gabrielle in his own room. Angie was going to grab a cat nap and walk him to class in the morning. After dinner, I sat on my porch and looked out at the avenue as night deepened and chilled. It wasn't a minor lessening in warmth, either. It was a total plummet. The moon burned like a slice of dry ice, and the air smelled the way it does after an evening high school football game. A stiff breeze swept the avenue, bit its way through the trees, nibbled at the dry edges of leaves. I came off the porch when Devin telephoned. What's up? I said. What do you mean? You don't call the chat, Dev. It's not your style. Maybe this is the new me. Nope. He grumbled. Fine. We have to talk. Poor Kay. Because someone just smoked a girl on Meeting House Hill and she has no ID, and I'd like to know who she is. Which has what exactly to do with me? Maybe nothing but she did have your card in her hand when she died. My card? Yours, he said. Meeting House Hill. See you in ten minutes. He hung up and I sat with the phone in my ear, listening until the dial tone returned. I sat there longer still hearing the tone, waiting for it to tell me that the dead girl on Meeting House Hill wasn't Kara Ryder waiting for it to tell me something, anything. Chapter 9 By the time I reached Meeting House Hill, the temperature had dropped into the low 30s. It was a barren cold, one without wind or spirit. 
the kind that sinks into your bone marrow and fills your blood with shards of ice. Meeting House Hill is the dividing line where my neighborhood ends and Fields Corner begins. The hill starts below the pavement, sloping the streets into a steep upgrade that turns a car's third gear into reverse on icy nights. Where several streets converge at an apex, the tip of Meeting House Hill rises through the grid of cement and tar to form a pauper's field in the middle of the neighborhood, so blighted you could fire a missile through its center, and no one would notice unless you hit a bar or a food stamp office. The bell of St. Peter's tolled once as Devin met me at my car, and we trudged up the hill. The sound of the bell was hollow, ringing blithely on a cold night in an area some god had clearly forgotten. The ground was beginning to harden, and patches of dead grass crunched under our feet. I could see only a few figures silhouetted under the streetlight atop the hill, and I turned to Devon. You bring the entire force out tonight, Dev? He looked at me, his head shrunk low in his jacket. You'd prefer we made a media van out of it? Have a bunch of reporters and townies and rookies trampling evidence? He glanced at the rows of three deckers overlooking the hill. Great thing about homicides in shitty neighborhoods. Nobody gives a fuck, so nobody gets in the way. Nobody gives a fuck, Devin. Then nobody's going to tell you anything. That's the downside, sure. His partner, Oscar Lee, was the first cop I recognized. Oscar is the largest guy I've ever met. He'd make Refrigerator Perry look anorexic, and Michael Jordan look like a midget. And even Bubba looks puny beside Oscar. He wore a leather watch cap over a black head the size of a circus balloon and smoked a cigar that smelled like beachfront after an oil slick. He turned as we approached. By hell's Kenzie doing here, Devin? Oscar, my friend in need, my friend indeed. Devin said, the card, remember? So you might be able to ID this girl, Kenzie. If I could see her, Oscar, maybe. Oscar shrugged. She's probably looked better. He stepped aside so that I had a clear view of the body lying under the street light. She was naked except for a pair of light blue satin underpants. Her body was swollen from the cold or rigor or something else. Her bangs were swept back off her forehead, and her mouth and eyes were open. Her lips were blue from the cold, and she seemed to look at something just over my shoulder. Her thin arms and legs were spread wide, and dark blood, chilled to slush, puddled out from the base of her throat. The heels of her upturned palms and the soles of her feet, small flat circles of metal, glinted from the center of each palm and each upturned ankle. It was Kara Ryder. She'd been crucified. Three penny nails, Devon said later as we sat in the Black Emerald Tavern. Very basic. Only two-thirds of the homes in this city have them. Preferred by carpenters everywhere. Carpenters, Oscar said. That's it, Devon said. The perp's a carpenter, pissed off about that Christ thing, taking it upon himself to avenge the hero of his trade. You writing this down? Oscar asked me. We'd come to the bar looking for Mickey Doog, the last person I'd seen Kara with, but he hadn't been seen since the early afternoon. Devin got his address from Jerry Glynn, the owner, and sent a few patrolmen by but Mickey's mother hadn't seen him since yesterday. There was a few of them in here this morning, Jerry told us. Kara, Mickey, John Buccieri, Michelle Rourke. Part of that crew used to run around together a few years back. They leave together? Jerry nodded. I was just coming in as they were going out. They were pretty hammered, and it wasn't even one in the afternoon. She's a good kid, though, that Kara. Was, Oscar said. Was a good kid. It was close to two in the morning and we were drunk. 
Jerry's dog Patton, a massive German shepherd with a coat of black and dusky amber, lay on the bar top ten feet away, watching us as if deciding whether he'd be taking our car keys or not. Eventually he yawned, and a great bacon strip of a tongue lolled from his mouth as he looked away from us with what seemed a studied disinterest. After the medical examiner had shown up, I'd stood in the cold for another two hours while Kara's body was carted into an ambulance and shipped off to the morgue, and then while the forensics team swept the area for the evidence and Devin and Oscar canvassed the homes fronting the park for anyone who might have heard anything. It wasn't so much that no one heard anything, just that women screamed in this neighborhood every night, and it was sort of like a car alarm. Once you heard it enough times, you stopped noticing. From the cloth fibers Oscar noticed stuck to Kara's teeth, and the lack of blood Devin found in the nail holes that bored through the frozen dirt under her hands and feet, they assumed the following. She'd been killed at another location, after the killer had shoved a handkerchief or piece of shirt in her mouth, then made an incision in the base of her throat with either a stiletto or a very sharp ice pick to demobilize her larynx. He'd then been free to watch her die from either severe shock trauma, a heart attack, or slow suffocation due to drowning in her own blood. For whatever reason, the killer had then transported the body to Meeting House Hill and crucified Kara to the frozen dirt. He's a sweetheart, this guy, Devin said. Probably just needs a good hug, Oscar said. Straighten him right out. No such thing as a bad boy, Devin said. You're damn skippy, Oscar said. I hadn't said much since I'd seen her body. Unlike Oscar and Devin, I'm no pro when it comes to violent death. I've seen my share, but not on a level even remotely comparable with either of these guys. I said, I can't handle this. Yes, Devin said, you can. Drink more, Oscar said. He nodded in the direction of Jerry Glenn. Jerry'd owned the Black Emerald since the days when he was a cop. And even though he usually shuts down at one, he never closes his doors to people on the job. He had our drinks in front of us before Oscar finished his nod. And he was back at the other end of the bar before we even realized he'd been by. The definition of a good bartender. Crucified. I sat for the twentieth time that night as Devin placed a fresh beer in my hand. I think we're all agreed on that point, Patrick. Devin, I said, trying to focus on him, pissed off that he wouldn't remain still. The girl was barely twenty-two years old. I've known her since she was two. Devin's eyes remained still and blank. I looked at Oscar. He chewed a half-smoked, unlit cigar and looked back at me like I was a piece of furniture he hadn't decided where to place. Fuck, I said. Patrick, Devin said. Patrick, you listening? I turned in his direction. For a brief moment, his head stopped moving. What? She was 22. Yes, a baby. And if she'd been 15 or 40, it wouldn't be any better. Death is death and murder is murder. Don't make it worse by getting sentimental about her age, Patrick. She was murdered. Atrociously. No argument. But he leaned haphazardly on the bar, closed one eye. Partner, what was my butt? But, Oscar said, don't matter if she was male or female, rich or poor, young or old, black or white, Devin said. Black or white, Oscar said, scowling at Devin. She was still murdered, Kenzie. Murdered bad. I looked at him. You ever seen anything that bad? He chuckled. Seen a whole lot worse, Kenzie. I turned to Devin. You? Hell yes. 
He sipped his drink. Violent world, Patrick. People enjoy killing. It empowers them, Oscar said. Exactly, Devin said. Some part of it makes you feel pretty goddamn good. All that power. He shrugged. But why are we telling you? You'd know all about that. Excuse me? Oscar put a hand the size of a catcher's mitt on my shoulder. Kenzie, everyone knows you did Marion Socia last year. We got you pegged for a couple punks in the projects off the Melnea cast, too. What? I said. And you haven't had me arraigned? Patrick, 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 Devin said, slurring just a bit. It was up to us you'd get a medal for Socia. Fuck him. Fuck him twice, far as I'm concerned. But, he said, closing one eye again, you can't tell me some part of you didn't feel real good watching the light go out of his eyes when you popped one through his head. I said, no comment. Kenzie, Oscar said, you know he's right. He's drunk, but he's right. You drew on that pile of shit socia, looked in his eyes, and put his ass down. He made a pistol with his index finger and thumb, shoved it against my temple. Bang, bang, bang. He removed the finger. No more marrying socia. Kind of feels like being God for a day, don't it? How I felt when I killed Marion Socia under an expressway as trucks hammered the metal extensions overhead was one of the more conflicted set of emotions I'd ever had in my life. And I sure as hell didn't feel like reminiscing about it in a bar with two homicide detectives when I was half in the back. Maybe I'm paranoid. Devin smiled. Killing someone feels very good, Patrick. Don't kid yourself. Jerry Glynn came down the bar. Another round, boys? Devin nodded. Hey, Jer. Jerry stopped halfway down the bar. You ever kill anyone on the job? Jerry looked a bit embarrassed, as if he'd heard the question too many times. Never even pulled my gun. No, Oscar said. Jerry shrugged. His kind eyes completely at odds with the job he'd done for 20 years. He scratched Patton's abdomen absently. Those were different days then. You remember Dev. Devin nodded. Different days. Jerry pulled the tap to fill my beer mug. Different world, really. Different world, Devin said. He brought our fresh drinks down to us. Wish I could help you out, guys. I looked at Devin. Someone notify Kara's mother? He nodded. She was passed out in her kitchen. But they woke her up and told her. Someone's sitting with her now. Kenzie, Oscar said. We're going to get this Mickey Duke. It was someone else. A gang, whatever. We'll get them all. In a few hours, we know everyone's awake. We're going to re-canvas every house, and someone probably will have seen something. And we'll pick the punk motherfucker up and sweat him and mess with his head till he breaks. Won't bring her back, but maybe we speak for her a bit. I said, yeah, but... Devin leaned toward me. The prick who did this is going down, Patrick. Believe it. I wanted to. I really did. Just before we left, while Devin and Oscar were in the bathroom, I looked up from the blurred bar top and found both Jerry and Patton staring at me. In the four years Jerry had him, I'd never known Patton to so much as bark. But one look in the dog's still flat eyes and you'd never consider messing with it. That dog's eyes had probably 40 different casts for Jerry, ranging from love to sympathy, but it had only one for everyone else. 
Fair warning. Jerry scratched behind Patton's ears. Crucifixion. I nodded. How many times you think that's happened in this city, Patrick? I shrugged, not trusting my tongue to enunciate properly anymore. Probably not many, Jerry said. Then looked down as Patton licked his hand, and Devin came back into the room. That night I dreamed of Kara Ryder. I was walking through a cabbage field filled with black Angus cows and human heads whose faces I didn't recognize. In the distance, the city burned, and I could see my father's silhouette standing atop an engine ladder, hosing the flames with gasoline. The fire was rolling steadily out from the city, kissing the edges of the cabbage field. Around me, the human heads were beginning to speak, an incoherent babble at first, but soon I could distinguish a stray voice or two. Smells like smoke, one said. You always say that, one of the cows said and spit cut into a cabbage leaf as a stillborn calf fell from between its legs and puddled by its hoofs. I could hear cow screaming from somewhere in the field as the air grew black and oily and the smoke bit my eyes. And Kara kept screaming my name. But I couldn't tell the human heads from the cabbage heads, and the cows were moaning and tipping in the breeze, and the smoke was all around me. And pretty soon Kara's screams stopped, and I felt grateful as the flames began to lick at my legs. So I sat down in the middle of the field to get my wind back, and watched the world burn around me as the cows chewed the grass and swayed back and forth and refused to run. When I woke up in bed, I was gasping for air and the smell of burning flesh clung to my nostrils. I watched the sheet shake over my racing heart and swore I'd never go drinking with Oscar and Devin again. Chapter 10 I had crawled into bed at four that morning, been awakened by my Salvador Dali dream sometime around seven, and didn't fall back asleep until about eight which meant nothing to Lyle Dimmick and his buddy Waylon Jennings. At exactly nine, Waylon started screaming about the woman who'd done him wrong, and the harsh grit of a country fiddle climbed over my windowsills and rattled china in my brain. Lyle Dimmick was a permanently sunburned house painter who'd come here from Odessa, Texas, because of a woman. He'd found her, lost her, got her back, and lost her again when she ran back to Odessa with some guy she met in a neighborhood pub, an Irish pipe fitter, who decided he'd always been a cowpoke at heart. Ed Donegan owned almost every three-decker on my block, save for my own, and every ten years, he got around to painting them. And every time he did, he hired a single painter for as long as it took to paint them all, rain, snow, or shine. Lyle wore a ten-gallon hat and a red handkerchief around his neck and black wraparound gargoyle sunglasses that took up half of his small pinched face. Those sunglasses, he said, seemed like something a city boy would wear, and they were his only concession to living in a god-awful world of Yankees who had no appreciation for God's three great gifts to mankind, Jack Daniels, the horse, and, of course, Waylon. I stuck my head in between the shade and the screen and saw that his back was to me as he painted the house next door. The music was so loud he'd never hear me, so I pulled down the window instead, then stumbled up and pulled down all the others in the bedroom and reduced Waylon to just another tinny voice ringing in my head. Then I crawled back into bed and closed my eyes and prayed for quiet, which meant nothing to Angie. She woke me shortly after ten by bouncing around the apartment making coffee, opening windows to another fresh autumn day, and rattling through my refrigerator, as Waylon or Merle or Hank Jr. poured back through my screens. When that didn't rouse me from bed, she opened the bedroom door and said, Get up! Go away! I pulled the covers over my head. Get up, you baby! I'm bored. Now! 
I threw a pillar at her, and she ducked and it arced over her head and shattered something in the kitchen. She said, You weren't fond of those dishes, I hope. I stood and wrapped the sheet around my waist to cover my glow-in-the-dark Marvin the Martian boxer shorts and stumbled out into the kitchen. Angie stood in the middle of the room, coffee cup held in both hands, a few broken plates on the floor and sink. Coffee? She said. I found a broom began sweeping up the mess. Angie put her cup on the table, bent by me with a dustpan. I said, You're still a bit unclear on this sleep concept, aren't you? Overrated. She scooped up some glass and dumped it in the wastebasket. How would you know you've never tried it? Patrick, she said, dumping another load of glass. It's not my fault you stayed out until the wee hours drinking with your little friends. My little friends. How do you know I was out drinking with anybody? She dumped the last bit of glass, straightened. Because your skin is a shade of green I've never seen before. And there was an incredibly drunken message on my answering machine this morning. Ah. I vaguely recollected a payphone and a beep from some point last night. What did this message say? She took her coffee cup off the table and leaned against the washing machine. Something like, Where are you? It's three in the morning. Something's really fucked up. We gotta talk. The rest I couldn't understand, but by then you'd started speaking Swahili anyway. I put the dustpan, broom, and wastebasket in the pantry, poured myself a cup of coffee. So, I said, where were you at three in the morning? You're my father now? She frowned and pinched my waist just above the sheet. You're getting love handles. I reached for the cream. I don't have love handles. And you know why? Because you still drink beer like you're in a frat. I looked at her steadily, poured extra cream into my coffee. You going to answer my original question? About my whereabouts last night? Yes. She sipped her coffee, looked over the mug rim at me. Nope. I did wake with a warm, fuzzy feeling, though, and a big smile on my face. Big smile big as the one you're wearing now. Bigger. Hmm, <laughs> I said. She hoisted herself up into the washing machine. So you called me, shit-faced, at 3 a.m. to do more than check up on my sex life. What's up? She lit a cigarette. I said, you remember Kara Ryder? Yeah? Someone murdered her last night. No. Her eyes were huge. Yes. With all the extra cream, my coffee tasted like baby's formula. Crucified her on meeting House Hill. She closed her eyes for a moment, opened them. She looked at her cigarette like it might tell her something. Any idea who did it? She said. No one was parading around meeting House Hill with a bloody hammer singing... Boy, oh boy, do I like to crucify women, if that's what you mean. I tossed my coffee in the sink. Quietly, she said, you done snapping for the day? I poured fresh coffee into the cup. Don't know yet. It's still early. I turned around as she slipped off the washing machine and stood in front of me. I saw a carousel body lying in the cold night, swollen and exposed, her eyes blank. I said, I ran into her the other morning outside the Emerald. I had a feeling, I don't know, that she was in trouble or something, but I let it go. I blew it off. And what? She said. You're somehow to blame? I shrugged. No, Patrick, she said. She ran a warm palm up the side of my neck, forced me to look in her eyes. Understand? Nobody should die like Kara did. Understand? She said again. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I guess. No guessing, she said. She removed her hand and pulled a white envelope from her purse and handed it to me. 
This was taped to the front door downstairs. She pointed to a small cardboard box on my kitchen table. And that was leaning against the door. I have a third floor apartment with a bolt lock on both the front and back doors, and usually two guns stored inside somewhere. And none of this probably deters break-ins as much as the two front doors to the three-decker itself. There's an outside one and an interior one, and they're both reinforced with steel and made of heavy black German oak. The portal glass in the first one is wired with alarm tape, and my landlord has fitted both doors with a total of six locks that require three different keys. I have a set. Angie has a set. My landlord's wife, who lives in the first-floor apartment because she can't stand his company, has one. And Stannis, my crazy landlord, terrified that a Bolshevik hit squad is going to come for him, has two sets. All in all, my building is so secure, I was surprised someone could even tape an envelope to the front door or lean a box against it without setting off nine or ten alarms and waking five city blocks. The envelope was plain white letter size, with Patrick Kenzie typed in the center. No address, no stamp, no return address. I opened it and pulled a piece of typing paper from inside, unfolded it. There were no address headings, no date, no salutation, no signature. In the middle of the page, centered, someone had typed one word. Hi. The rest of the page was virgin. I handed it to Angie. She looked at it, turned it over, turned it back to the front. Hi, she read aloud. Hi, I said. No, she said, more like, hi. Give it that girlish giggle. I tried it. Not bad. Hi. Could it be Grace? She poured another cup of coffee. I shook my head. She says hi in an entirely different way, believe me. So who? I honestly didn't know. It was such an innocuous note, but weird, too. Whoever wrote it is a master of brevity, or has an extremely limited vocabulary. I tossed the note on the table, pulled back the tape on the box, and opened it as Angie looked over my shoulder. What the hell? She said. The box was filled with bumper stickers. I pulled out a handful and there was still another two handfuls waiting. Angie reached in, grabbed a fistful. This is odd, I said. Angie's brow was furrowed, and she had a curious half-smile on her face. You could say that, yeah. We took them into the living room and laid them out on the floor in a collage of blacks and yellows and reds and blues and shiny iridescence. Looking down at all 96 of them, was like standing over a world of petulance and hollow sentiment and the hopelessly inept search for the perfect soundbite. Hugs, not drugs. I'm pro-choice and I vote. Love your mother. It's a child, not a choice. I just fucking love traffic. If you don't like my driving, dial 1-800-EAT-SHIT. Arms are for hugging. If I'm a road hog, your wife's a pig. Vote for Ted Kennedy and put a blonde in the water. You can have my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. I'll forgive Jane Fonda when the Jews forgive Hitler. If you're against abortion, don't have one. Peace, an idea whose time has come. Die, yuppie scum. My karma beats your dogma. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. Politicians like their peasants unarmed. Forget numb, never. Think globally, act locally. Honk if you're rich and handsome. Hate is not a family value. I'm spending my child's inheritance. We are out and we are everywhere. Shit happens. Just say no. My wife ran off with my best friend, and I'm sure going to miss him. Divers do it deep. I'd rather be fishing. Don't like the police? Next time you're in trouble, call a liberal. 
Fuck you. Fuck me. My child is an honor student at St. Catherine's Elementary. My child beat up your honor student. Have a nice day, asshole. Free Tibet, free Mandela, free Haiti, feed Somalia. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And 57 more. Standing there looking at all of them, trying to comprehend the enormous gulf of difference in the myriad of messages, my head began to throb. It was like looking at a schizophrenic's CAT scan while all the poor bastards' personalities got into a shouting match. Screwy, Angie said. There's a word, sure. Can you see anything any of these have in common? Besides that they're all bumper stickers? I think that goes without saying, Patrick. I shook my head. But no, I'm at a loss. Me too. I'll think about it in the shower, I said. Good idea, she said. You smell like a wet bar rag. With my eyes closed in the shower, I saw Kara standing on the sidewalk as the stale beer stench flowed from the bar behind her, looking out at the traffic on Dorchester Avenue saying it all looked just the fucking same. Be careful, she'd said. I stepped back out of the shower and dried off, saw her pale exposed body crucified, nailed to a dirt hill. Angie was right, it wasn't my fault. You can't save people, particularly when a person isn't even asking to be saved. We bounce and collide and smash our way through our lives, and for the most part, we're on our own. I owed Kara nothing. But nobody should die like that, a voice whispered. In the kitchen, I called Richie Colgan, an old friend and columnist for the Trib. As usual, he was busy, his voice distant and rushed, the words all running together. Good to hear from you, Pat. What's up? Busy? Oh, yeah. Could you check something for me? Shoot, shoot. Crucifixions as a method of murder. How many in this city? In? In. How far back? Say 25 years. Library. Huh? Library. Heard of it? Yeah. I look like one? Usually when I get info from a library, I don't buy the library in a case of Michelob afterward. Heineken. Of course. I'm on it. Talk to you soon. He hung up. When I came back into the living room... The high note was lying on the coffee table. The bumper stickers were stacked in two neat piles underneath it, and Angie was watching TV. I changed into jeans and a cotton shirt and entered the living room toweling my hair dry. What you watching? CNN, she said, looking at the newspaper on her lap. Anything exciting going on in our world today? She shrugged. An earthquake in India killed over 9,000 people. And a guy in California shot up the office where he works, killed seven with a machine gun. Post office, I said. Accounting firm. That's what happens when CPAs get a hold of automatic weapons, I said. Apparently. Any other happy news I should hear? At some point they broke in to tell us Liz Taylor's getting divorced again. Oh, joy, I said. So, she said. What's our plan? Go sit on Jason again, maybe drop by Eric Galt's office, see if he can tell us anything. And we continued to work under the assumption that neither Jack Rouse or Kevin sent the photo. Yep. Which leaves how many suspects? She stood. How many people live in this city? I don't know. City proper, 600,000, give or take? greater metro area, four million or so. Then somewhere between 600,000 and four million suspects it is, I said. Less two, give or take. Thanks for narrowing it down, Skid. You're swell. Chapter 11 The second and third floors of McIrwin Hall housed the offices of Bryce's sociology, psychology, and criminology faculty, including Eric Galtz. The first floor contained classrooms, and one of those classrooms contained Jason Warren at the moment. 
According to Bryce's course catalog, the class he took here, Hell, as a sociological construct, explored the social and political motives behind the masculine creation of a land of punishment from the Sumerians and Akkadians up to, and including, the Christian right in America. We'd run checks on all of Jason's teachers and found that Ingrid Uver Kett had recently been expelled from a local now chapter for espousing views that made Andrea Dworkins look mainstream. Her class ran three and a half hours without a break and met twice a week. Ms. Uverkett drove down from Portland, Maine on Mondays and Thursdays to teach it and spent the rest of her time, as far as we could see, writing hate mail to Rush Limbaugh. Angie and I decided Ms. Uverkett seemed to spend far too much time being a threat to herself to possibly threaten Jason and eliminated her as a suspect. McGurwin Hall was a white Georgian set off in a grove of birch and violently red maples with a cobblestone walk leading up to it. We'd watched Jason disappear in a crowd of students pouring through the front doors. We heard tramping and catcalls and then a sudden, almost total silence. We had breakfast and came back to see Eric. By then, only a forlorn and forgotten pen at the foot of the stairs gave any indication that a single soul had been through the doors this morning. The foyer smelled of ammonia and pine solvent and 200 years of intellectual perspiration, of knowledge sought and knowledge gained and grand ideas conceived under the moat-rich glow of the fractured sunlight streaming through a stained glass window. There was a reception desk to our right, but no receptionist. At Bryce, I guess, you were already supposed to know your every destination. And she took off her denim shirt, yanked at the hem of her untucked T-shirt to clear it of static cling. The atmosphere alone makes me want to get a degree here. Probably shouldn't have flunked high school geometry. The next thing I said was, oof. We climbed a curved mahogany staircase, the walls laden with paintings of past Bryce presidents. Dour-looking men all. Faces weighted and strained from carrying so much genius in their brains. Eric's office was at the end of the hall, and we knocked once and heard a muffled come in from the other side of the pebbled glass. Eric's long salt-and-pepper ponytail fell over the right shoulder of his blue and maroon cardigan. Underneath the cardigan was a denim Oxford and a hand-painted navy blue tie with a plaintive baby seal staring out at us. I cocked an eyebrow at the tie as I took a seat. Sue me, Eric said, for being a slave to fashion. He leaned back in his chair and waved a hand at his open window. Some weather, isn't it? Some weather, I agreed. He sighed and rubbed his eyes. So how's Jason doing? He lives a very busy existence, Angie said. He used to be an insular kid, believe it or not, Eric said. Very sweet, never a moment's trouble to Deandra, but introverted since day one. Not anymore, I said. Eric nodded. Ever since he came here, he's broken out. It's common, of course, for kids who didn't fit in with the jock or beautiful people cliques in high school to find themselves in college. Stretch a bit. Jason does a lot of stretching, I said. He seems lonely, Angie said. Eric nodded. I could see that. The father leaving when he was so young explained some things, but still, always there's been this distance. I wish I could explain it. You see him with his, he smiled, harem, I guess, when he doesn't know you're watching, and it's like he's a completely different person from the shy kid I've always known. What does Deandra think about it? I said. She doesn't notice it. He's very close to her, so when he talks to anyone with any degree of depth, he talks to her. But he doesn't bring women home. He doesn't even hint at his lifestyle here. She knows he's holding a piece of himself back, but she tells herself he's just very good at keeping his own counsel, and she respects that. But you don't think so, Angie said. He shrugged and looked out the window a moment. When I was his age... I was living in the same dorm on this campus. 
and I'd been a pretty introverted kid myself. And here, like Jason, I came out of my shell. I mean, it's college. It's study, drink, smoke weed, have sex with strangers, take naps in the afternoon. It's what you do if you come to a place like this at 18. You had sex with strangers? I said. I'm shocked. And I feel so bad about it now. I do. But okay, I was no saint either. But with Jason, this radical change and his charge into almost Dasadian excess is a bit drastic. Dasadian, I said. You intellectuals, I swear, talk so damn cool. So why the change? What's he trying to prove? Angie said, I don't know exactly. Eric cocked his head in such a way that, not for the first time, he reminded me of a cobra. Jason's a good kid. Personally, I can't imagine him being mixed up in anything that would harm either himself or his mother. But then I've known the boy all his life, and he's the last person I would have ever predicted would succumb to a Don Juan complex. You've dismissed the mafia connection? Pretty much, I said. He pursed his lips, exhaled slowly. You got me, then. I know what I just told you about Jason, and that's about it. I'd like to say who he is or isn't with total certainty, but I've been at this long enough to realize that no one truly knows anyone else. He waved his hand at bookshelves crammed with criminology and psychology texts. If my years of study have taught me anything, that's the sum total. Deep. I said. He loosened his tie. You asked my opinion of Jason and I gave it to you, prefaced by my belief that all humans have secret selves and secret lives. What are yours, Eric? He winked. Wouldn't you like to know? As we walked into the sunlight, Angie slipped an arm through mine and we sat on the lawn under a tree and faced the doors through which Jason would exit in a few minutes. It's an old trick of ours to play lovers when we're tailing someone. People who'd possibly see either one of us as incongruous in a given place rarely give us a second glance as a couple. Lovers, for some reason, can often pass easily through doors the solitary person finds barred. She looked up at the fan of leaves and limbs in the tree above. Humid air stirred yellow leaves against brittle pikes of grass, and Angie leaned her head into my shoulder and left it there for a long time. You okay? I said. Her hand tightened against my bicep. Ange, I signed the papers yesterday. The papers? The divorce papers. She said softly. They've been sitting in my apartment for over two months. I signed them and dropped them at my attorney's office. Just like that. She moved her head slightly, resettled it, in the space between my shoulder and neck. As I signed my name, I had the distinct feeling it was going to make everything much cleaner somehow. Her voice had grown thick. Was that how it was for you? I considered how I'd felt sitting in an attorney's climate-controlled office, bundling and bagging up my short, barren, ill-conceived marriage by signing on a dotted line and folding pages neatly three times before sliding them into an envelope. No matter how therapeutic, there's something pitiless about wrapping up the past and tying a ribbon to it. My marriage to Renee had lasted less than two years, and it had been over, in most respects, in under two months. Angie had been married to Phil over twelve years, I had no conception what it was like walking away from twelve years, no matter how bad many of them had been. Did it make everything cleaner and clearer? She said. No, I said, pulling her tight. Not at all. Chapter 12 For another week, Angie and I tailed Jason around campus and town, up to classroom and bedroom doors, put him to bed at night, and rose with him in the morning. It wasn't exactly a thrill a minute either. Sure, Jason led a pretty lively existence, but once he got the gist of it, 
Wake, eat, class, sex, study, eat, drink, sex, sleep. It got old pretty quick. I'm sure if I'd been hired to tell Desaad himself in his prime, I'd have tired of that too. By the third or fourth time he drank from a baby's skull. Or arranged an all-night fivesome. Angie had been right. There was something lonely and sad about Jason and his partners. They bobbed through their existence like plastic ducks on hot water, tipping over occasionally, waiting as long as it took for someone to right them, and then back to more of the same bobbing. There were no fights, but no real passion either. There was only a sense of them, the whole group, as flippantly self-aware, marginally ironic, as detached from the lives they led as a retina would be from an eye which no longer controlled it. And there was no one stalking him. We were positive. Ten days and we'd seen no one. And we'd been looking. Then, on the 11th, Jason broke his routine. I'd had no information on Kara Ryder's murder because Devin and Oscar wouldn't return my calls, and from newspaper accounts I could tell the case had reached an impasse. Following Jason kept my mind off it initially, but by now I was so bored, I had no choice but to brood. And the brooding got me nowhere. Kara was dead. I couldn't have stopped it. Her murderer was unknown and free. Richie Colgan hadn't gotten back to me yet, though he'd left a message saying he was working on it. If I'd had the time, I could have looked into it. But instead, I had to watch Jason and his band of studiously feckless groupies bleed the brilliance out of a magnificent Indian summer by spending most of their time in cramped, smoky rooms dressed in black or nothing at all. He's moving, Angie said, and we left the alley we'd been in and followed Jason through Brookline Village. He browsed at a bookstore, bought a box of 3.5-inch diskettes at Egghead Software, then strolled into the Coolidge Corner Theater. Something new, Angie said. For ten days, Jason had never varied substantially from his routine. Now he was going into a movie theater. Alone. I looked up at the marquee, knowing I might have to follow him in and hoping it wasn't a Bergman film, or worse, Fassbinder. The Coolidge Corner leans toward esoteric art films and revivals, which is wonderful in this age of cookie-cutter Hollywood product. However, the price for this is that you do get those weeks when the Coolidge runs nothing but kitchen sink dramas from Finland or Croatia or some other frigid, doom-laden country, where all the pale, emaciated inhabitants seem to do is sit around talking about Kierkegaard or Nietzsche or how miserable they are instead of talking about moving someplace with more light and a more optimistic class of people. Today, though, they were showing a restored print of Coppola's Apocalypse Now. As much as I like the movie, Angie hates it. She says it makes her feel like she's watching it from underneath a swamp after taking too many quaaludes. She stayed outside and I went in. One of the benefits of having a partner at a time like this is that following someone into a movie theater, particularly if it's only half-filled, is risky. If the target decides to leave halfway through the film, it's hard to follow without being conspicuous. But a partner can pick him right up outside. The theater was almost empty. Jason took a seat near the front in the center, and I sat ten rows back to the left, a couple sat a few rows up on my right, and another lone person, a young woman with squinting eyes and a red bandana tied around her head, took notes. A film student. About the time that Robert Duval was holding a barbecue on the beach, a man came in and sat in the row behind Jason, about five seats to his left. As Wagner boomed on the soundtrack and gunship shredded the early morning village with gunfire and explosives, the light from the screen bathed the face of the man, and I could see his profile. Smooth cheeks interrupted by a trim goatee, close-cropped dark hair, a stud glinting from his earlobe. 
During the Dulong Long Bridge sequence, as Martin Sheen and Sam Bottoms crawled through a besieged trench looking for the battalion leader, the man moved four seats to his left. Hey, soldier, Sheen yelled over the mortar fire at a young, scared black kid as flares lit up the sky. Who's in command here? Ain't you, the kid screamed. And the guy with the goatee leaned forward and Jason's head tilted back. Whatever he said to Jason was brief. And by the time Martin Sheen left the trench and returned to the boat, the guy was stepping out into the aisle and walking back toward me. He was roughly my height and build, maybe 30, and very good looking. He wore a dark sport coat over a loose green tank top, battered jeans, and cowboy boots. When he caught me staring, he blinked and looked down at his feet as they carried him out of the theater. On screen, Albert Hall asked Sheen, you find the CO? There's no fucking CO, Sheen said, and climbed into the boat as Jason left his seat and walked up the aisle. I waited a full three minutes, then left my seat as the PT boat floated inexorably toward Kurtz's compound and Brando's lunatic improvisations. I stuck my head in the bathroom to be sure it was empty, then left the theater. Out on Harvard, I blinked into the sudden glare, then looked both ways for Angie, Jason, or the guy with the goatee. Nothing. I walked up to Beacon, but they weren't there either. Angie and I long ago agreed that the one separated from the chase was the one who went home without the car. So I hummed, oh sole mio, until I flagged down a cab and rode it back to the neighborhood. Jason and the guy with the goatee had met for lunch at the Sunset Grill on Brighton Avenue. Angie photographed them from across the street, and in one shot, the hands of both men had disappeared under the table. My initial assumption was a drug deal. They split the tab and back out on Brighton Avenue, their hands grazed against each other, and they both smiled shyly. The smile on Jason's face wasn't one I'd seen in the previous ten days. His usual smile was something of a cocky smirk, a lazy grin rife with confidence. But this smile was unaffected, with a hint of a gush to it, as if he'd had no time to consider it before it broke across his cheeks. Angie caught the smile and hand grazing on film, and my assumption changed. The guy with the goatee walked up Brighton toward Union Square while Jason walked back to Bryce. Angie and I spread her photos on her kitchen table that night and tried to decide what to tell DeAndre Warren. This was one of those points when my responsibility to my client was a bit unclear. I had no reason to think Jason's apparent bisexuality had anything to do with the threatening calls DeAndre had received, and I had no reason, on the other hand, not to tell her about the encounter. Still, I didn't know if Jason was out of the closet or not, and I wasn't comfortable outing him, particularly when, in that one photograph, I was looking at a kid who, in all the time I'd observed him, looked purely happy for the one and only time. Okay, Angie said. I think I have a solution. She handed me a photograph of Jason and the guy with the goatee in which both were eating, neither really looking at the other, but instead concentrating on their food. He met him, Angie said. Had lunch, that's all. We show this to Deandra, along with ones of Jason and his women, ask if she knows this guy. But unless she offers, we don't bring up the possibility of a romance. Sounds like a plan. No, Deandra said. I've never seen this man before. Who is he? I shook my head. I don't know. Eric? Eric looked at the photo for a long time, eventually shook his head. No. He handed it back to me. No, he said again. Angie said, Dr. Warren, in over a week, this is all we've come up with. Jason's social circle is pretty limited, and until this day, exclusively female. She nodded, then tapped the head of Jason's friend with her finger. Are they lovers? 
I looked at Angie. She looked at me. Come now, Mr. Kenzie, you don't think I know about Jason's sexuality? He's my son. So he's open about it, I said. Hardly. He's never spoken to me about it, but I've known. I think since he was a child. And I've let him know that I have absolutely no problem with homosexuality or bisexuality or any possible permutation thereof without mentioning the possibility of his own. But I still think he's either embarrassed or confused by his sexuality. She tapped the photo again. Is this man a threat? We don't have any reason to think so. She lit a cigarette, leaned back on her couch, and watched me. So where does that leave us? You've received no more threats or photos in the mail? No. Then I don't see that we're doing much more than wasting your money, Dr. Warren. She looked at Eric and he shrugged. She turned back toward us. Jason and I are going up to a house we have in New Hampshire for the weekend. When we come back, would you resume watching Jason for just a few more days? Put a mother's mind at rest. Sure. Friday morning, Angie called to say Deandra had picked up Jason and left for New Hampshire. I'd watched them all through Thursday evening and nothing had happened. No threats, no suspicious characters looking outside his dorm, no liaison with the guy with the goatee. We'd worked our asses off trying to identify the guy with the goatee. But it was as if he'd come from mist, and to mist he'd returned. He wasn't a student or teacher at Bryce. He didn't work at any of the establishments in a mile radius of campus. We'd even had a cop friend of Angie's run his face through a computer for a felon match and come up empty. Since he'd met Jason in the open and their meeting had been more than cordial, there was no reason to consider him a threat. So we decided to keep our eyes open until he pops back up again. Maybe he was from out of state. Maybe he was a mirage. So we got the weekend off, Angie said. What are you going to do? Spend as much of it as possible with Grace. You're whipped. I am. How about yourself? I'll never tell. Be good. No, she said. Be safe. Okay. I cleaned my house, and it was short work because I'm rarely there long enough to mess it up. When I came across the high note and bumper stickers again, I felt a warm prickle begin to nod under the skin at the base of my brain. But I shrugged it off, tossed everything in a cabinet of my entertainment center. I called Richie Colgan again, got his voicemail, left a message, and then there was nothing left to do but shower and shave and go meet Grace at her place. Oh, happy day. As I went down the stairs, I could hear two people breathing heavily in the foyer. I turned the last corner, and there was Stannis and Leva, squaring off around one million or so. Stannis was wearing about a half gallon of oatmeal for a hat. And his wife's blousy house coat was covered with ketchup and scrambled eggs so fresh they steamed. They stared at each other, the veins in his neck protruding, her left eyelid twitching madly as she needed an orange in her right hand. I knew better than to ask. I tiptoed past and opened the first door, closed it behind me as I entered the small hallway, and stepped on a white envelope on the floor. The black rubber strip underneath the front door clamped so tightly over the threshold. You'd have an easier time squeezing a hippo through a clarinet than you would sliding a piece of paper under the front door. I looked at the envelope. No scuff marks or wrinkles. The words Patrick Kenzie were typed in the center. I opened the door into the foyer again, and Stannis and Leva were still frozen as I'd left them, food on their bodies steaming. Leva's hand wrapped around the orange. Stannis, I said. Did you open the door to anyone this morning? In the last half hour or so? He shook his head and some oatmeal fell to the floor. But he never took his eyes off his wife. Open door to who? Stranger? You think I'm crazy? He pointed at Leva. She crazy. I show you crazy, she said 
and hit him in the head with the orange. He screamed arg or something similar, and I backed out quickly and shut the door. I stood in the hallway, envelope in my hands, and I felt a greasy swelling of dread in my stomach, though I couldn't articulate why completely. Why? A voice whispered. This envelope, the high note, the bumper stickers, none of which are threatening, the voice whispered, at least not overtly, just words and paper. I opened the door, stepped out onto the porch. In the schoolyard across from me, recess was in full swing, and the nuns were chasing children around by the hopscotch area. And I saw a boy pull the hair of a girl who reminded me of May, the way she stood with her head cocked slightly to one side, as if listening for the air to tell her a secret. When the boy pulled her hair, she screamed and slapped at the back of her head, as if she were being attacked by bats. And the boy ran off into a crowd of other boys, and the girl stopped shrieking and looked around, confused and alone. And I wanted to cross the avenue and find the little prick and pull his hair, make him feel confused and alone, even if I'd probably done the same thing myself a hundred times when I was his age. I guess my impulse had something to do with growing older, with looking back and seeing very few innocent violences committed against the young in knowing that every tiny pain scars and chips away at what is pure and infinitely breakable in a child. Or maybe I was just in a bad mood. I looked down at the envelope in my hand and something told me I wasn't going to be too keen on what I read if I opened it. But I did. And after I read it, I looked back at my front door and its imposing heavy wood and portal glass fringed by alarm tape and three brass bolt locks gleaming in the late morning sunlight. And it seemed to mock me. The note read, Patrick, don't forget to lock up. Chapter 13 Careful, May, Grace said. We were crossing the Mass Ave Bridge from the Cambridge side. Below us the Charles was the color of caramel in the dying light, and the Harvard crew team made chugging noises as they slid along, their oars slicing as clean as cutlasses through the water. May stood up on the six-inch shoulder that separated the sidewalk from traffic, the fingers of her right hand resting loosely in mine as she tried to keep her balance. Smoots, she said again, her lips smacking around the word as if it were chocolate. How come smoots, Patrick? That's how they measured the bridge, I said. They turned Oliver Smoot over and over again across the bridge. Didn't they like him? She looked down at the next yellow Smoot marker, her face darkening. Yeah, they liked him. Everyone was just playing. A game? She looked up into my face and smiled. I nodded. That's how they got the Smoot measurements. Smoots, she said and giggled. Smoots? Smoots. A truck rumbled past, shaking the bridge under our feet. Time to come down, honey, Gray said. I now. She hopped off beside me. Smoots. She said to me with a crazy grin, as if it were our private joke now. In 1958, some MIT seniors laid Oliver Smoot end to end across the Mass Ave Bridge and declared the bridge to be 364 smoots long, plus an ear. Somehow, the measurement became a treasure to be shared by Boston and Cambridge. And whenever the bridge is touched up, the smoot markings are freshly painted. We walked off the bridge and headed east along the river path. It was early evening and the air was the color of scotch, and the trees had a burnished glow the smoky dark gold of the sky contrasting starkly with the explosion of cherry reds, lime greens, and bright yellows in the canopies of leaves stretched above us. So run this by me again, Grace said, wrapping her arm in mine. Your client met a woman who claimed she was the girlfriend of a mob guy. But she wasn't. And he has nothing to do with any of this as far as we can tell. And the woman vanished and we can't find any record of her having existed in the first place. 
The kid, Jason, doesn't seem to have any skeletons in his closet outside of maybe bisexuality, which doesn't bother the mother. We've tracked the kid for a week and a half and come up with nothing but some guy in a goatee who might be having an affair with the kid, but who vanished into the air. And this girl you knew, the one who was killed. I shrugged. Nothing. All her known acquaintances have been cleared, even the scumbag she hung out with. And Devin isn't taking my calls. It's sort of fuck Patrick, Gray said. I looked down, saw May. Whoops, I said. It's sort of messed up. Much better. Scotty, May said. Scotty. Just ahead, a middle-aged couple sat on the lawn by the jogging path. A black Scottish terrier lying beside the man's knee as he petted it absently. Can I? May asked Grace. Ask the man first. May walked off the path onto the grass with a slight hesitancy, as if approaching a strange, uncharted frontier. The man and woman smiled at her, then looked at us and we waved. Is your dog friendly? The man nodded. Too friendly. May held out a hand about nine inches from the head of the Scotty, who still hadn't noticed her. He won't bite? He never bites, the woman said. What's your name? May. The dog looked up and May jerked her arm back. But the dog merely rose slowly on its hind legs and sniffed. May, the woman said. This is Indy. Indy sniffed May's leg and she looked back over her shoulder at us, uncertain. He wants to be petted, I said. In increments, she lowered her body and touched his head. He turned his snout into her palm, and she lowered herself even more. The closer she got to him, the more I wanted to ask the couple if they were sure their dog didn't bite. It was an odd feeling. On the danger scale, Scottish terriers fall somewhere in between guppies and sunflowers. But that wasn't much comfort as I watched May's tiny body inch closer and closer to something with teeth. When Indy jumped on May, I almost dove at them. But Grace put a hand on my arm, and May shrieked, and she and the dog rolled around on the grass like old pals. Grace sighed. That was a clean dress she was wearing. We sat down on a bench and watched for a while as May and Indy chased each other and stumbled into each other and tackled each other and got up and did it again. You have a beautiful daughter, the woman said. Thank you. Gray said. May came dashing past the bench, hands up at her head, shrieking as Indy nipped at her heels. They went about another twenty yards and then went down on a tiny explosion of grass and dirt. How long have you been married? The woman asked. Before I could answer, Grace dug her fingers into my thigh. Five years, she said. You seem like newlyweds, the woman said. So do you. The man laughed and his wife poked him with an elbow. We feel like newlyweds, Gray said. Don't we, honey? We put May to bed around eight, and she dropped off quickly, her fuel supply exhausted by our long walk around the river and her game of tag with Indy. When we came back into the living room, Grace immediately began picking things up off the floor coloring books, toys, tabloid magazines, and horror paperbacks. The tabloids and books weren't Grace's. They were Annabeth's. Grace's father died when she was in college, and he left both girls a modest fortune. Grace depleted hers pretty quickly by paying what wasn't covered by her scholarship during her final two years at Yale, then supporting herself, her then-husband Brian, and May, before Brian left her, and Tufts Medical accepted her on fellowship, and she burned through most of what remained on living expenses. Annabeth, four years younger, did a year of community college and then blew through the bulk of her inheritance during a year in Europe. She kept photographs of the trip taped to her headboard in vanity, and every one of them was taken in a bar. How to drink your way through Europe on 40 grand. She was great with May, though, 
made sure she was in bed on time, made sure she ate right and brushed her teeth, and never crossed the street without holding her hand. She took her to children's school shows and to the children's museum and to playgrounds and did all the things that Grace didn't have time for while working 90-hour weeks. We finished cleaning up after May and Annabeth and then curled up on the couch and tried to find something worth watching on TV and failed. Springsteen was right. 57 channels and nothing on. So we shut it off and sat facing each other, legs crossed at the knees, and she told me about her past three days in ER. How they kept coming. The bodies stacking up on gurneys like cordwood in a winter cabin. And the noise level reaching the pitch of a heavy metal concert. And an old woman who'd been knocked over in a purse snatching and banged her head against the sidewalk, holding Grace's wrists as silent tears leaked from both eyes. And she died just like that. Of fourteen-year-old gang members with babies' faces and blood sluicing off their chests like wet paint as doctors tried to plug the leaks. And a baby brought in with a left arm twisted completely backwards at the shoulder joint and broken in three places around the elbow, his parents claiming he'd fallen. Of a crack addict screaming and fighting the orderlies because she needed her next fix and didn't give a shit if the doctors wanted to remove the knife from her eye first. And you think my job's violent? I said. She placed her forehead against mine. One more year and I'm in cardiology. One more year. She leaned back, took my hands in hers, rested them on her lap. That girl who got killed in the park, she said, isn't connected to this other case, is she? What gave you that idea? Nothing. I was just wondering. No. No just happens we took the Warren case around the same time Kara was murdered. Why'd you think that? She ran her hands up my arms. Because you're tense, Patrick. Tenser than I've ever seen you. How so? Oh, you're acting real well. But I can feel it in your body. See it in the way you stand. Like you're expecting to get hit by a truck. She kissed me. Something's got you wigged out. I thought of the last eleven days. I sat at a dinner table with three psychotics. Four, if you counted Pine. Then I saw a woman crucified to a hill. Then someone sent me a package of bumper stickers and a high. Then I found the don't forget to lock up note. People were shooting up abortion clinics and subway cars and blowing up embassies. Homes were sliding off the sides of hills in California and falling through the earth in India. Maybe I had reason to be wigged out. I slid my arms around her waist and pulled her up on top of me, leaned back on the couch and slid my hands up under her sweater, ran my palms along the edges of her breasts. She bit down on her lower lip and her eyes widened slightly. You said something to me the other morning, I said. I said a lot of things to you the other morning, she said. I said, oh God, a few times, if I remember right. That wasn't it. Oh, she said, clapping her hands against my chest. The I love you phrase. Is that what you mean, detective? Yes, ma'am. She unbuttoned my shirt down to my navel and ran her hands over my chest. Well, what of it? I... Love. You. Why? Why? She said. I nodded. That's the silliest question you've ever asked. Don't you feel worthy of love, Patrick? Maybe not. I said, as she touched the scar on my abdomen. She met my eyes, and hers were kind and warm. Like benedictions. She leaned forward and my hands came out of her sweater as she slid down my body until her head was at my lap. She tore open the rest of my shirt and laid her face on the scar. She traced it with her tongue, then kissed it. I love the scar, she said, resting her chin on it and looking up into my face. I love it because it's a mark of evil. That's what your father was, Patrick, evil. And he tried to pour it into you. But he failed. 
because you're kind and gentle and you're so good with May, and she loves you so much. She drummed the scar with her fingernails. So you see, your father lost because you are good. And if he didn't love you, that's his fucking problem, not yours. He was an asshole. And you are worthy of love. She rose on all fours above me. All of mine and all of May's. I couldn't speak for a minute. I looked into Grace's face and I saw the flaws. I saw what she would look like when she was old. How in 15 or 20 years, many men would never be able to see what an aesthetic wonder her face and body had been. And it was just as well, because it didn't mean shit in the long haul. I have said I love you to my ex-wife Renee and heard her say it, and we both knew it was a lie. A desperate want, perhaps, but far removed from a reality. I loved my partner, and I loved my sister, and I loved my mother, though I never really knew her. But I don't think I ever felt anything like this. When I tried to speak, my voice was shaky and hoarse, and the words were strangled in my throat. My eyes felt wet and my heart felt as if it were bleeding. When I was a boy, I loved my father and he just kept hurting me. He wouldn't stop. No matter how much I wept, no matter how much I pleaded, no matter how hard I tried to figure out what he wanted, what I could do to be worthy of his love, instead of victim of his rage, I love you, I'd tell him, and he'd laugh and laugh, and then he'd beat me some more. I love you, I said once as he rammed my head into a door, and he spun me around and spit in my face. I hate you, I told him very calmly, not long before he died. He laughed at that one, too. Score one for the old man. I love you, I told Grace now, and she laughed. But it was a beautiful laugh, one of surprise and relief and release, one that was followed by two tears that dropped off her cheekbones and landed in my eyes and mingled with mine. Oh, my God, she groaned, lowering herself to my body, her lips grazing my own. I love you too, Patrick. Chapter 14 Grace and I weren't quite at the point yet where one stayed over at the other's house long enough for May to find us in bed together. That moment was coming soon, but it wasn't one either of us was going to approach lightly. May knew I was her mother's special friend, but she didn't have to know what special friends do together until we were sure this special friend would be around for a long time. I had too many friends growing up who had no fathers, but an amazing supply of uncles parading through their mother's beds. And I'd seen how it had fucked them up. So I left shortly after midnight. As I was fitting my key into the downstairs lock, I heard my phone ringing distantly. By the time I made it up the stairs, Richie Colgan was talking to my answering machine. The name of Jamal Cooper in September of 73 was... I'm here, Rich. Patrick! You're alive, and your answering machine's working again. It was never broken. Well, it must not like taking messages from the black man, then. You haven't been getting through? I've called you half a dozen times in the last week, got nothing but ring, ring, ring. Try my office? Same thing. I picked up my answering machine, looked underneath. I wasn't looking for anything particular, it just seemed like what one did. I checked the jacks and portals and back. Nope, everything was hooked up properly. And I had received other messages all week. I don't know what to tell you, Rich. It seems to be working fine. Maybe you misdialed. Whatever. I got the info you need. By the way, how's Grace? Richie and his wife, Sherry Lynn, had played matchmaker between Grace and me last summer. It had been Sherry Lynn's theory for the past decade that all I needed to straighten out my life was a strong woman who'd kick my ass on a regular basis and take none of my shit. Nine times she'd been wrong. But the tenth, so far, seemed to be working out. 
Tell Sherry I'm smitten. He laughed. She's gonna love that. Love it. <laughs> I knew your ass was done the first time you looked at Grace. Cooked and smoked and marinated and hung up in strips. Mmm, I said. Good, he said to himself and clucked. All right, you want your info? Pen and paper at the ready. Case of Heine's better be at the ready too, Slim. Goes without saying. In 25 years, Richie said, there's been one crucifixion in this city. Kid name of Jamal Cooper. Black male, 21, found crucified to the floorboards in the basement of a flop house in Old Scully Square in September of 73. Quick bio of Cooper. He was a junkie, heroin, rap sheet the length of a football field, mostly small-time shit, petty burglary, solicitation, but a couple of home invasions, too. Bought him two years at the old Dedham House of Corrections. Still, Cooper wasn't nothing but a nickel and dimer. If he hadn't been crucified, nobody would have noticed he died. Even then, cops didn't seem to be busting their asses on the case at first. Who was the investigating officer? Two guys, and Inspector Brett Hardiman, and let me see. Yeah, uh, Detective Sergeant Gerald Glynn. That stopped me. They make an arrest? Well, here's where it gets interesting. I had to dig a bit, but there was a local stir in the papers for a day when they brought a guy named Alec Hardiman in for questioning. Well, wait a minute. Didn't you just, yep. Alec Hardiman was the son of the chief investigating officer, Brett Hardiman. What happened? The younger Hardiman was cleared. Cover up? It doesn't look that way. There really wasn't much evidence against him. He'd known Jamal Cooper casually, I guess, but that was that. But... What? Several phones rang at once on Richie's end, and he said, Hold on. No, Rich, no, I... He put me on hold, the bastard. I waited. When he came back on the line, his voice had changed back to his city desk rush. Patrick, I gotta go. No. Yes, look. This Alec Hardiman was convicted for another murder in 75. He's doing life in Walpole. That's all I got. Gotta run. He hung up and I looked down at the names on my notepad. Jamal Cooper, Brett Hardiman, Alec Hardiman, Gerald Glenn. I thought about calling Angie, but it was late, and she'd been beat from watching Jason do nothing all week. I stared at the phone for a bit, then took my jacket and left the apartment. I didn't need the jacket. Past one in the morning, and the humidity lathered my skin until the pores felt sticky and fetid and sickly soft. October? Right. Jerry Glynn was washing glasses at the bar sink when I entered the Black Emerald. The place was empty. The three TV screens on, but the volume muted. The Pogues' version of Dirty Old Town coming out of the jukebox at whisper volume. Stools up on the bar, floor swept, amber ashtrays clean as boiled bones. Jerry was looking into the sink. Sorry, he said without looking up. Closed. On top of the pool table near the back, Patton raised his head and looked at me. I couldn't see his face very distinctly through the cigarette smoke that still hovered there like a cloud. But I knew what he'd say if he could speak. Didn't you hear the man? We're closed. Hi, Jerry. Patrick, he said, confused but with enthusiasm. What brings you by? He wiped his palms and offered me his hand. I shook it and he pumped mine hard, looking me dead in the eyes a habit of the older generation that reminded me of my father. I needed to ask you a question or two, Jer, if you got the time. He cocked his head and his usually kind eyes lost their softness. Then they cleared and he hoisted his bulk onto the cooler behind him and spread his hands, palms up. Sure, you need a beer or something? Don't want to put you out, Jer. I settled into the bar stool across from him. He opened the door of the cooler next to him. His thick arm dug down inside and ice rattled. No problem. Can't promise what I'll come up with. I smiled. Long as it isn't a bush. 
He laughed. Nope. It's, uh... His arm came out washed in ice water. Dimples of cold jellied white against the flesh under his forearm. Light. I smiled as he handed it to me. Like sex in a sailboat, I said. He laughed loudly and sputtered the punchline. It's fucking too close to water. I love that one. He reached behind himself and, without looking, pulled a bottle of Stolich Naya from the shelf. He poured some into a tall shot glass, put the bottle back, then raised the glass. Cheers. Cheers, I said and drank some light. Tasted like water, but it was still better than bush. Of course, a cup of diesel is usually better than bush. So what's your question? Jerry said. He patted his ample gut. Jealous of my physique? I smiled. A bit. I drank some more light. Jerry, what can you tell me about someone named Alec Hardiman? He held his shot glass up to the fluorescent light and the clear liquid disappeared in a shimmer of white. He stared at it and rotated the glass in his fingers. Now... He said quietly, eyes still on the glass. Where would you come up with that name, Patrick? It was mentioned to me. You've been looking for matches to the M.O. of Cararitis Killer. He brought the glass down and looked across at me. He didn't seem angry or irritated, and his voice was flat and monotonous. But there was a stillness to his squat body that hadn't been there a minute before. Per your suggestion, Jer. On the jukebox behind me, the Pogues had at some point given way to the water boys' don't bang the drum. The TV screens above Jerry's head were tuned to three different channels. One broadcast Australian rules football, one what looked like an old Kojak episode, and the third showed old glory wavering in the breeze as it signed off for the night. Jerry hadn't moved, hadn't so much as blinked, since he'd brought the shot glass back down by his side and I could just make out the sound of his breathing, shallow and thin as he exhaled through his nostrils. He didn't study me so much as stare through me, as if what he was seeing was on the other side of my head. He reached back for the bottle of Stoli, poured himself another shot. So Alec comes back to haunt us all again, he chuckled. Ah, well, I should have known. Patton jumped down from the pool table and padded into the main bar area. Gave me a look like I was sitting in his seat. Then hopped up on the bar top in front of me and lay down. His paws over his eyes. He wants you to pet him, Jerry said. No, he doesn't. I watched Patton's ribcage rise and fall. He likes you, Patrick. Go ahead. I felt like May for a moment as I reached out a tentative hand toward that gorgeous coat of black and amber. I felt coiled muscle hard as a pool ball under the coat. And then Patton raised his head and mewed and flicked his tongue over my free hand. Nuzzled it gratefully with a chilly nose. Just a big softy, huh? I said. Unfortunately, Jerry said. Don't let the secret get around, though. Jerry, I said, as Patton's rich coat undulated and curled around my hand. This Alec Hardiman could have killed Kara Ryder? He shook his head. No, no, that would be pretty hard to do, even for Alec. Alec Hardiman's been in prison since 1975, and he won't be getting out during my lifetime. Probably not during yours, either. I finished my light... And Jerry, ever the bartender, had his hand in the ice before I set it down on the bar. This time he came up with a harpoon IPA, spun it in his meaty palm and popped the cap off in the opener, mounted on the cooler wall. I took it from him and some foam spilled down the side onto my hand, and Patton licked it up. Jerry leaned his head back against the edge of the shelf above it. Did you know a kid named of Cal Morrison? Not real well. I said, swallowing against a shudder that threatened to rise every time I heard Cal Morrison's name. He was a few years older than me. 
Jerry nodded. But you know what happened to him. He was stabbed to death in the Blake yard. Jerry stared at me for a moment, and then he sighed. How old were you at the time? Nine or ten? He reached for another shot glass, poured a finger of Stoli in it, and set it on the bar in front of me. Drink. I was reminded of Bubba's vodka and its ragged chewing on my spinal column. Unlike my father and his brothers, I must have missed some crucial Kenzie gene, because I could never drink hard liquor for shit. I gave Jerry a weak smile. Das Vidanya. He raised his and we drank, and I blinked away tears. Cal Morrison, he said, wasn't stabbed to death, Patrick. He sighed again, and it was a low melancholy sound. Cal Morrison was crucified. Chapter 15 Cal Morrison wasn't crucified, I said. No, Jerry said. You saw the body, did you? No. He sipped from the shot glass. I did. I caught the squeal. Me and Brett Hardiman. Alec Hardiman's father. He nodded. My partner. He leaned forward and poured some vodka into my shot glass. Brett died in 80. I looked at my shot glass, nudged it six inches away from me as Jerry refilled his own. Jerry caught me at it, smiled. You're not like your father, Patrick. Thanks for the compliment. He chuckled softly. You look like him, though. A dead ringer. You must know that. I shrugged. He turned his wrists upward, looked down at them for a moment. Blood's a strange thing. How's that? It's passed into a woman's womb. Creates a life. Could be near identical to the parent who created it. Could be so different the father starts suspecting the mailman delivered more than the male. You got your father's blood. I got my father's. Alec Hardiman had his father's in him. And his father was a good man. He nodded more to himself than to me and took a sip from his glass. A fine, fine man, actually. Moral, decent, so, so, so smart. If no one told you, you'd have never guessed he was a cop. You'd have taken him for a minister or a banker. He dressed impeccably, spoke impeccably, did everything impeccably. He had a simple white colonial house in Melrose and a sweet, kind wife and a beautiful blonde son, and you'd swear you could eat lunch off the seat of his car. I sipped my beer as the second TV gave way to Old Glory, followed by a blue screen, and noticed that it was now the chieftain's Coast of Malabar on the jukebox. So he's this perfect guy with this perfect life, perfect wife, perfect car, perfect house, perfect son. He peered at his thumbnail. Then he looked at me and his soft eyes were slightly unhinged as if they'd stared too long at the sun and were just regaining a sense of the shapes and colors before them. Then I, like, I don't know, something went in him. It just went. No psychiatrist could ever explain it. One day he was this normal, regular kid, and the next, he held up his hands. The next, I don't know. And he killed Cal Morrison? We don't know that, he said and his voice was thick. He couldn't look at me for some reason. His face had grown ruddy and the veins in his neck stuck out like cables and he looked at the floor and kicked his heel into the wall of the cooler. We don't know that, he said again. Jerry, I said, let me in here. Last I knew, Cal Morrison was stabbed in the Blakey by some drifter. Black guy, he said the soft grin again playing on his lips. That was the rumor at the time, wasn't it? I nodded. Can't find someone to blame, blame a jig, right? I shrugged. That was the story back then. Well, he wasn't stabbed. That was just what we told the media. 
He was crucified, and it wasn't a black guy did it. We found red hair and blonde hair and brown hair in Cal Morrison's clothing, but no black. And Alec Hardiman and a friend of his, Charles Rugglestone, had been seen in the neighborhood earlier that night. And we were already on edge about the other killings, so until we busted someone, we didn't mind the black guy's story circulating for a while. He shrugged. Not like too many black guys were going to stumble into this neighborhood back then, so it seemed a safe cover for a while. Jerry, I said, what are the killings? The bar door opened, the heavy wood banging against the brick exterior, and we both looked at a man with spiky hair and a nose ring and a torn T-shirt hanging untucked over fashionably eviscerated jeans. Closed, Jerry said. Just a waste spot to water my stomach on a lonely night, the guy said in a horrendously fake brogue. Jerry came off the cooler and walked around the bar. You even know where you are, son? Underneath my hand, Patton's muscles tightened, and he raised his head, stared at the kid. The kid took a step forward. Just a wee spot of whiskey, he giggled into his hand, blinked into the light, and his face was swollen with booze and God knows what else. Kenmore Square is that way, Jerry said and pointed back out the door. Don't want Kenmore Square, the guy said. He swayed slightly from side to side as he fumbled in his waistband for his cigarettes. Son, Jerry said, it's time for you to be moving on. Jerry put his arm on the guy's shoulder, and for a moment the guy looked ready to shrug it off. But then he looked at me, and then Patton, and then down at Jerry. Jerry's demeanor was kind and warm. And he was four inches shorter, but even this guy, drunk as he was, sensed how quickly that kindness could disappear if he pushed it. Just wanted a drink, he mumbled. I know, Jerry said, but I can't give you one. You got cab fare? Where you live? I just wanted a drink, the guy repeated. He looked up at me and tears leaked down his cheeks and the damp cigarette hung flaccid between his lips. I just... Where you live? Jerry asked again. Huh, Lower Mills? The guy sniffled. You can walk around Lower Mills dressed like that without getting your ass kicked. Jerry smiled. Place must have changed a lot in ten years. Lower Mills? The guy sobbed. Son, Jerry said. Shh, it's okay, it's all right. You go out this door, you take a right. There's a cab half a block up. Cabby's name is Achal, and he's there till three on the dot. You tell him to take you to Lower Mills. I don't got no money. Jerry patted the kid's hip, and when he pulled his hand away, there was a $10 bill in the kid's waistband. Looks like you got a sawbuck you forgot about. The kid looked down at his waistband. Mine? It ain't mine. Now go get in that cab, okay? Okay. The kid sniffled as Jerry let him back out the door. And then suddenly he spun and hugged as much of Jerry as he could get his arms around. Jerry chuckled. Okay. Okay. I love you, man. The kid said. I love you. A cab pulled to the curb outside and Jerry nodded at the driver as he disentangled himself. Go on now, go on. Patton lowered his head and rolled into a fetal position on the bar, closed his eyes. I scratched his nose and he nipped my hand gently. Seemed to smile sleepily at me. I love you! The kid bellowed as he stumbled out. I'm moved, Jerry said. He shut the door to the bar and we heard the taxi's axles clack as it pulled a U-turn on the avenue to head down to Lower Mills. Deeply moved. Jerry locked the door and raised his eyebrows at me. Ran a hand through the rusty stubble on his head. Still officer friendly. 
I said. He shrugged, then frowned. Did I do that at your school? The office of friendly lecture? I nodded. Second grade at St. Bart's. He took his bottle and shot glass over to a table by the jukebox, and I joined him. Left my shot glass on the bar, seven feet away from me, where it belonged. Patton remained on the bar, eyes closed, dreaming of large cats. He leaned back in his chair and arched his back, stretched his arms behind his head and yawned loudly. You know something? I remember that now. Oh, please, I said. That was over 20 years ago. Hmm? He brought the chair legs back to the floor, poured himself another drink. By my count, he'd had six shots, and there was absolutely no noticeable effect. That class was something, though, he said, tilting the glass toward me in toast. There was you and Angela and that shitbird she married. What was his name? Phil DeMassey. Phil! Yeah, he shook his head. Then there was that head case, Kevin Hurley, and that other nut job, Rogowski. Bubba's okay. I know you guys are friends, Patrick, but give me a break. He's a suspect in maybe seven unsolved homicides. Real nice guys, I'm sure the victims. He shrugged. Killing is killing. You take a life without cause, you should be punished. All there is to it. I sipped my beer, glanced at the jukebox. You don't agree, he said. I held out my hands, leaned back in my chair. I used to. Sometimes, though, I mean, come on, Jerry. Kara Ryder's life was worth more than the life of the guy who killed her. Beautiful, he said and gave me a dark smile. Utilitarian logic at its best, and the cornerstone of most fascist ideologies, if you don't mind me mentioning. He downed another shot, watching me with clear, steady eyes. If you presuppose that a victim's life is worth more than a murderer's, and then you yourself go and kill that murderer, doesn't that then make your own life less worthy than the murderer you killed? What? I said. You're a Jesuit now, Jerry? Going to wrap me up in syllogisms? Answer the question, Patrick. Don't be glib. Even when I'd been a kid, there'd always been something oddly ethereal about Jerry. He didn't exist on the same plane as the rest of us. You sense that some part of him swam in the spiritual murk that the priests told us existed just above the realm of our everyday consciousness the place from which dreams and art and faith and divine inspiration were sprung. I went behind the bar for another beer, and he watched me with those calm, kind eyes. I dug around the cooler, found another harpoon, and came back to the table. We could sit here and debate it all night, Jerry, and maybe in an ideal world it wouldn't be true, but in this one, yeah, some lives are worth a lot more than others. I shrugged at his cocked eyebrow. Might make me a fascist, but I'd say Mother Teresa's life is worth more than Michael Milken's. I'd say Martin Luther King's was worth a lot more than Hitler's. Interesting. His voice was almost a whisper. So if you are able to judge the worth of another human life, you are yourself, by inference, superior to that life. Not necessarily. Are you better than Hitler? Absolutely. Stalin? Yes. Pol Pot? Yes. Me? You? He nodded. You're not a killer, Jerry. He shrugged. Is that how you judge? You're better than someone who kills or orders others to kill? If those killings are done to victims who pose no real physical threat to the killer or the person who orders the killing, then yes, I am better than them. So you're superior to Alexander, Caesar, several U.S. presidents, a few popes? I laughed. He'd set me up, and I'd felt it coming. But I hadn't seen where it would come from. Like I said, Jerry, I think you're half-Jesuit. 
he smiled and rubbed his bristled scalp. I'll admit they taught me well. His eyes narrowed and he leaned into the table. I just hate this idea that some people have more of a right to take a life than others. It's an inherently corrupt concept. You kill, you should be punished. Like Alec Hardiman? He blinked. You're part pit bull, aren't you, Patrick? What my clients pay me for, Jer. I reached across and refilled his shot glass for him. Tell me about Alec Hardiman and Cal Morrison and Jamal Cooper. Maybe Alec killed Cal Morrison and Cooper too, I don't know for sure. Whoever killed those boys was making some kind of statement, that's for sure. Crucified Morrison below the Edward Everett statue, shoved an ice pick through his larynx so he couldn't scream, cut off pieces of him that were never found. What pieces? Jerry's fingers drummed the tabletop for a moment, his lips pursed as he decided how much to tell me. His testicles? A kneecap? Both big toes? It fit with some other victims we knew about. Other victims besides Cooper? Not long before Cal Morrison was killed, Jerry said. A few winos and hookers from the zone downtown to as far away as the Springfield bus depot were murdered. Six in all, starting with Jamal Cooper. The murder weapons varied. The victim profiles varied. The methods of execution varied. But Brett and I believed it was all the work of the same two killers. Two, I said. He nodded. Working in tandem. Conceivably, it could have been one guy. But he would have had to be astonishingly strong, ambidextrous, quick as lightning. If the murder weapons and M.O. and victim selection were so varied, why'd you think it was the same killer's? There was a level of cruelty to the kills like I'd never seen before. Never seen since, either. Not only do these guys enjoy their work, Patrick, but they, or he, were also thinking of the people who found the bodies, how they'd react. They cut a wino into 164 pieces. Think about it. 164 pieces of flesh and bone some no bigger than a fingertip, left on the bureau top and along the headboard, spaced out on the floor, hanging from hooks along the shower rod in this little flophouse room down in the zone. Place ain't even there no more, but I can't drive by the space it used to occupy without thinking about that room. A 16-year-old runaway in Worcester, he snapped a neck, and then twisted her head around 180 degrees, wrapped it in duct tape, so it would stare that way for the first person through the door. It was beyond anything I've ever come up against, and no one can tell me that those six victims, all still officially unsolved cases, weren't killed by the same one or more people. And Cal Morrison? He nodded. Number seven and Charles Rugglestone possibly would be number eight. Wait, I said. The Rugglestone who was friends with this Alec Hardiman? You bet. He raised his glass, put it back down, stared at it. Charles Rugglestone was murdered in a warehouse not far from here. He was stabbed with an ice pick 32 times, bludgeoned with a hammer so hard that the holes in his skull looked like small animals had been living in his brain and decided to eat their way out. He was also burned, piece by piece, from his ankles to his neck, most of it while he was still breathing. We found Alec Hardiman passed out in the dispatch office with Rugglestone's blood all over him and the ice pick a few feet away, his prints all over it. So he did it. Jerry shrugged. Every year, because his father asked me to, I visit Alec at Walpole. And maybe, I don't know, because I like him. I still see the little kid in him. Whatever. But as much as I like him, he's a cipher. Is he capable of murder? Yeah. I don't doubt that for a second. 
But I can also tell you that no single man, no matter how strong, and Alec wasn't all that strong, could have done what was done to Rugglestone. He pursed his lips and downed the shot. But as soon as Alec went to trial, the killings I'd been investigating dried up. His father, of course, retired not long after the arrest. But I kept looking into the Morrison murder and the six that came before it. And I cleared Alec of involvement in at least two of those. But he was convicted. For Rugglestone's murder only. Nobody wanted to admit that they'd suspected a serial killer was out there and didn't notify the general public. Nobody wanted more egg on their faces after the son of a decorated cop was arrested for a brutal murder. So Alec went to trial for Rugglestone's murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison, and he's up at Walpole, rotting away. His father went to Florida, probably died trying to figure out where it all went so wrong. And none of this would matter, I suppose, except that Someone crucified Kara Ryder on a hill, and someone else gave you my name and the name Alec Hardiman. So, I said, if there actually was more than one killer, and Alec Hardiman was one of them, then the other one's still out there, yeah. Dark pockets had formed under his eyes and hollowed them out. And if he's still out there after almost twenty-something years and he's been holding his breath all this time for some sort of comeback. I'd say he's probably pretty pissed off. Chapter 16 It was snowing on a bright summer day when Kara Ryder stopped me to ask how the Jason Warren case was going. She'd changed her hair back to its original blonde, and she was sitting in a lawn chair outside the Black Emerald, wearing only a pink bikini bottom, and the snow fell to either side of her and piled up by the chair. But only sun fell on her skin. Her small breasts were hard and beaded with perspiration, and I had to keep reminding myself that I'd known her since she was a little kid, and I shouldn't be noticing them in a sexual context. Grace and May were half a block up, Grace placing a black rose in May's hair. Across the avenue, a pack of white dogs, small and gnarled like fists, watched them and drooled, thick streams pouring from the sides of their mouths. I gotta go, I said to Kara. But when I looked back, Grace and May were gone. Sit, Kara said. Just for a sec. So I sat and the snow fell down the back of my collar and chilled my spine. My teeth chattered as I said, I thought you were dead. No, she said. I just went away for a while. Where'd you go? Brookline? Shit. What? This place looks just the fucking same. Grace stuck her head out of the black emerald. You ready, Patrick? Gotta go, I said and patted Kara's shoulder. She took my hand and laid it against her bare breast. I looked at Grace, but she didn't seem to mind. Angie stood beside her and they both smiled. Kara stroked her nipple with my palm. Don't forget about me. Snow was pouring on her body now, burying it. I won't. I gotta go. Bye. The legs of her lawn chair collapsed under the weight of the snow. And when I looked back, I could just make out her form under drifts of soft white. May came out of the bar and took my hand and fed it to her dog. I watched my blood foam in the dog's mouth. And it didn't hurt. It was almost sweet. See? May said. He likes you, Patrick. The last week of October, we bailed out of the Jason Warren case by mutual agreement with Deandra and Eric. I know guys who would have milked it, played up to the fears of a worried mother, but I don't milk cases. Not because I'm particularly moral, but because it's bad business when half your living comes from repeat clients. We had files on all of Jason's teachers since he'd come to Bryce, 11, and all his known acquaintances, Jade, Gabrielle, Lauren, and his roommate, except the guy with the goatee. 
and nothing about any of them suggested they were a threat to Jason. We had write-ups of our daily observation work, as well as synopses of our meeting with Fat Freddy, Jack Rouse, and Kevin Hurleyhee, and my own telephone discussion with Stan Timpson. Deandra had received no more threats, phone calls, or pictures in the mail. She'd spoken with Jason in New Hampshire, mentioned that a friend of hers had seen him with a guy in the Sunset Grill the previous week, and Jason had described him as just a friend and offered no more information. We spent another week tailing him, and it was more of the same explosions of sexual activity, solitude, studying. Deandra agreed that we were all getting nowhere, that there was nothing outside of her having received that photograph to suggest Jason was in any danger whatsoever. And we finally came to the conclusion that maybe our original perception that Deandra had inadvertently angered Kevin Hurley had been correct after all. Once we'd met with Fat Freddy, every hint of threat had disappeared. Maybe Freddy, Kevin, Jack, and the whole mob had decided to back off, but hadn't wished to lose face to a couple of P.I.s. Whatever the situation, it was over now, and Deandra paid us for our time and thanked us, and we left our cards and home numbers in case anything sprang back up and went back to our lives during our business's dullest season. A few days later, at his behest, we met Devon in the Black Emerald at two o'clock in the afternoon. There was a closed sign in the doorway, but we knocked and Devon opened the door, locked it behind us after we came in. Jerry Glynn was behind the bar, sitting on the cooler, not looking very happy, and Oscar sat by a plate of food at the bar, and Devon took a seat beside him and bit into the bloodiest cheeseburger this side of an open flame. I took the seat beside Devon and Angie took the one beside Oscar and stole one of his fries. I looked at Devon's cheeseburger. They just leaned the cow against the radiator? He growled and stuffed some more in his mouth. Devon, do you know what red meat does to your heart? Never mind your bowels. He wiped his mouth with a cocktail napkin. You turned to one of those holistic health PC douchebags while I wasn't looking, Kenzie? Nope. But I saw one picketing out front. He reached for his hip. Here, take my gun and shoot the prick. See if you can pop a mime while you're at it. I'll see it gets ridden upright. A throat cleared behind me, and I looked into the bar mirror. A man sat in a shadowed booth just over my right shoulder. He wore a dark suit and dark tie, a crisp white shirt and a matching scarf. His dark hair was the color of polished mahogany. He sat stiffly in the booth, as if his spine had been replaced with pipe. Devin jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Patrick Kenzie, Angela Gennaro, meet FBI Special Agent Barton Bolton. I turned on my bar stool and Angie turned on hers and we both said, Hi. Special Agent Barton Bolton said nothing. He looked each of us up and down like a concentration camp commandant trying to decide if we were best fit for work or extermination, then shifted his gaze to a point somewhere over Oscar's shoulder. We have a problem, Oscar said. Could be a small problem, Devin said. Could be a big one. And it is, Angie said. Let's all sit together. Oscar pushed his plate away. Devin did the same, and we all joined Special Agent Barton Bolton in the booth. What about Jerry? I said, watching him clear the plates off the bar. Mr. Glynn's already been questioned. Bolton said. Ah. Patrick. Devin said. Your card was found in Kara Ryder's hand. I told you how it got there. And when we were working on the presumption that Mickey Doog or one of his puke friends had killed her because she wouldn't blow him or whatever, it wasn't a problem. Your presumption has changed, Angie said. Afraid so. Devin lit a cigarette. You quit, I said. Unsuccessfully, he shrugged. Agent Bolton removed the photograph from his briefcase, handed it to me. It was of a young man, mid-thirties, built like a Grecian statue. He wore only shorts 
and was smiling at the camera, and his upper torso was all hard cuts and coiled muscle, biceps the size of baseballs. Do you know this man? I said no, and handed the photo to Angie. She looked at it for a moment. No. You're sure? Angie said, I'd remember that body, trust me. Who is he? Peter Stimovich, Oscar said. Actually, his full name is the late Peter Stimovich. He was killed last night. Did he have my business card, too? Not as far as we know. Then why am I here? Devin looked across the bar at Jerry. What did you and Jerry talk about when you came in here a few days ago? Asked Jerry. We did. Wait, I said. How do you know I came in here a few days ago? You've been under surveillance, Bolton said. Excuse me? Devin shrugged. This is bigger than you, Patrick. A lot bigger. How long? I said. How long what? Have I been watched? I looked at Bolton. Since Alec Hardiman refused a request to speak with him, Devin said. So? When he refused our request, Oscar said, he did it by saying you're the only one he'll talk to. Me? You, Patrick? Only you. Chapter 17 Why does Alec Hardiman want to talk to me? Good question, Bolton said. He waved at the smoke coming from Devin's cigarette. Mr. Kenzie, everything said from this point on is absolutely confidential, understood? Angie and I gave Bolton our best shrugs. Just so we're clear, if you repeat anything we speak of today, you'll be charged with federal obstruction charges carrying a maximum penalty of ten years. You enjoy saying that, don't you? Angie said. What's that? She deepened her voice. Federal obstruction charges. He sighed. Mr. Kenzie, when Kara Ryder was murdered, she had your card in her hand. Her crucifixion, as you probably know, bore remarkable similarities to the crucifixion of a boy in this neighborhood in 1974. Sergeant Ann Ronklin, you might not know, was a patrolman back then who worked with former Detective Sergeant Glynn and Inspector Hardiman. I looked at Devin. Did you think Kara's murder might have been connected to Cows the night we saw her body? I considered the possibility. But you didn't say anything to me. Nope. He stubbed out a cigarette. You're a private citizen, Patrick. It's not my job to let you in. Besides, I thought it was a hell of a long shot just something I kept in the back of my mind. The phone of the bar rang and Jerry picked it up, his eyes on us. Black Emerald. He nodded as if he'd expected the caller's question. Sorry, no, we're all closed up here. Plumbing problem. He closed his eyes for a moment, nodded hurriedly. You're so desperate for a drink, try another bar. You better get going. He looked about to hang up. what I tell you? Closed. I'm sorry to. He hung up, gave us a shrug. This other victim, I said. Stimovich. Right. Was he crucified? No, Bolton said. How'd he die? Bolton looked at Devin, and Devin looked at Oscar, and Oscar said, Who gives a shit? Tell them. We need all the help we can get before we have more bodies on our hands. Bolton said, Mr. Stimovich was tied to a wall, his skin removed in strips, and then he was disemboweled while he was still alive. Jesus, Angie said and blessed herself so quickly I'm not even sure she was aware she did it. Jerry's phone rang again. Bolton frowned. Can you yank that out of the hook for a little while, Mr. Glenn? Jerry looked pained. Agent Bolton, with all due respect to the dead, I'll keep my place closed as long as you feel you need it. But I got regulars wondering why my door's closed. 
Bolton waved dismissively and Jerry answered the phone. After a few seconds of listening, he nodded. Bob, Bob, listen, we have a plumbing situation. I'm sorry, but I got three inches of water on the floor and... He listened. So do what I'm telling you. Go to Leary's or the Fermanagh. Go somewhere, okay? He hung up, gave us another shrug. I said, how do you know Kara wasn't killed by someone she knew? Mickey Doog? Or a gang initiation right? Oscar shook his head. It doesn't play that way. All her known acquaintances have alibis, including Mickey Doog. Plus, there's a whole lot of her time unaccounted for while she was back in the city. She wasn't hanging around the neighborhood much, Devin said. Her mother had no idea where she went. But she was back in town only three weeks, and it wasn't like she could have made that many acquaintances over in Brookline. Brookline, I said, remembering my dream. Brookline, that's the only place we know she went several times. Credit card receipts from Cityside, a couple of restaurants around Bryce University. Jesus, I said. What? Nothing. Nothing. Look, how do you know these cases are connected if the Vicks were killed in different ways? Photographs, Bolton said. A block of dry ice melted in my chest. What photographs? Angie said. Devin said, Kara's mother had a stack of mail she hadn't opened in a few days before Kara died. One of them was an envelope, no return address, no note, just a photograph of Kara inside. Innocent photo. Nothing. Angie said, Jerry, can I use your phone? What's the matter? Bolton said. She was already at the bar dialing. And the other guy, Stimovich? I said. No one at his dorm room. Angie said and hung up, dialed another number. What's up, Patrick? Devin said. Tell me about Stimovich. I said, trying to keep the panic from my voice. Devin, now. Stimovich's girlfriend, Alice Borston. No one at DeAndre's office. Angie said and slammed the phone down, picked it up, began dialing again. Received a similar photo of him in the mail two weeks ago. Same thing. No note or return address, just a photo. DeAndre? Angie said into the phone. Where's Jason? Patrick? Oscar said, tell us. I have his class schedule, Angie said. He only has one class today and it was over five hours ago. Our client received a similar photograph weeks ago, I said, of her son. We'll be in touch. Stay there. Don't worry. Angie hung up the phone. Fuck, 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 she said. Let's go. I stood up. You're not going anywhere, Bolton said. Arrest me, I said, and followed Angie out the door. Chapter 18 We found Jade, Gabrielle, and Lauren dining together in the student union, but no Jason. The women gave us who-the-fuck-are-you looks, but answered our questions. None of them had seen Jason since this morning. We stopped by his dorm room, but he hadn't been by since the previous night. His roommate stood in a haze of pot fumes, with Henry Rollins's pissed-off wail booming through his speakers and said, Nah, man, I got like no idea where he'd be, except with that dude, you know? We don't know. That dude, you know, that like dude he hangs out with sometimes? This dude got a goatee? Angie said. The roommate nodded. And like the most hollow eyes, like he ain't walking among the living. Be a babe if he was a chick, though. Weird, huh? Dude got a name? None I ever heard. As we walked back to the car, I could hear Grace asking me a few nights ago, are these cases connected in any way? Well, now, yeah, they were. So what did that mean? Deandra Warren receives a photograph of her son 
and makes the reasonable logical leap that it's connected to the mafia hood she inadvertently angered. Except, she didn't inadvertently anger him. She was contacted by an imposter, and they met in Brookline. An imposter with a harsh Boston accent and wispy blonde hair. Kara Ryder's hair, when I saw it, looked freshly dyed. Kara Ryder used to have blonde hair, and her credit card receipts put her in Brookline around the same time Moira Kenzie had contacted Deandra. Deandra Warren had no TV in her apartment. If she read a newspaper, she read the trib, not the news. The news had plastered Kara's photograph across page one. The trib, far less sensationalistic and actually late on the story, hadn't published a photograph of Kara at all. As we reached the car, Eric Galt pulled behind it in a tan Audi. He looked at us with mild surprise as he got out. What brings you kids by? Looking for Jason. He opened his trunk, began picking up books from a pile of old newspapers. I thought you'd given up on the case. There have been some new developments, I said and smiled with confidence I didn't feel. I looked at the newspapers in Eric's trunk. You saved them? He shook his head. I tossed them in here, take them to a recycling station when I can't close the trunk anymore. I'm looking for one about ten days old, may I? He stepped back. Be my guest? I pulled back the top news on the pile, found the one with Kara's photo four down. Thanks, I said. My pleasure. He shut the trunk. If you're looking for Jason, try Coolidge Corner or the bars on Brighton Avenue, the Cows, Harper's Ferry, their big Bryce hangouts. Thanks. Angie pointed at the books under his arm. Overdue at the library? He shook his head, looked at the stately white and red brick dorm buildings. Overtime. In this recession, even us tenured profs have to stoop to tutoring now and again. We climbed into our car, said goodbye. Eric waved, then turned his back to us and walked up to the dorms, whistling softly in the gradually cooling air. We tried every bar in Brighton Ave, North Harvard, and a few in Union Square. No Jason. On the drive to DeAndre's place, Angie said, Why'd you grab that newspaper? I told her. Christ, she said. This is a nightmare. Yeah, it is. We rode the elevator up to DeAndre's as the waterfront rose then fell away from us into an overturned bowl of black ink harbor. The apprehension that had been sitting tightly in my stomach for the last few hours expanded and eddied until I felt nauseous. When DeAndre let us in, the first thing I said was, This Moira Kenzie, did she have a nervous habit of tucking her hair behind her right ear, even if there was nothing to tuck? She stared at me. Did she? Yes, but how did you think? Did she make this weird sort of laughing, sort of hiccuping sound at the ends of her sentences? She closed her eyes for a moment. Yes, yes, she did. I held up the news. Is this her? Yes. Son of a bitch, I said loudly. Moira Kenzie was Kara Ryder. I paged Devon from Deandra's. Dark hair, I told him. Twenty, tall, good build, cleft in his chin, usually dresses in jeans and flannel shirts. I looked at Deandra. Do you have a fax here? Yes. Devin, I'm faxing you a photo. What's the number? He gave it to me. Patrick will have a hundred guys looking for this kid. You get two hundred, I'll feel better. The fax machine was at the east end of the loft by the desk. I fed it the photo Deandra had received of Jason, waited for the transmission report, walked back to Deandra and Angie in the living area. I told Deandra we were slightly concerned because we'd received conclusive proof that neither Jack Rouse nor Kevin Hurley could have been involved. I told her that because Kara Ryder had died shortly after impersonating Moira Kenzie, I wanted to reopen the case. 
I didn't tell her that everyone who'd received a photo had had loved ones murdered. But he's okay. She sat on the couch, tucked her legs under her, and searched our faces. As far as we know, Angie said. She shook her head. You're worried. That's obvious. And you're holding something back. Please tell me what, please. It's nothing, I said. I just don't like it that the girl who impersonated Moira Kenzie and got this whole thing rolling has turned up dead. She didn't believe me and she leaned forward, her elbows on her knees. Every night, no matter what, between 9 and 9.30, Jason calls. I looked at my watch, five past nine. Is he going to call Mr. Kenzie? I looked at Angie. She was peering intently at Deandra. Deandra closed her eyes for a moment. When she opened them, she said, do either of you have children? Angie shook her head. I thought of May for a moment. No, I said. I didn't think so. She walked to a window, her hands on the backs of her hips. As she stood there, lights from an apartment in the building next door went out one by one, and pools of darkness spread across her blonde floor. She said, You never stop worrying. Never. You remember the first time he climbed out of his crib and fell to the floor before you could reach him? And you thought he was dead. Just for a second. And you remember the horror of that thought? When he grows older and rides his bike and climbs trees and walks to school on his own and darts out in front of cars instead of waiting for the light to change, you pretend it's okay. You say, that's kids. I did the same thing at his age. But always in the back of your throat is this scream, barely suppressed. Don't. Stop. Please don't get hurt. She turned from the window and stared at us from the shadows. It never goes away. The worry, the fear. Not for a second. That's the price of bringing life into this world. I saw May reaching her hand down by the mouth of that dog. How I'd felt ready to jump, to tear the head off that Scottish terrier if need be. The phone rang. 9.15. All three of us jerked at once, and Deandra crossed the floor in four strides. Angie looked at me and rolled her eyes upward in relief. Deandra picked up the phone. Jason, she said. Jason? It wasn't Jason. That was immediately apparent when she ran her free hand up a longer temple and pressed it hard against the hairline. What? She said. She turned her head and looked at me. Hold on. She handed me the phone. Someone named Oscar. I took the phone from her and turned, so that my back was to her and Angie, as another set of lights went out in the building beside us and spread the darkness across the floor like liquid while Oscar told me that Jason Warren had been found in pieces. Chapter 19 In an abandoned trucking depot along the waterfront in South Boston, the killer had shot Jason Warren once in the stomach, stabbed him several times with an ice pick, and bludgeoned him with a hammer. He'd also amputated his limbs and placed them on windowsills, left his torso sitting in a chair facing the door, and tied his head to a dead power cable hanging from an elevated conveyor belt. A crew of forensics cops spent the night and most of the next morning in there and never found Jason's kneecaps. The first two cops on the scene were rookies. One quit the force within a week. The other, Devin told me, took a leave of absence to seek counseling. Devin also told me that when he and Oscar entered the truck depot, he'd first thought Jason had run afoul of a lion. When I hung up that night after receiving word from Oscar and turned to Deandra and Angie, Deandra already knew. She said, My son is dead, isn't he? And I nodded. She closed her eyes and held one hand up by her ear, as if motioning for a room to be quiet so she could hear something. 
She swayed slightly as if to a breeze, and Angie stepped up beside her. Don't touch me, she said, eyes still closed. By the time Eric arrived, Deandra was sitting on her window seat, staring out at the harbor. The coffee Angie'd made sitting cold and untouched beside her. In an hour, she hadn't spoken a single word. When Eric entered, she stared at him as he removed his raincoat and hat, placed them on a hook, looked at us. We stepped into the kitchen alcove, and I told him, Jesus, he said, and for a moment he looked as if he'd be sick. His face turned the color of paste, and he gripped the bar until his knuckles whitened. Murdered? How? I shook my head. Murdered is enough for now, I said. He rested both hands on the bar top, lowered his head. What's Deandra been like since she heard? Quiet. He nodded. That's her way. You contact Stan Timpson? I shook my head. I assume the police will. His eyes filled. That kid, that poor, beautiful kid. Tell me, I said. He stared past my shoulder at the fridge. Tell you what? Whatever you know about Jason. Whatever it is you've been hiding. Hiding? His voice was small. Hiding, I said. You haven't felt right in this since the beginning. Oh, what do you base? Call it a hunch, Eric. What were you doing at Bryce tonight? I told you tutoring. Bullshit. I saw the books you pulled out of the car. One of them was a Chilton car guide, Eric. Look, he said, I'm going to go to Deandra now. I know how she'll react, and I really think you and Ange should leave. She won't want you to have seen her when she cracks. I nodded. I'll be in touch. He adjusted his glasses, walked past me. I'll see you get full payment for whatever remains on the bill. We've already been paid, Eric. He crossed the loft to her, and I looked at Angie, cocked my head toward the door. She picked her purse up off the floor and her jacket off the couch as Eric placed a hand on DeAndre's shoulder. Eric, she said. Oh, Eric, why? Why? She fell off the window seat into his arms as Angie reached me. And as I opened the door, DeAndre Warren howled. It was one of the worst sounds I've ever heard. A raging, tortured, ravaged noise that blew from her chest and reverberated across the loft and clamored in my head long after I'd left the building. In the elevator, I said to Angie, Eric's wrong. Wrong about what? He's wrong, I said. He's dirty, or he's hiding something. What? I don't know. He's our friend, Ange, but I don't like the feeling I get from him on this. I'll look into it, she said. I nodded. I could still hear Deandra's awful howl in my head, and I wanted to curl up and cover myself against it. Angie leaned against the glass elevator wall and hugged herself tightly, and we didn't speak once on the ride home. One of the things being around children teaches you, I think is that no matter what the tragedy, you must keep moving. You have no choice. Long before Jason's death, before I'd even heard of him or his mother, I'd agreed to take May for a day and a half while Grace worked and Annabeth went to Maine to see an old friend from her year in college. When Grace heard about Jason, she said, I'll find someone else. I'll find a way to get the time off. No, I said, nothing changes. I want to take her. And I did. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. I know society tells us it's good to talk about tragedy, to discuss it with friends or qualified strangers, and maybe so. But I often think we talk way too much in this society. That we consider verbalization a panacea that it very often is not. And that we turn a blind eye to the sort of morbid self-absorption that becomes a predictable byproduct of it. I'm prone to brooding as it is, 
and I spend a lot of time by myself, which makes it worse, and maybe some good would have come if I discussed Jason's death and my own feelings of guilt about it with someone. But I didn't. Instead, I spent my time with May, and the simple act of keeping up with her and keeping her entertained and feeding her and putting her down for her nap and explaining the antics of the Marx Brothers to her as we watched Animal Crackers and Duck Soup, and then reading Dr. Seuss to her as she settled into the day bed I'd set up in the bedroom, the simple act of caring for another smaller human being was more therapeutic than a thousand counseling sessions and I found myself wondering if past generations had been right when they accepted that as common knowledge. Halfway through, Fox and Socks, her eyelids fluttered, and I tucked the sheet up under her chin and put the book aside. You love Mommy? She said. I love Mommy. Go to sleep. Mommy loves you, she mumbled. I know. Go to sleep. You love me? I kissed her cheek, tucked the blanket under her chin. I adore you, May. But she was asleep. Grace called around eleven. How is my tiny terror? Perfect and asleep. I hate this. She spends whole weeks being a perfect bitch around me, and she spends a day with you, and she's Pollyanna. Well, I said, I'm so much more fun to be around. She chuckled. Really, she's been good? Fine. You doing any better about Jason? Long as I don't think about it. Point taken. You okay about the other night? With us? I said. Yeah. Something happened the other night? She sighed. Such a dick. Hey. Yeah? I love you. I love you too. Nice, ain't it? I said. Nicest thing in the world, she said. The next morning, while May still slept, I walked out onto my porch and saw Kevin Hurley standing out front, leaning against the gold diamante he drove for Jack Rouse. Ever since my pen pal sent his don't forget to lock up note, I'd been carrying my gun wherever I went, even downstairs to pick up my mail especially downstairs to pick up my mail. So when I walked out to my porch and saw Psycho Kevin looking up at me from the sidewalk, I assured myself that at least my gun was only a reach away. And luckily, it was my 65 millimeter Beretta with a 15-shot clip, because with Kevin, I had a feeling I'd have to use every bullet I had. He stared at me for a long time, Eventually, I sat down on the top step, opened my three bills, and leafed through my latest issue of Spin. Read some of an article on Machinery Hall. You listen to Machinery Hall, Kev? I said eventually. Kevin stared and breathed through his nostrils. Good band, I said. You should pick up this CD. Kevin didn't look like he'd be dropping by Tower Records after our chat. Sure, they're a little derivative, but who isn't these days? Kevin didn't look like he knew what derivative meant. For ten minutes he stood there without saying a word, his eyes never leaving me, and they were dull, murky eyes, as lively as swamp water. I guessed this was the morning Kevin. The night Kevin was the one with the charged-up eyes, the ones that seemed to pulse with homicide. The morning Kevin looked catatonic. So Kev, I'm guessing here, but... I'd say you're not a big alternative music fan. Kevin lit a cigarette. I didn't used to be. But then my partner pretty much convinced me that there was more out there than the Stones and Springsteen. A lot of it is corporate bullshit, and a lot is overrated, don't get me wrong. I mean, explain, Morrissey. But then you get a Kurt Cobain or a Trent Reznor, and you say, these guys are the real deal. And it's all enough to give you hope. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. By the way, Kev, how did you feel about Kurt's death? Did you think we lost the voice of our generation? Or did that happen when Frankie Goes to Hollywood broke up? 
A sharp breeze creased the avenue, and his voice sounded like nothing, an ugly soulless nothing when he spoke. Kenzie, a guy skimmed over 40 lodge from Jackie a few years back. It speaks, I said. This guy is like two hours from taking a flight to Paraguay or some fucking place when I find him at his girlfriend's. He flicked his cigarette into the bushes fronting the three-decker. I made him lie face down on the floor, Kenzie. And then I jumped up and down on his back until his spine broke in half. Made the same sound the door makes when you kick it in. Exact same sound. There's that one big loud crack and all those little splintering noises at the same time. The sharp breeze rode up the avenue again and the crisp leaves in the gutters made a crackling sound. Anyway, Kevin said, the guy's screaming, his girlfriend's screaming, and they keep looking at the door to this shitty fucking apartment, not because they think they got a chance of getting to it, but because they know that door means they're locked in with me. I have the power. I decide what images they take to hell with them. He lit another cigarette, and I felt the breeze bore through the center of my chest. So, he said, I turn this guy over. I make him sit up on his broken spine, and I rape his girlfriend for, I don't know, a few hours. Had to keep throwing whiskey in the guy's face to keep him from passing out. Then I shot his girlfriend like eight, maybe nine times. I pour myself a drink and I look in the guy's eyes for a while. It's all gone. All his hope. All his pride. All his love. I own it. Me. I own it all. And he knows it. And I walk behind him. I put my gun against the back of his head right at the brainstem. And then you know what I do? I didn't say anything. I wait. I wait like five minutes. And guess what? Guess what the guy did, Kenzie? Guess! I folded my hands across my lap. He begs, Kenzie. Fucking guy's paralyzed. He just let another guy rape and kill his girl, and he couldn't do shit. He's got nothing to live for. Nothing. But he begs to stay alive anyway. This fucking crazy world, I swear. He flicked a cigarette into the steps below me, and the coals shattered and were picked up and swirled by the wind. I shot him in the brain, just as he started to pray. Usually when I looked at Kevin in the past, I'd seen nothing. A great hole of it. But now I realized it wasn't nothing, it was everything. Everything rancid in this world. It was swastikas and killing fields and labor camps and vermin and fire that rained from the sky. Kevin's nothing was simply an infinite capacity for all of that and more. Stay away from the Jason Warren thing, he said. That guy who ripped off Jackie, his girlfriend, they were friends of mine. You, he said, I don't ever remember liking. He stood there a full minute, his eyes never leaving mine. And I felt filth and depravity violate my blood and stain, stain, stain every inch of my body. He walked around to the driver's side of the car rested his hands on the hood. I hear you went out and got yourself a ready-made family, Kenzie. Some doctor cunt and her little girl cunt. This little girl, she's what, like four years old? I thought of May sleeping only three stories up. How strong you think a four-year-old spine is, Kenzie? Kevin, I said, and my voice felt thick and filled with phlegm. If you... He held up a hand and pantomimed a chatterbox, then looked down as he opened his door. 
Hey, fuckhead! I said, my voice loud and hoarse on the empty avenue. I'm talking to you! He looked at me. Kevin! I said, you go anywhere near that woman or her child, and I'll put enough bullets in your head to make it look like a fucking bowling ball! Words! He said, opening his door. Lot of words, Kenzie. See you around. I pulled the gun from against the small of my back and fired around through his passenger window. Kevin jumped back as the glass imploded onto his seat, then looked at me. A promise, Kevin. Take it to the fucking bank. For a moment, I thought he'd do something. Right there, right then. But he didn't. He said, You just bought a plot at Cedar Grove, Kenzie. You know that? I nodded. He looked in at the glass on the seat and fury suddenly exploded across his face. And he reached into his waistband and started around the car fast. I aimed the gun at the center of his forehead. And he stopped, hand still in his waistband. And then, very slowly, he smiled. He walked back to the driver's door, opened it, then rested his arms on the hood and looked at me. Here's what's going to happen. Enjoy your time with that girlfriend of yours. Fuck her twice a night if you can. And make sure you're extra special nice to the kid. Soon. Maybe later today, maybe next week. I'll come calling. First I'll kill you. Then I'll wait a while. Maybe I'll get something to eat, go to the track, have a few beers, whatever. And after that, I'm going to drop by your woman's place and kill her and her little girl. And then I'm going to go home, Kenzie, and laugh my ass off. He got in the car and drove away. And I stood in the porch my blood popping and boiling against the bone. Chapter 20 When I got back upstairs, the first thing I did was check in on May. She was curled on her side, hugging one of the pillows, her bangs covering her eyes, her cheeks slightly flushed with heat and sleep. I looked at my watch, 8.30, would ever sleep her mother lost working so much, this kid made up for. I shut the door, went into the kitchen, and fielded three phone calls from irate neighbors who wanted to know what the hell I was doing discharging a firearm at eight in the morning. I couldn't tell if it was the discharging of the firearm or the time of morning I chose to do it that pissed them off most. But I didn't bother asking. I apologized and, too, hung up in my ear while a third suggested I seek professional help. After I hung up for the third time, I called Bubba. What's up? You free to shadow some people for a couple of days? Who? Kevin Hurley and Grace. Sure. They don't seem like they're running the same circles, though. They don't. He may fuck with her to get to me. So I need to know where both of them are at all times. It's a two-man job. He yawned. I'll use Nelson. Nelson Ferrer was a guy from the neighborhood who worked with Bubba on his arms deals whenever he needed an extra trigger man or driver. He was a short guy, no more than 5'4", and I'd never heard him speak above a whisper or utter more than five words in a given day. Nelson was as shithouse crazy as Bubba, with a Napoleon complex to boot, but like Bubba, he could rein in his psychosis as long as he had something to occupy his time. Okay, and Bubba, if anything happens to me in the next week, let's say I meet with an accident, will you do something for me? Name it. Find a safe place for May and Grace. Okay. And then cancel Hurley's ticket. No problem. That it? That's it. Okie doke. See ya. Let's hope so. I hung up and saw, 
that the tremors that had been rippling through my wrists and hands since I'd shot out Kevin's window had stopped. I called Devin next. Agent Bolton wants to talk to you. I'm sure. He doesn't like you being associated with two out of four dead. Four? We think he killed another one last night. I can't get into it right now. You going to come by or is Bolton going to have to come for you? I'll be by. When? Soon. Kevin Hurley, he just paid me a house call and told me to back off the investigation, by the way. We've had him under surveillance for days. He ain't our killer. I didn't think he was. He lacks the imagination for what this guy's pulling. But he's involved somehow. It's curious, I'll admit. Look, get your ass over to FBI headquarters. Bolton's ready to send out a dragnet pulling you, Jerry Glenn, Jack Rouse, Fat Freddy, everyone else who was anywhere near any of the victims. Thanks for the tip. I hung up, and an explosion of country music rocked the apartment through my open kitchen screen. Of course, if you're hearing Waylon, it must be nine. I looked at my watch, nine on the dot. I stepped out of my back porch. Lyle was working on the house closest to mine, and he turned the radio down when he saw me. Hey, Patrick, how y'all doing, son? Lyle, I said. I got my girlfriend's daughter sleeping over. Could we maybe keep it down a bit? Sure thing, son, sure thing. Thanks, I said. We'll be cutting out pretty soon so you can turn it back up when we go. He shrugged. Only doing a third of a day here myself. Got me a bad tooth, kept me up half the night. Dentist, I said and winced. Yeah, he said morosely. Hate paying those bastards. But I tried pulling the tooth myself last night with some pliers, and the some bitch only come out like so far, and then it wouldn't budge. Plus them pliers got all slippery cause all of the blood. And well, good luck at the dentist, Lyle. Thanks, he said. I tell you, bastard ain't using no Novocaine on me neither. Or Lyle just about faints dead away, he sees a needle. I'm some kind of coward, huh? Sure, Lyle, I thought. A big frady cat. Go pull a few more of your teeth out with pliers. No one will be able to stop talking about what a wuss you are. I went back into the bedroom and May was gone. The comforter was crumpled by the foot of my bed and Miss Lily, her doll, lay on the top of the daybed, staring up at me with her dead doll eyes. Then I heard the toilet flush, and I stepped out into the hall as May stepped out of the bathroom rubbing her eyes. My heart jackhammered into my dust-dry mouth, and I wanted to drop to my knees under the weight of the relief that washed over my body. I'm hungry, Patrick, she said, and walked into the kitchen in her Mickey Mouse pajamas with padded feet. Apple jacks or sugar pops, I managed. Sugar pops. Sugar pops it is. While May was in the bathroom changing out of her pajamas and brushing her teeth, I called Angie. Hey, she said. How you doing? I'm okay. Still trying to convince myself there was nothing we could have done to keep Jason alive. A silence hung between us because I was trying to convince myself of the same. You find out anything about Eric? I said. A little, Five years ago, when Eric was still teaching part-time at UMass Boston, a city councilor from Jamaica Plain named Paul Hobson filed suit against the school and Eric. For what? I don't know. Everything pertaining to the case is sealed. Looks like an out-of-court settlement followed by gag orders all around. Eric left UMass, though. Anything else? So far, no, but I'm still digging. I told her about my encounter with Kevin. You shot out his car window, Patrick? Jesus! I was a tad perturbed. Yeah, but shooting out his car window? Angie, I said. He threatened May and Grace. He does anything that uncool next time I see him? Maybe I'll just forget the car and shoot him. 
there's going to be a reprisal, she said. I'm aware of that. I sighed, felt the weight behind my eyes, the stench of fear in my shirt. Bolton's ordered me down to the JFK building. Me too? You weren't mentioned. Good. I'll have to take care of May somehow. I'll take her, she said. Yeah? I'd love it. Bring her by. I'll take her to the playground across the street. I called Grace and told her I'd gotten hung up. She thought May hanging out with Angie was a fine idea, as long as Angie didn't mind. She's looking forward to it, believe me. Great. You okay? Fine. Why? I don't know, she said. There's a tremor in your voice. Guys like Kevin will do that, I thought. I'm fine. I'll see you soon. May walked into the kitchen as I hung up. Hey, pal, I said. Want to go to the playground? She smiled, and it was her mother's smile. Guileless and open and without hesitation. Playground? They got swings? Of course they got swings. Wouldn't be much of a playground without swings. They got a jungle gym? They got one of those, too. They got roller coasters? Not yet, I said. But I'll put in a suggestion to management. She hoisted herself up on the chair across from me and put her untied sneakers on my chair. Okay, she said. May, I said as I tied her sneakers. I have to go see a friend, though, and I can't take you with me. The momentary look of confusion and abandonment in her eyes broke my heart in quarters. But, I said hurriedly, you know my friend Angie? She wants to play with you. How come? Because she likes you. And she likes playgrounds. She got pretty hair. Yeah, she does. It's black and tangly, and I like it. I'll tell her you said so, May. Patrick, why we stopped? May said. We were standing on the corner of Dorchester Ave and Howe Street. If you looked directly across the avenue, you saw the Ryan playground. If you looked horizontally down Howe Street, you saw Angie's house. And at this moment, Angie, standing out front, kissing her ex-husband Phil on the cheek. I felt something clench in the center of my chest, and then just as suddenly unclench and fill with a gust of chilled air which seemed to hollow out my insides like the flick of a spade. Angie! May said. Angie turned, and so did Phil, and I felt like a voyeur. An angry voyeur with violence in my heart. They crossed the street and walked to the corner together. She looked, as usual, stupendous in a pair of blue jeans, purple t-shirt, black leather jacket slung over her shoulder. Her hair was wet, and a single strand had come out from behind her ear and clung to her cheekbone. She tucked it back as she approached and waved her fingers at May. Phil, unfortunately, also looked good. Angie told me he'd quit drinking, and you could see the effects. He dropped at least 20 pounds since I'd last seen him, and his jawline was smooth and hard, his eyes devoid of the puffiness that had all but swallowed them over the last five years. He moved loosely in a white shirt and pleated charcoal trousers that matched the color of the hair swept off his forehead. He looked 15 years younger, and his pupils carried a spark I hadn't seen since childhood. Hey, Patrick, he said. Hi, Phil. He paused at the curb and clutched a hand to his heart. Is this her? He said. Is this the one? Is this the great, the unforgettable, the world-renowned May? He squatted by her and she smiled broadly. I'm May, she said softly. It's a pleasure, May, he said and shook her hand formally. I bet you turn frogs into princes in your spare time. You are definitely something to see. She looked at me, curious and slightly confused, but I could see by the flush of her face and the change in her pupils that Phil had already worked his magic. 
I'm May, she said again. And I'm Philip, he said. This guy taking care of you all right? He's my pal, May said. He's Patrick. No greater pal to have, Phil said. You didn't have to know Phil when he was younger to recognize his ability with people, no matter what their age. Even when he was drinking too much and abusing his wife, it was still there. Phil, since he climbed out of the crib, had had this gift. It wasn't cheap or vaudevillian or contrived or consciously manipulative. It was a simple but rare ability to make the person he talked to feel like he or she was the only person on the planet worthy of attention, as if his ears were placed on his head specifically so he could listen to what you had to say, as if his eyes existed only to see you, as if his sole reason for being was to have his encounter, whatever its nature, with you. I'd forgotten that until I saw him with May. It was so much easier to remember him as the drunken asshole who'd somehow managed to marry Angie. But Angie had remained married to him for twelve years, even while he beat her. And there was a reason for that. No matter how unforgivable a monster Phil had become, he was still, somewhere inside of him, the Phil who made you glad you'd met him. That was the Phil who rose from his place by May as Angie said, How you doing, pretty girl? I'm great. May reached up to touch Angie's hair. She likes your hair, I said. You like this mess? Angie dropped to one knee as May ran her hand through her hair. It's very tangly, May said. That's what my hairdresser says. How you doing, Patrick? Phil held out his hand. I considered it. On a bright autumn morning with the air so fresh it felt like a tonic and the sun dancing lightly on the orange leaves, it seemed silly to not be at peace with my surroundings. I let my hesitation speak for itself, then reached out and shook the hand. Not bad, Phil. How about yourself? Good, he said. Still taking it day by day and all, but you know how it is. Everyone's life has static. True. I looked some of my own static dead in the face. Yeah, well... He looked over his shoulder at his ex-wife and a child playing with each other's hair. She's a prize. Which one? I said. He smiled. A rueful one. Both of them, I guess. But I was talking about the four-year-old at the moment. I nodded. She's something else, yeah. Angie walked up beside him, May's hand in hers. What time you have to be at work? Noon, he said. He looked at me. Guy I'm working for now is an artiste in the back bay. Got me ripping up his entire duplex, ripping up 19th century parquet floors so we can inlay it all with black, black marble. You believe that? He sighed and ran his hands through his hair. I was wondering, Angie said, if maybe you wouldn't mind pushing May on the swings with me. Ah, oh, I don't know. He said, looking at May. My arm's kind of sore. Don't be a big baby, May said. Can't be called a big baby now, can I? Phil said as he scooped her up with one arm and settled her on his hip and the three of them crossed the avenue toward the playground, waving brightly to me before they walked up the steps and headed for the swing sets. Chapter 21 You're going to see Alec Hardiman, Bolton said without looking up as I walked into the conference room. I am? You have an appointment this afternoon at one. I looked at Devin and Oscar. I do. This office will be monitoring the entire visit. I sat down in a seat across from Devon, a deep cherry wood table the size of my apartment between us. Oscar sat to Devon's left and a half dozen feds and suits and ties filled the rest of the table. Most of them were talking on telephones. Devon and Oscar didn't have telephones. Bolton had two in front of him at the other end of the table, 
Regular and special bat phone, I guessed. He stood up and came down the table toward me. What did you and Kevin Hurley discuss? Politics, I said. The current value of the yen, things of that nature. Bolton put his hand on the back of my chair and leaned in close enough for me to smell the sucrets in his mouth. Tell me what you talked about, Mr. Kenzie. What do you think we talked about, Special Agent Bolton? He told me to back off the Warren investigation. So you fired a round into his car? Seemed an appropriate response at the time. Why does your name keep coming up on this case? I have no idea. Why does Alec Hardiman want to talk only to you? Again, no clue. He snapped the chair back as he walked around the table, stopped behind Devin and Oscar and put his hands in his pockets. He looked like he hadn't slept in a week. I need answers, Mr. Kenzie. I don't have any. I faxed Devin copies of my case files on the Warren case. I sent over photos of the guy with the goatee. I told you everything I remember about my meeting with Kara Ryder. Beyond that, I'm as in the dark as you guys. He pulled a hand out of his pocket, rubbed the back of his neck. What are you, Jack Rouse, Kevin Hurley, Jason Warren, Kara Ryder, Peter Stimovich, Freddie Constantine, District Attorney Timson, and Alec Hardiman have in common? This a riddle? Answer the question. I don't fucking know. I held up my hands. Clear enough for you? You have to help us out here, Mr. Kenzie. And I'm trying, Bolton, but your interviewing technique is about as socially skilled as a loan shark's. You piss me off. I'm not going to be able to be much help because I won't be able to think past my anger. Bolton walked to the back wall at the other end of the room. It was the width of the office, at least 30 feet and about 12 feet tall. He tugged at the sheet covering it, and when it came away in his hands, I was looking at a corkboard that covered 90% of the wall. Photographs and crime scene diagrams, spectral analysis sheets and evidence lists were stuck by pushpins and thin wires to the cork. I came out of my seat and walked slowly down the length of the table, trying to take it all in. Behind me, Devin said, We've interviewed everyone involved in either case that we know of, Patrick. Plus interrogations of everyone who knew Stimovich and the latest victim, Pamela Stokes. Nothing. Nothing at all. All the victims were represented by photos. Two each of them living. Several of them dead. Pamela Stokes looked to have been about 30. One of the photos showed her squinting against the sun, her hand held over her forehead, a bright smile lighting up an otherwise bland face. What do we know about her? Saleswoman for Anne Klein, Oscar said. Last seen leaving the Mercury Bar on Boylston Street two nights ago. Alone, I said. Devin shook his head with a guy wearing a baseball cap, sunglasses, and a goatee. He's wearing sunglasses in a bar and nobody's suspicious? You ever been to the Mercury? Oscar said. It's filled with tray chic Euro-trash wannabes. They all wear sunglasses indoors. So there's our killer. I pointed at the photo of Jason and the guy with the goatee. One of them anyway, Oscar said. You sure there's two? We're working on that assumption. Jason Warren, without a doubt, was killed by two men. How do we know that? He scratched them. Devin said, Two different types of blood under his fingernails. Did the families of all the victims receive photographs of them before they were killed? Yes, Oscar said. It's the closest we have to an M.O., Three of the four victims were killed in places other than where their bodies were found. Kara Ryder was then dumped in Dorchester, Stimovich in Squanum, and what was left of Pamela Stokes was found in Lincoln. Below the current victims' photos were photos under a heading, Victims 1974. 
Cal Morrison's slightly cocky, boyish face stared out at me. And even though I hadn't thought of him for years, until that night at Jerry's bar, I could immediately smell the pina colada shampoo he'd worn in his hair. And I remembered how we'd all razzed him about it. All the victims have been cross-referenced for similarities? Yes, Bolton said. And? Two, Bolton said. Both Kara Ryder's mother and Jason Warren's father grew up in Dorchester. The other? Both Kara Ryder and Pam Stokes wore the same perfume. What kind? Lab analysis says it was Halston for women. Lab analysis, I said, as I looked at photos of Jack Rouse, Stan Timpson, Freddie Constantine, Deandra Warren, Deidre Ryder. There were two of each. One from the present, the other at least 20 years old. No clues whatsoever as to motive. I looked at Oscar, and he looked away and then over at Devon, and Devon passed the ball to Bolton. Agent Bolton, I said, what do you have? Jason Warren's mother, he said eventually. What about her? She's occasionally been consulted as a psychological expert in criminal trials. So? So, he said, she provided a psychological profile of Hardiman during his trial that effectively crushed his insanity defense. DeAndre Warren, Mr. Kenzie, put Alec Hardiman away. Bolton's mobile command post was a black RV with tinted windows. It was waiting for us idling when we came out onto New Sudbury Street. Inside, two agents, Burdum and Field, sat at a black and gray computer station that took up the right wall. On the tabletop was a serpent's nest of cable, two computers, two fax machines, two laser jet printers. Above the hutch was a bank of six monitors with a matching bank of six across from them on the left wall. Down at the end of the work center, I could see digital receivers and recorders, a dual-deck VCR, audio and video cassettes, diskettes, and CDs. The left wall supported a small table and three captain's chairs bolted to the wall. As the RV lurched into traffic, I fell onto one and rested my hand on a small fridge. You take this thing on camping trips? I said. Bolton ignored me. Agent Erdem, you have that writ? Erdem handed him a piece of paper and Bolton slipped it into his inside pocket. He sat beside me. You'll be going into the meeting with Warden Leaf and the chief prison psychologist, Dr. Dahlquist. They'll brief you on Hardiman. So there's very little I can bother adding except to say that Hardiman is not to be taken lightly, no matter how pleasant he may seem. He suspected in three murders behind bars. But no one in the entire population of a maximum security pen will come forward with evidence. These are multiple murderers and arsonists and serial rapists, and they're all afraid of Alec Hardiman. You understand? I nodded. The cell in which the meeting will be held is completely wired. We'll have both audio and video access from this control booth. We'll be watching you every step of the way. Hardiman will have both legs manacled and at least one wrist. Even still, tread lightly with him. Harneman gave you consent for the audio and video? The video isn't up to him. Only the audio infringes upon his rights. And did he give consent? He shook his large head. No, he did not. But you're doing it anyway. Yes. I'm not looking to take it into court. I could need to consult it from time to time as the case goes on. You have a problem with that? Can't think of one. The RV lurched again as it swung past Haymarket and made the turn onto 93. And I sat back and looked out the windows and wondered how I'd ever gotten myself into this. Dr. Dolquist was a small but powerfully built man who'd only meet my eyes for a moment before glancing away at something else. Warden Leaf was tall, with his black head shaven so smooth it gleamed. 
Dahlquist and I were left alone for several minutes in Leaf's office, while Leaf met with Bolton to hammer out surveillance details. Dahlquist looked at a photograph of Leaf and two friends holding a marlin by a stucco hut under a blazing Florida sun, while I waited for the silence to become less uncomfortable. You're married, Mr. Kenzie. He stared at the photo. Divorced. A long time ago. Kids? No? You? He nodded. Two. It helps. Helps what? He waved a hand toward the walls. Dealing with this place. It helps to return home to children, to the clean smell of them. He looked at me and then away. I'm sure it does, I said. Your work, he said, must bring you into contact with a lot of what's negative in humanity. Depends on the case, I said. How long have you been doing it? Almost ten years. You must have started young. I did. Do you see it as your life's work? That quick glance again, skipping across my face. I'm not sure yet. How about you, doctor? I believe so, he said with extreme slowness. I do believe so, he said unhappily. Tell me about Hardiman, I said. Alec, he said, is an unexplainable. He had a very proper upbringing. No history of child abuse or childhood trauma, and no early indicators of a diseased mind. As far as we know, he didn't torture animals or display morbid obsessions or act out in any notable way. He was very bright in school and quite popular. And then one day... What? We don't know. Around the time he was 16 or so, trouble started. Neighborhood girls who claimed he'd exposed himself to them. Cats strangled and hung from telephone wires near his house, violent outbursts in the classroom, and then nothing again. At 17, he reverted to an appearance of normalcy. And if it weren't for the falling out with Rugglestone, who knows how long they would have gone on killing. There had to be something. He shook his head. I've worked with him for almost two decades, Mr. Kenzie, and I haven't found it. Even now, to all outward appearances, Alec Hardiman seems a polite, reasonable, perfectly harmless man. But he isn't. He laughed, a sudden harsh sound in the small room. He's the most dangerous man I've ever met. He lifted a pencil holder off Leaf's desk, looked at it absently and set it back down. Alec has been HIV positive for three years. He looked at me and for a moment his eyes held. Recently, his condition has worsened into full-blown AIDS. He's dying, Mr. Kenzie. You think that's why he called me here? Deathbed confessions? Last-minute change in morals? He shook his head. Not at all. Alec has no morals. Since he's been diagnosed, he's been kept out of general population. But I think Alec knew... He had contracted long before we did. In the two months leading up to his diagnosis, he raped at least ten men. At least ten. It's my firm belief that he did this not to satisfy his sexual urges, but to satisfy his homicidal ones. Warden Leaf stuck his head back in. Showtime. He handed me a pair of tight canvas gloves, and he and Dahlquist donned pairs of their own. Keep your hands away from his mouth, Dahlquist said softly, his eyes on the floor. And we left the office, none of us speaking as we took a long walk down an oddly hushed cell block toward Alec Hardiman. Chapter 22 Alec Hardiman was 41 years old, but looked fifteen years younger. His pale blonde hair was plastered wetly across his forehead like a grade schooler's. His eyeglasses were small and rectangular, granny glasses. And when he spoke, his voice seemed as light as air. Hi, Patrick, he said as I came into the room. 
glad you could make the trip. He sat at a small metal table bolted to the floor. His frail hands were cuffed and looped through two holes in the table, and his feet were manacled. When he looked up at me, the fluorescence seared the lenses of his glasses white. I took a seat across from him. I heard you could help me, inmate Hardiman. You did. He slouched loosely in his chair and gave off the impression of a man completely at ease with his surroundings. The lesions that covered his face and neck seemed raw and alive, their surfaces carrying a sheen. His pupils seemed to emanate brightly from recessive caverns in their hollow sockets. Yes, I heard you wanted to talk. Absolutely. He said as Dolquist took the seat beside my own and Leaf took a position against the wall, eyes impassive, hand on his nightstick. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, Patrick. To me, why? You interest me, he shrugged. You've been in prison for most of my life, inmate Hardiman. Please call me Alec. Alec, I don't understand your interest. He tilted his head so that the glasses, which had been sliding down his nose, righted themselves. Water? Excuse me, I said. He tilted his head to indicate a plastic pitcher and four plastic glasses on the table to his left. Would you like some water? He said. No, thank you. Candy? He smiled softly. What? Do you enjoy your work? I glanced at Dolquist. Careers seem to be an obsession behind these walls. It pays the bills? I said. But it's more than that, Hardiman said. Isn't it? I shrugged. Do you see yourself doing it at 55? He asked. I'm not sure I see myself doing it at 35, inmate Hardiman. Alec. Alec, I said. He nodded the way a priest will in the confessional. What other options do you have? I sighed. Alec, we didn't come here to discuss my future. That doesn't mean we can't, Patrick, does it? He raised both eyebrows and his skeletal face softened with innocence. I'm interested in you. Humor me, please. I looked at Leaf and he shrugged his wide shoulders. Maybe I'll teach, I said. Really? He leaned forward. Why not? What about working for a large agency? He said. I've heard they pay well. Some do. Offer a benefits package, health insurance, the like. Yes. Have you considered it, Patrick? I hated the way he said my name, but I wasn't sure why. I've considered it. But you prefer your independence. Something like that. I poured myself a glass of water and Hardiman's bright eyes fixed on my lips as I drank. Alec, I said, what can you tell us about... You're familiar with the parable of the three talents. I nodded. Those who hoard or are afraid to answer to their gifts are neither hot nor cold and shall be spewed from the mouth of God. I'm familiar with the tale, Alec. Well... He sat back and raised his palms against the cuffs. A man who turns his back on his vocation is neither hot nor cold. What if the man isn't sure he's found his vocation? He shrugged. Alec, if we could just discuss, I think you've been blessed with the gift of fury, Patrick. I do. I've seen it in you. When? Have you ever been in love? He leaned forward. What's that got to have you? Yes, I said. Are you now? He peered into my face. Why do you care, Alec? He leaned back, looked up at the ceiling. I've never been in love. I've never been in love, and I've never held a woman's hand and walked on a beach with her and talked about... Oh, domestic things, who will cook, who will clean that night. 
if we should call a repairman for the washing machine. I've never experienced such things, and sometimes, when I'm alone, late at night, it makes me weep. He chewed his lower lip for a moment. But we all dream of other lives, I suppose. We all want to live a thousand different existences during our time here. But we can't, can we? No, I said. We can't. I asked about your career goals, Patrick, because I believe you're a man of impact. Do you understand? No. He smiled sadly. Most men and women pass their time on this earth without distinction. Lives of quiet desperation and all that. They are born, they exist for a time with all their particular passions and loves and dreams and pains, and then they die and barely anyone notices. Patrick, there are billions of these people, tens of billions throughout history who have lived without impact, who may as well not have been born at all. The people you're talking about might disagree. I'm sure they would. He smiled broadly and leaned in as if he were about to tell me a secret. But who would listen? Alec, all I need to know here is why you are potentially a man of impact, Patrick. You could be remembered long after you die. Think what an achievement that would be particularly in this disposable culture of ours. Think of it. What if I have no desire to be a man of impact? His eyes disappeared in the wash of fluorescence. Maybe the choice isn't yours. Maybe you'll be turned into one whether you like it or not. He shrugged. By who? I said. He smiled. Whom? By whom, then, I said. The Father, he said, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Of course, I said. Are you a man of impact, Alec? Dolquist said. We both turned our heads, looked at him. Are you? Dolquist said. Alec Hardiman's head turned back slowly to face me and his glasses slipped halfway down his nose. The eyes behind the lenses were the milky green of Caribbean shallows. Forgive Dr. Dolquist's interruption, Patrick. He's a little on edge lately about his wife. My wife, Dolquist said. Dr. Dolquist's wife, Judith, Hardiman said, left him once for another man. Did you know that, Patrick? Dolquist picked at some lint on his knee, concentrated on his shoes. And then she came back and he took her back. I'm sure there were tears, pleas for forgiveness, some minor snide remarks on the doctor's part. One can only assume. But that was three years ago, wasn't it, doctor? Dolquist looked at Hardiman and his eyes were clear, but his breathing was slightly shallow and his right hand still picked absently at his pant leg. I have it on good authority, Hardiman said, that on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, Dr. Dolquist's Queen Judith allows penetration of her every orifice by two former inmates of this institution at the Red Roof Inn on Route 1 in Saugus. I wonder how Dr. Dolquist feels about that. Enough, inmate, Leif said. Dolquist looked at a point somewhere over Hardman's head, and his voice was smooth, but the back of his neck bore a swath of hard, bright red. Alec, your delusions are for another time. Today, they're not delusions. Mr. Kenzie is here at your behest, and second and fourth Wednesdays, Hardman said, between two and four at the Red Roof Inn, room 217. Dolquist's voice faltered for just a moment, a pause or an intake of breath which wasn't quite natural, and I heard it, and so did Hardiman, and Hardiman smiled slightly at me. Dolquist said, The point 
of this meeting. Hardiman waved his thin fingers dismissively and turned his full attention to me. I could see myself mirrored in the icy fluorescent light that ran along the upper half of both lenses, his green pupils floating just below my melting features. He leaned forward again, and I resisted the urge to lean back because I could suddenly feel the heat of him, smell the torpid, fleshy stench of decayed conscience. Alec, I said, what can you tell me about the deaths of Kara Ryder, Peter Stimovich, Jason Warren, and Pamela Stokes? He sighed. When I was a boy, I was attacked by a nest of yellow jackets. I was walking along a lake, and I have no idea where they came from, but then, like a mirage, they surrounded me and swarmed my body in this great big cloud of black and yellow. Through the cloud, I could just make out my parents and some neighbors rushing down the sand toward me. And I wanted to tell them it was all right, it was fine. But then the bees stung. A thousand needles pierced my flesh and drank from my blood, and the pain was so excruciating it was orgasmic. He looked at me as a drop of sweat fell from his nose and landed on his chin. I was eleven years old, and I had my first orgasm right there in my swimsuit as a thousand yellow jackets drank my blood. Lee frowned and leaned back against the wall. The last time it was wasps, Dolquist said. It was yellow jackets. You said wasps, Alec. I said yellow jackets, Alec said mildly and looked back at me. Have you ever been stung? I shrugged. Probably once or twice when I was a little kid. I can't remember. There was a silence then which lasted several minutes. Alec Hardiman sat across from me and looked at me as if he were considering how I'd look laid out in sections on a piece of bone-white china, forks and knives and a full service tray at his disposal. I looked back, aware that he'd refused to answer any questions I had at the moment. When he spoke, I didn't see his lips move until afterward, in memory. Could you adjust my glasses, Patrick? I looked at Leaf and he shrugged. I leaned forward and pushed them back up to Alex's eyes, and he tilted his nostrils toward the space of bare skin between my gloved palm and shirt cuff, sniffed audibly. I removed my hand. Did you have sex this morning, Patrick? I didn't say anything. I can smell her sex on your hand, he said. Leaf came off the wall just enough so that I could see the warning in his face. I want you to understand something, Hardiman said. I want you to understand that there are choices. You can make the right one or the wrong one, but the choice will be presented. Not everyone you love can live. I tried to get some saliva working through the sand stiffening in my throat and against my tongue. Deandra Warren's son is dead because she put you away. That one I get. What about the other victims? He hummed softly at first, and I couldn't recognize the tune until he lowered his head and the volume rose slightly. Send in the clowns. The other victims, I repeated. Why did they have to die, Alec? Isn't it bliss, he sang. You brought me here for a reason, I said. Don't you approve? Why did they die, Alec? I said. One who keeps tearing around. His voice was thin and high. One who can't move. Inmate Hardiman. So send in the clowns. I looked at Dolquist, then at Leaf. Hardiman wagged a finger at me. Don't bother, he sang. They're here. And he laughed. He laughed hard. 
his vocal cords booming, his mouth wide and spittle forming at the corners, and his eyes even wider as they remained on me. The air in the cell seemed to go into that mouth with him, as if he were sucking it down into his lungs until it filled his whole body and we'd be left airless and gasping. Then his mouth clamped shut, and his eyes glazed, and he looked as reasonable and gentle as a small-town librarian. Why did you bring me here, Alec? You've tamed the cowlick, Patrick. What? He turned his head, spoke to Leaf. Patrick used to have an awful cowlick near the back of his head. It stuck out like a broken finger. I resisted the urge to raise my hand to my head, pat down a cow like I haven't had in years. My stomach felt weak suddenly, and very cold. Why'd you bring me here? You could have spoken to a thousand police officers, a thousand feds, but if I claimed my blood was being poisoned by the government, or that alpha waves from other galaxies were infiltrating my faculties or that I'd been forcibly sodomized by my mother, what would you say to that? I wouldn't know what to say. No, you wouldn't, because you know nothing, and none of those things are true, and even if they were, it would be largely irrelevant. What if I told you I was God? Which one? The only one. I'd wonder how God got himself locked up in the joint and why he couldn't just miracle his ass out. He smiled. Very good, very glib, of course, but that's your nature. What's yours? My nature, I nodded. He looked at Leaf. Are we having the baked chicken again this week? Friday, Leaf said. Hardiman nodded. That's good. I like the baked chicken. Patrick, it was a pleasure meeting you. Drop by again. Leaf looked at me and shrugged. Interview's over. I said, wait. Hardiman laughed. Interview's over, Patrick. Dolquist stood up. After a minute, I did too. Dr. Dolquist, Hardiman said, Say hello to Queen Judith for me. Dolquist turned toward the cell gate. I turned with him, stared at the bars and felt them holding me, closing me in, blocking me from ever seeing the outside world again, locking me in here with Hardiman. Leaf walked up to the gate and produced a key, all three of us with our backs to Hardiman now. And he whispered, your father was a yellow jacket. I turned around and he was staring at me impassively. What was that? He nodded and closed his eyes, drummed the fingertips of his cuffed hands on the table. When he spoke, his voice seemed to come from the corners of the room and the ceiling, and the bars themselves. Anywhere but from his mouth. I said... Eviscerate them, Patrick. Kill them all. He pursed his lips, and we stood there waiting. But it was useless. A minute passed in complete silence. As he remained that way, without so much as a tremor coursing his tight, pallid skin. As the doors opened and we walked out into the corridor of C Block, past the two guards posted as sentries outside the cell, Alec Hardiman sang the words, eviscerate them, Patrick, kill them all, in a voice so light but rich and strong that we could have been hearing an aria. Eviscerate them, Patrick. The words flowed like birdsong down the cell block corridor. Kill them all. Chapter 23 Leaf led us through a maze of maintenance corridors, the sounds of the prison muffled by the thick walls. The corridor smelled of antiseptic and industrial solvent, and the floors had the yellowish shine of the floors in all state institutions. He has a fan club, you know. Who? 
Hardiman, Leif said. Criminology students, law students, lonely middle-aged women, a couple of social workers, some church group types. Pen pals who he's convinced of his innocence. You're shitting me. Leif smiled and shook his head. Oh, no. Alec has this favorite thing he does. He invites them to visit, to see his eminence in the flesh or some such. And some of these people, they're poor. They spend a life savings just to get here. And then guess what old Alec does? Laughs at them? He refuses to see them. Dahlquist said. Always. Yep. Leif said. He punched numbers into a keypad by the door in front of us and it opened with a soft click. He sits in his cell and looks out the window as they walk back down the long road to their cars, confused and humiliated and alone. And he jerks off into his hand. That's Alec, Dolquist said as we came out into the light by the main gate. What was that crack about your father? Leif said as we left the prison and headed toward Bolton's RV sitting halfway down the gravel walkway. I shrugged. I don't know. As far as I know, he didn't know my father. Dolquist said, Sounds like he wants you to think he did. And that cow leg shit? Leif said, Either he did know you, Mr. Kenzie, or he made a hell of a guess. Gravel crunched under our feet as we crossed toward the RV, and I said, I've never met the guy before. Well, Leif said, Alex's good at fucking with people's heads. I heard you were coming, I dug this up. He handed me a piece of paper. We intercepted this when Alec tried to send it by one of his couriers to a 19-year-old boy he'd raped after he knew he was HIV positive. I opened the note. The death in my blood, I gave it to you. On the other side of the grave... I'll be waiting for you. I handed the note back as if it were on fire. Wanted the kid to be afraid even after he was dead. That's Alec, Leif said. And maybe you never did meet. But he asked for you specifically. Remember that. I nodded. Dolquist's voice was hesitant. Do you need me? Leif shook his head. Wrap me up a report. Have it on my desk in the morning, and I think we're okay, Ron. Dolquist stopped just outside the van and shook my hand. Nice meeting you, Mr. Kenzie. I hope everything works out. Same here. He nodded but wouldn't meet my eyes. And then he nodded curtly at Leaf and turned to walk away. Leaf patted him on the back, a slightly awkward gesture as if he'd never done it before. Take care, Ron. We watched the little muscular man walk down the path a bit before he stopped and seemed almost to jerk to his left and cut across the lawn toward the parking lot. He's a little weird, Leif said, but he's a good man. The great shadow of the prison wall cut across the lawn and darkened the grass, and Dolquist seemed wary of it. He walked along its edge, in the strip of sunlit grass, and he did so gingerly, as if he were afraid he'd step too much to his left and sink through the dark grass. Where do you think he's going? To check on his wife. Leif spit into the gravel. You think what Hardiman said was true? He shrugged. Don't know. The details were precise, though. If it was your wife and she'd been unfaithful before, wouldn't you go check? Dolquist was a tiny figure now as he reached the edge of the grass and cut around the shadow of the prison to the parking lot before disappearing from view. Poor bastard, I said. Leaf spit into the gravel again. Pray Hardiman don't make someone say that about you someday. A sudden stiff breeze curled out of the dark shadows under the wall, and I shrugged my shoulders against it as I opened the back door of the RV. Bolton said, Nice interviewing technique. You study? I did my best, I said. You did shit, he said. You learned absolutely zero about these current killings in there. Oh, well. I looked around the RV. Erdem and Field sat at the thin black table. Above them, the bank of six monitors played five recordings of our interview with Hardiman. The sixth covering real time, as Alex sat in the same position we'd left him in. 
his eyes closed, head thrown back, lips pursed. Beside me, Leaf watched the second bank of monitors on the opposite wall as a series of prisoner photos rolled across, angry faces being replaced by fresh angry faces at a rate of six every two minutes. I looked over and watched Erdem's fingers whiz over a computer keypad, and I realized he was rifling through the prison files of every inmate. Where'd you get authorization? Leaf said. Bolton looked bored. A federal magistrate at five this morning. He handed Leaf a writ. See for yourself. I looked up at the bank of monitors above his head as a fresh row of convicts materialized. As Leaf bent beside me and went over the writ slowly, his index finger running under the words as he read. I watched the six convicts' faces above me until they were replaced with six more. Two were black, two white. One had so many facial tattoos he could have been green for all I could tell. And one looked like a young Hispanic, except his hair was a shock of pure white. Freeze that, I said. Erdem looked over his shoulder at me. What? Freeze those faces, I said. Can you do that? He took his hands off the keyboard. It's done. He looked at Bolton. None of them are a match so far, sir. What's a match? I said. Bolton said, We're running every inmate's file against all prison documentation, no matter how minor, to see if there's any sort of relationship with Alec Hardiman. We're nearing the end of the A's now. First two are completely clean, Erdem said. Not a single incident of contact with Hardiman. Leaf was staring up at the monitors now, too. Run the sixth, he said. I came up beside him. Who is that guy? You've seen him before? I don't know, I said. He seems familiar. You'd remember that hair, though. Yeah, I said. I would. Evandro Arujo, Erdem said. No match on cell block, no match on work detail, no match on recreational time, no match on... Lot that computer won't tell you, Leaf said. Sentencing... I'm punching up incident reports now. I looked at the face. It was smooth and feminine. The face of a pretty woman. The white hair contrasted starkly with large almond eyes and amber skin. The thick lips were also feminine, pouty. And his eyelashes were long and dark. Major incident number one. Inmate Arujo claims he was raped in hydrotherapy room. August 6th, 87. Inmate refuses to identify alleged rapists, requests solitary confinement. Request denied. I looked at Leaf. I wasn't here then, he said. What was he in for? Grand theft auto. First offense. In here? I said. Bolton was standing beside us now, and I could smell the sucrets on his breath. Grand theft is not maximum. Tell that to the judge, Leaf said. And the cop whose car Evandro totaled, who was a drinking buddy of said judge. Second major incident, suspicion of mayhem, March 88. No further information. Means he raped someone himself, Leaf said. Third major incident, arrest and trial for manslaughter convicted June 89. Welcome to Evandro world, Leaf said. Print this. Bolton said. The laser jet hummed, and the first thing out was the photo we were all staring up at. Bolton took it, looked at Leaf. Was there contact between this inmate and Hardiman? Leaf nodded. Won't find documentation of it, though. Why not? Because there's what you know and can prove, and what you just know. Evandro was Hardiman's bitch. Walked in here a half-decent kid to do nine months on a car theft. Walked out nine and a half years later a fucking freak show. How'd he get that hair? I said. Shock, Leaf said. After the gangbang in Hydro, he was found on the floor bleeding from every orifice with his hair, shocked white. After he got out of the infirmary, he went back into population because the previous warden didn't like Spicks. And by the time I got here... He'd been bought and sold a thousand times, 
and ended up with Hardiman. When was he released? Bolton said. Six months ago. Run all his photos and print them. Bolton said. Erdem's fingers flew back over the keyboard, and suddenly the bank of monitors showed five different photos of Evandro Arujo. The first was a mugshot from the Brockton PD. His face was swollen and his right cheekbone looked broken and his eyes were tender and terrified. Crash the car, Leaf said. Hit his head on the steering wheel. The next was taken the day he arrived at Walpole. Eyes still huge and terrified, cuts and swelling gone. He had rich black hair and the same feminine features, but they were even softer, still carrying a hint of baby fat. The next one was the first I'd seen. His hair was white and the large eyes were altered somehow, as if someone had scraped off a layer of emotion, the way you'd scrape the thinnest film of egg white from the shell. After he murdered Norman Sussex, Leaf said. In the fourth, he'd lost a lot of weight and his feminine features seemed grotesque, the face of a haggard witch on a young man's body. The large eyes were bright and loud somehow, and the full lips sneered. The day he was convicted. The final photo was taken the day of his release. He'd streaked his hair with what looked like charcoal and gained weight, and he puckered his lips at the photographer. How did this guy get out? Bolton said. He looks completely deranged. I stared up at the second photo. The young Evandro, dark-haired, face clear of bruises, Eyes wide and afraid. He was convicted of involuntary manslaughter, Leaf said. Not murder, not even man too. I know he cleaved open Sussex without provocation, but I couldn't prove it. And wounds on both Sussex and Arujo at the time were consistent with those of men who'd been in a shank fight. He pointed at Arujo's forehead in the most recent photo. There was a thin white line creasing the forehead. See that? Shank mark. Sussex couldn't tell us what happened. So Arujo claimed self-defense, said the shank belonged to Sussex, and he draws eight years because the judge didn't believe him. But he couldn't prove otherwise either. We got a serious overcrowding problem in our prisons, in case no one told you. And inmate Arujo was in every other respect a model prisoner who served his time, earned his parole. I stared up at the various incarnations of Evandro Arujo. Injured, young and scared, blighted and ruined, gaunt and barren, petulant and dangerous. And I knew, beyond any doubt, that I'd seen him before, but I couldn't place where. I rifled through possibilities. On the street, in a bar, on a bus, in the subway driving a cab, at the gym, in a crowd, at a ball game, in a movie theater, at a concert, in. Who's got a pen? What? A pen, I said, black or a marker. Fields held up a felt tip and I snatched it, pulled a photo of Evandro out of the laser printer and started scribbling on it. Leaf came up and looked over my shoulder. Why are you drawing a goatee on the man, Kenzie? I stared down at the face I'd seen in the movie theater. The face in a dozen photos Angie had taken. So he can't hide anymore, I said. Chapter 24 Devin faxed us a copy of Evandro Rujo's photo from the set Angie'd given him, and Erdem fed it into his computer. We crawled north on 95. The RV stuck in midday traffic snarl as Bolton said, I want an all points issued on him immediately, to Devon, then turned and barked at Erdem. Punch up his proby's name. Erdem glanced at Fields and Fields hit a button and said, Sheila Lawn, office in the Saltonstall building. Bolton was still talking to Devon. 5'11", 163 pounds, 30 years old. Only distinguishing mark is a thin scar one inch long on his upper forehead, just below the hairline. Shank wound. He cupped his hand over the phone. Kenzie, call her. 
Fields gave me the phone number and I picked up the handset and dialed as Evandro's photo materialized on Erdem's screen. He immediately began to punch buttons and enhance the texture and color. Sheila Lawn's office. Ms. Lawn, please. This is she? Ms. Lawn, my name is Patrick Kenzie. I'm a private detective, and I need information on one of your parolees. Just like that? Excuse me? The RV lumbered into a lane that was moving an inch or two faster per minute and several horns blared. You don't think I'm going to reveal anything about a client to a man claiming to be a private investigator on the phone, do you? Wow. Bolton was watching me as he listened to something Devin said, and he reached out and grabbed the phone from me, spoke into it out of the corner of his mouth while still listening to Devin through his other ear. Officer Lawn, this is Special Agent Barton Bolton of the FBI. I'm assigned to the Boston office, and my identification number is 604192. Call and verify who I am and keep Mr. Kenzie on the line. This is a federal matter, and we expect your cooperation. He tossed the phone back to me and said to Devin, Go ahead, I'm listening. Hi, I said. Hi, she said. I feel chastised. By a man with a name like Barton, no less. Hold on. While I was on hold, I looked out the window as the RV switched lanes again and saw what the tie-up had been. A Volvo had rear-ended a Datsun, and the owner of one of them was being escorted down the breakdown lane to an ambulance. His face was covered in blood and pricked with small shards of glass, and he held his hands in front of him awkwardly, as if he wasn't sure they were attached anymore. The accident wasn't blocking traffic anymore, if it had ever been, but everyone had slowed to a standstill to get a proper look. Three cars ahead of us, the backseat passenger was recording it all on video camera. Home movies for the wife and kids. Look, son. Severe facial lacerations. Mr. Kenzie. I'm here. I've been chastised twice now. The second time by Agent Bolton's boss for wasting the FBI's precious time on something as trivial as protecting my client's rights. So, which of my choir boys do you need information on? Evandro Rujo? Why? We just need it, that's all I can say. Okay. Shoot. When's the last time you saw him? Two weeks ago, Monday. Evandro's punctual. Hell, compared to most, he's a dream. How's that? Never misses an appointment, is never late. Got a job within two weeks of his release. Where? Harto Kennel in Swampscott. What's the address and phone number at Harto Kennel? She gave it to me and I wrote it down, ripped off the sheet and handed it to Bolton as he hung up the phone. Lawn said, His boss, Hank Rivers, loves him. Said he'd hire nothing but ex-cons if they were all like Evandro. Where's Evandro live, Officer Lawn? Miz is fine. His address is... Let me see. Here it is. 205 Custer Street. Where's that? Brighton. Bryce was right next door. I wrote down the address and handed it to Bolton. Is he in trouble? She said. Yes, I said. If you see him, Ms. Lawn, do not approach him. Call the number Agent Bolton just gave you. But what if he comes here? He has another appointment in less than two weeks. He won't be coming there. And if he does, lock the door and call for help. You think he crucified that girl a few weeks ago, don't you? The RV was moving briskly now, but inside, it felt like traffic had come to a dead stop. I said, what would make you think that? It was something he said once. What did he say? You have to understand. Like I said, he's one of the easiest parolees I have, and he's never been anything but sweet and polite, and hell, he sent me flowers in the hospital when I broke my leg. I'm no virgin when it comes to ex-cons, Mr. Kenzie. But Evandro really seemed like a decent guy who'd taken his fall and didn't want to take another. What did he say about crucifixions? Bolton and Fields looked at me, and I could see that even the usually disinterested Erdem was watching my reflection on his LED screen. We were finishing up here one day, and he started fixating on my chest. At first I thought, you know, he's checking out my breasts... 
but then I realize he's staring at the crucifix I wear. Usually I keep it tucked under my shirt, but it fell out that day, and I didn't even notice until I caught Evandro looking at it. And it wasn't just a benign look. It was a bit obsessive, if you know what I'm saying. When I asked him what he was looking at, he said, What do you think about crucifixions, Sheila Lawn? Not Officer Lawn or Ms. Lawn, but Sheila Lawn. What did you say? I said, in what context or something like that? And Evandro? He said, in the sexual context, of course. I think it was the of course that really got to me, because he seemed to think it a perfectly normal context in which to consider a crucifixion. Did you report this conversation? To who? Are you kidding? I have ten men a day, Mr. Kenzie, who say far worse to me. And they're not breaking any laws. Though I could consider it sexual harassment if I didn't know that my male colleagues hear the same thing. Ms. Lawn, I said, you jumped right from my original questions to asking if Evandro crucified someone. Yet I never mentioned wanting him for murder. Yet you're hanging out with the FBI, and you said I should hide if I saw him. But if Evandro was such a model parolee, why would you make that leap if he was so nice? How could you think of him crucifying that girl? Yes. Because you put things out of your mind every day in this job, Mr. Kenzie. It's, well, what you do to keep at it. And I'd completely forgotten that crucifix conversation with Evandro until I saw the article on that girl who was killed. And then it came back fast. And I remembered how I'd felt as he looked at me just for a second, while he said in the sexual context, of course. And the way I felt was dirty and naked and completely vulnerable. But more than that, I felt terrified, again for only a second, because I thought he was considering. There was a long silence as she groped for words. Crucifying you, I asked. She inhaled sharply. Absolutely. Beyond the hair coloring and the goatee, Erdem said as we watched Evandro's photograph take on full color and total clarification on the LED screen. He's definitely had his hairline altered. How? He held up the last photo taken of Evandro in prison. See the scar from the shiv on his upper forehead? Bolton said, Shit. Now you don't, Erdem said and tapped his screen. I looked at the photo Angie'd taken of Evandro exiting the Sunset Grill. The hairline was at least a half inch lower than it had been when he left prison. Now, I don't think that's necessarily part of a disguise, Erdem said. It's too minimal. Most people would never notice the change. He's vain, I said. Exactly. What else? Bolton said. See for yourself. I looked at the two photos. It was hard to get past the shock of white hair turning to dark brown at first, but gradually, his eyes, Bolton said. Erdem nodded. Brown naturally, but green in the photo Mr. Kenzie's partner took. Field set down his phone. Agent Bolton. Yeah. He turned away from us. His cheekbones, I said, noticing my own reflection transposed over Evandro's in the screen. You're good at this, Erdem said. No go at either his address or his place of work, Fields was saying. Landlord hasn't seen him in two weeks, and his boss said he called in sick two days ago and hasn't been seen since. I want agents at both places yesterday. They're already on their way, sir. What about the cheekbones? Bolton said. Implants, Erdem said. That would be my guess, you see. He punched a button three times, and Evandro's photo was magnified, until we were staring at nothing but his calm green eyes, the top half of his nose, and his cheekbones. Erdem touched a pen to the left cheekbone. The tissue here is much softer than it is in that photo. Hell, there's almost no flesh in that one. But here... And see how the skin seems almost chapped, just a bit reddened? That's because it isn't used to being stretched out that far. 
like skin over a blister that's on its way to the surface. You're a genius, Bolton said. Definitely. Erdem said. And his eyes lit up behind his glasses like a little kid looking at birthday candles. But he's pretty damn smart, too. He didn't go for big changes, which would alarm his probation officer or a landlord. Except for the hair, he said hurriedly. And anyone would understand that. Instead, he went for subtle cosmetic changes. You could run this current photo through a computer, and unless you knew exactly what you were looking for, it might not match up with any of those prison photos. The RV tipped a bit as we made the turn onto 93 in Braintree, and Bolton and I palmed the roof for a moment. If he thought that far ahead, I said, then he knew we'd end up looking for him or at least for someone who looked like that. I pointed at the computer screen. Absolutely, Erdem said. So, Bolton said, he's assuming he'll be caught. Seems to be the case, Erdem said. Why else would he duplicate some of Hardiman's murders? He knows he'll be caught, I said, and he doesn't care. Might be even worse than that, Erdem said. Maybe he even wants to be caught which means all these deaths are some sort of message. And he's going to keep killing until we figure out what it is. Sergeant M. Ronklin told me some interesting things while you were on the phone with Arujo's Proby. The RV turned off 93 at Haymarket, and again Bolton and I had to push against the roof to maintain balance. Such as? He caught up with Carol Ryder's roommate in New York. Ms. Ryder met a fellow actor in a class three months ago. He said he was from Long Island. Only made it into Manhattan once a week for this class. He looked at me. Guess. The guy had a goatee. He nodded. Went by the name Evan Hardiman. Like that? Ms. Ryder's roommate also said, and I'm quoting here, he was the most sensual man who ever walked the earth. Sensual, I said. He grimaced. She's, you know, dramatic. What else did she say? She said Kara said he was the best fuck she'd ever had. The be-all and end-all was how she described it. She got the end-all right. I want a psych profile immediately, Bolton said as we rode up in the elevator. I want to know everything about Arujo, from the moment they snipped his umbilical to now. Got it, Field said. He wiped his face with his sleeve. I want the same list we ran on Hardiman. Cross-reference everyone who ever came in contact with Arujo while he was in prison and have an agent at every one of their doorsteps by tomorrow morning. Got it. Field scribbled furiously in his pad. Agent sitting on his parents' house if they're still alive. Bolton said, taking off his coat and breathing heavily. Shit, even if they're not... Agents on the homes of every girlfriend or boyfriend he ever had, on any friends he's had, any girls or boys who ever spurned his advances. That's a lot of manpower, Erdem said. Bolton shrugged. Minuscule compared to what Waco cost this government. And we actually might win here. I want re-canvases of all crime scenes, fresh interviews of every BPD slug who touched them before we came on the scene. I want all principles on Kenzie's list. He ticked off on his fingers. Herlihy, Rouse, Constantine, Pine, Timson, Deandra Warren, Glynn, Galt, re-interviewed and extensive, no, exhaustive checks run on their backgrounds to see if they ever crossed paths with Arujo. He reached into his breast pocket for his inhaler as the elevator came to a stop. Got it? Got it? Get to it. The doors opened and he charged out sucking audibly on the inhaler. Behind me, Field asked Erdem, Exhaustive. Is that spelled with one dick or two? Two, Erdem said, but they're both pretty small. Bolton loosened his tie until the knot hung at his sternum and dropped heavily into the chair behind his desk. Close the door behind you, he said. I did. His face was deep pink his breathing ragged. You okay? Never better. 
Tell me about your father. I took a seat. Nothing to tell. I think Hardiman was reaching, trying to rattle me with bullshit. I don't, he said, and took a small hit off his inhaler. You three had your back to him when he said it, but I was watching him on film. He looked like he blew a load when he said your father was a yellow jacket, like he'd been saving it for maximum impact. He ran a hand through his hair. You had a cowlick when you were younger, didn't you? A lot of kids did. A lot of kids didn't grow up to have their presence requested by a serial killer. I held up a hand, nodded. I had a cowlick agent, Bolton. Usually only noticeable if I'd been sweating a lot. Why? Because I was vain, I guess. I put shit in my hair to keep it down usually. He nodded. He knew you. I don't know what to tell you, Agent Bolton. I've never seen the guy before. Another nod. Tell me about your father. You know I've already got people researching him. I assumed as much. What was he like? He was an asshole who enjoyed inflicting pain, Bolton. And I don't like talking about him. And I'm sorry, he said. But your personal qualms mean nothing to me right now. I'm trying to bring a Rujo down and stop the bloodshed and get a nifty promotion out of the deal. He raised an eyebrow and nodded vigorously. Absolutely. Bank on it. I don't know any of these victims, Mr. Kinsey. And in a general sense, I don't want any human beings to die. Ever. But in a particular sense, I feel nothing for these individuals. And I'm not paid to. I'm paid to bring down guys like this Arujo, and that's what I'm doing. And if by doing so I advance my career, then isn't it a perfect world? His tiny eyes dilated. Tell me about your father. He was a lieutenant with the Boston Fire Department most of his life. Later he switched to local politics, became a city councilor. Not long after that he got lung cancer and died. You two didn't get along. No. He was a bully. Everyone who knew him feared him, and most hated him. He had no friends. Yet you seem to be his opposite. How so? Well, people like you. Sergeant Sam Ronklin and Lee are very fond of you. Leaf took an instant liking to you. And from what I've learned of you since I took this case over, you've formed very strong bonds with people who are such polar opposites as a liberal newspaper columnist, and a psychotic weapon supplier. Your father had no friends, yet you are very rich with friends. Your father was a violent man, yet you don't seem to have an uncontrollable propensity for it. Tell that to Marion Socia, I thought. What I'm trying to figure out here, Mr. Kenzie, is if Alec Hardiman made Jason Warren pay for the sins of his mother, maybe you're being set up to pay for the sins of your father. Which is fine, Agent Bolton. But Deandra had a direct effect on Hardiman's incarceration. So far, though, there's no link between my father and Hardiman. Not one we've uncovered. He leaned back. Look at this from my perspective. This all started when Kara Ryder, an actress, contacted Deandra Warren using the alias Moira Kinsey. That wasn't a mistake. That was a message. We can assume, I think, that Arujo put her up to it. She then points fingers at Kevin Hurley and, by implication, Jack Rouse. You make contact with Jerry Glynn, who worked with Alec Hardiman's father. He points you toward Hardiman himself. Hardiman killed Charles Rugglestone in your neighborhood. We also assume that he killed Cal Morrison, also in your neighborhood. Back then... You and Kevin Hurley, he were kids. But Jack Rouse ran a grocery store. Stan Timpson and DeAndre Warren lived a few blocks away. Kevin Hurley's mother, Emma, was a housewife. Jerry Glynn was a cop. And your father, Mr. Kenzie, was a fireman. He handed me an 8 by 11 map of the Edward Everett Square, Savin Hill, and Columbia Point neighborhoods. Someone had penned a circle around what constituted St. Bart's Parish. Edward Everett Square itself, the Blake Yard, JFK UMass Station, 
a stretch of Dorchester Avenue beginning at the South Boston Line and ending at St. William's Church in Savin Hill. Within the circle, someone had also marked in five small black squares and two large blue dots. The squares are? I looked at him. Approximate locations of the residences in 1974 of Jack Rouse, Stan and DeAndre Timpson, Emma Herlihy, Jerry Glynn, and Edgar Kenzie. The two blue dots are the murder sites of Cal Morrison and Charles Rugglestone. Both the squares and dots are within a quarter square mile of each other. I stared at the map. My neighborhood. A tiny, mostly forgotten, hard scrabble place of three deckers and faded A frames, cubbyhole taverns, and corner stores. Outside of the occasional bar brawl, not the type of place that called much attention to itself. Yet here was the FBI shining a national spotlight down on it. What you're looking at there, Bolton said, is a kill zone. I called Angie from an empty conference room. She answered on the fourth ring out of breath. Hey, I just came through the door. What you doing? Talking to you, you pinhead, and opening my mail. Bill, 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 take out menu. Bill, how was May? Fine, I just dropped her off with Grace. How was your day? The guy with the goatee's name is Evandro Arujo. He was Alec Hardman's partner in life in the joint. Bullshit. Nope. Looks like he's our guy. But he doesn't know you. This is true. So why would he leave your card in Kara's hand? Coincidence? Fine. But Jason getting killed too? Really, really big coincidence. She sighed and I could hear her rip into an envelope. This doesn't make total sense yet. Agreed, I said. Tell me about Hardiman. I did. And then I took her through my day, as she ripped open more envelopes and said, yeah, yeah, in a distracted tone, which would have annoyed me if I hadn't known her well enough to know she could talk on the telephone, listen to the radio, watch TV, and cook pasta while carrying on a half conversation with someone else in the room, and she'd still hear every word I said. But halfway through my story, the yeah stopped, and I got nothing but silence. And it wasn't a rapt silence. It was a thick one. Ange. Nothing. Ange, I said again. Patrick, she said. And her voice was so small, it seemed to have no body attached to it. What? What's wrong? I just got a photograph in the mail. I stood up from the chair so quickly I could see the lights of the city jerk and slant and spin around me. Of who? Of me, she said. Then, and Phil.
Chapter 25 I'm supposed to be afraid of this guy? Phil held up one of the photos Angie'd taken of Evandro. Yes, Bolton said. Phil flapped the photo in his hand. Well, I'm not. Believe me, Phil, I said. You should be. He looked at all of us, Bolton, Devon, Oscar, Angie, and myself, packed into Angie's tiny kitchen, and shook his head. He reached under his jacket and pulled out a pistol, pointed it at the floor, and checked the load. Jesus, Phil, Angie said. Put it away. You got a permit for that? Devon said. Phil kept his eyes down, the roots of his hair dark with sweat. Mr. DeMassey, Bolton said, you won't need that. We'll protect you. Phil said, sure, very softly. We waited as he glanced back at the photo he'd left on the counter and back to the gun in his hand, and fear began to seep out his pores. He looked at Angie once, then back at the floor, and I could tell he was trying to process it all. He'd come home from work and been met outside his apartment by federal agents who took him over here, where he was informed that someone he'd never met was determined to stop the beating of his heart, probably within the week. Eventually, he looked up from the floor and his normally olive skin was the color of skim milk. He caught my eye and flashed his boyish grin, shook his head as if we were somehow in this together. Okay, he said. Maybe I'm a little scared. The bubble of tension that hung pregnant in the kitchen popped softly and bled out under the back door. He laid the gun on the oven top and hoisted himself up on the counter, raised a slightly bemused eyebrow at Bolton. So tell me about this guy. An agent stuck his head into the kitchen. Agent Bolton, sir? No signs that anyone's been tampering with any locks or access areas to the house. We swept for bugs and it's clean. Backyard is overgrown and shows no evidence it's been walked in for at least a month. Bolton nodded and the agent left. Agent Bolton, Phil said. Bolton turned back to him. Could you please tell me about this guy who wants to kill me and my wife? X, Phil, Angie said softly. X, sorry. He looked at Bolton. Me and my ex-wife then. Bolton leaned against the fridge as Devin and Oscar settled into chairs, and I sat up on the counter on the other side of the oven. The man's name is Evandro Arujo, Bolton said. He's a suspect in four murders in the last month. In every one of these cases, he sent photographs to his intended victims or their loved ones. Photos like that one. Phil indicated the picture of him and Angie, which lay on the kitchen table, powdered with fingerprint dust. Yes. It had been taken recently. Fallen leaves littering the foreground were multicolored. Phil was listening to something Angie was saying. His head down, hers turned toward him as they walked the stretch of grass and pavement which cut through the center of Commonwealth Avenue. But there's nothing threatening about that picture. Bolton nodded. Except that it was taken at all, and then sent to Ms. Gennaro. Have you ever heard of Evandro Rujo? No. Alec Hardiman. Nope. Peter Stimovich or Pamela Stokes? Phil thought about it. Both sound vaguely familiar. Bolton opened the file in his hand, passed photos of Stimovich and Stokes to him. Phil's face darkened. Wasn't this guy stabbed to death last week? Bolton said. A lot worse than stabbed. The paper said stabbed. Phil said. Something about his girlfriend's ex-boyfriend being a suspect. Bolton shook his head. That's the story we leaked. Stimovich's girlfriend had no ex-boyfriend of note. Phil held up the Pamela Stokes photo. She did too? Yes. Phil rubbed his eyes. Fuck, he said. And it came out in a ripple, as if riding a laugh or a shudder. Have you ever met either of them? Phil shook his head. How about Jason Warren? Phil looked over at Angie. The kid you were trying to protect? The one who died? She nodded. She hadn't spoken much since we arrived. 
She chain smoked and stared out the window facing the backyard. Kara Ryder? Bolton said. She was killed by this asshole too? Bolton nodded. Jesus! Phil came off the counter gingerly, as if not sure there'd be a floor waiting to meet him. He crossed stiffly to Angie, took a cigarette from her pack, lit it, and looked down at his ex-wife. She watched him the way you'd watch someone who'd just been informed he has cancer. Not sure if you should give him space to lash out or stay close to catch him if he crumbles. He placed a hand on her cheek and she leaned into it in something deeply intimate. Some acknowledgement of what rooted them to each other passed between them. Mr. DeMassey, did you know Kara Ryder? Phil withdrew his hand from Angie's cheek in a slow caress and walked back to the counter. I knew her when she was growing up. We all did. Had you seen her recently? He shook his head. Not in three or four years. He stared at his cigarette, then flicked ash into the sink. Why us, Mr. Bolton? We don't know, Bolton said, and there was an edge of desperate irritation in his voice. We're hunting a Rujo now, and his face will be plastered over every newspaper in New England by tomorrow morning. He can't hide long. We still don't know why he's targeting the people he's targeting, except in the Warren case where we have a possible motive. But at least now we know who he's targeting, and we can watch both you and Miss Gennaro. Erdem came into the kitchen. Perimeters of both this house and Mr. DeMassey's apartment building are secure. Bolton nodded and rubbed his face with fleshy hands. Okay, Mr. DeMassey, he said. Here it is. Twenty years ago, a man named Alec Hardiman murdered his friend Charles Rugglestone in a warehouse about six blocks from here. We believe that Hardiman and Rugglestone were responsible for a string of murders at the time, the most notorious of which was Cal Morrison's crucifixion. I remember Cal, Phil said. Did you know him well? No, he was a couple of years older than us. I never heard about a crucifixion, though. He was stabbed. Bolton shook his head. Again, a story leaked to the media to buy time and eliminate nutcases who'd confessed to killing Hoffa and both Kennedys before breakfast. Morrison was crucified. Six days later, Hardiman went berserk and did the work of ten psychotic men on his partner, Rugglestone. No one knows why, except that both men had large quantities of PCP and alcohol in their systems at the time. Hardiman went to Walpole for life, and 12 years later he took Arujo and turned him into a psychopath. Arujo was relatively innocent when he went in, but now he's anything but. You see him, Devin said. You run, Phil. Phil swallowed and gave a small nod. Arujo's been out for six months. Bolton said, We believe Hardiman has a contact on the outside. A second killer who either fosters Arujo's need to kill or vice versa. We're not positive about this, but we're leaning that way. For some unknown reason, Hardiman, Arujo, and this unknown third man are pointing us in one direction only. This neighborhood. And they're pointing us towards certain people. Mr. Kenzie, DeAndre Warren... Stan Timpson, Kevin Hurley, and Jack Rouse. But we don't know why. And these other people, Stimovich and Stokes, what's their connection to the neighborhood? We believe they might just be random. Thrill kills. No motivation outside of the kill itself. So why are Angie and me being targeted? Bolton shrugged. Could be a ruse. We don't know. Could be they're just trying to rattle Miss Gennaro's cage because she's involved in tracking them. Whoever Arujo's partner is, they both intended for Mr. Kenzie and Miss Gennaro to be in this from the start. Kara Ryder's role was specifically designed for that purpose. And then, maybe. Bolton said and looked at me. He's trying to force Mr. Kenzie to make that choice Hardiman spoke of. Everyone looked at me. Hardiman said I'd be forced to make some kind of choice. He said, Not everyone you love can live. Maybe my choice is between saving Phil or saving Angie. 
Phil shook his head. But anyone who knows us knows we haven't been close in over a decade, Patrick. I nodded. But you used to be? Bolton said. Like brothers. Phil said. And I tried to detect bitterness and self-pity in his voice. I only heard a quiet, sad acceptance. For how long? Bolton said. From the crib till we were like twenty, right? I shrugged. Around there, yeah. I looked at Angie, but she stared at the floor. Bolton said, Hardiman said you'd met before, Mr. Kenzie. I never met the man. Or you don't recall it. I'd remember that face, I said. If you saw it as an adult, sure, but as a kid. He handed Phil two photos of Hardiman, one from 74, the other from the present. Phil stared at them, and I could see he wanted to recognize Hardiman. To have this make sense? For there to be a reason this man had targeted him for death? Eventually he closed his eyes, exhaled loudly, and shook his head. I've never seen this guy before. You're sure? He handed the photos back. Positive. Well, that's too bad, Bolton said, because he's part of your life now. An agent drove Phil home at eight, and Angie, Devon, Oscar, and I headed to my place so I could fill an overnight bag. Bolton wanted Angie to appear vulnerable, alone. But we convinced him that if Evandro or his partner had been studying us, we should appear as normal as possible. And hanging out with Devon and Oscar was something we did at least once a month, though not usually sober. As for my moving in with Angie, I insisted upon it, whether Bolton gave a shit or not. Actually, though, he liked the idea. I've thought you two were sleeping together since we met, so I'm sure Evandro assumes the same. You're a pig, Angie said, and he shrugged. Back at my place, we settled into the kitchen while I pulled clothes from my dryer and stuffed them into a gym bag. Looking out my window, I saw Lyle Dimmick finishing up for the day, wiping paint off his hands and placing the brush in a can of thinner. So how's your relationship with the feds? I asked Devin. Deteriorating by the day, he said. Why do you think we were shut out of the Alec Hardman visit this afternoon? So you demoted to babysitting us? Angie said. Actually, Oscar said, we asked for this specifically. Can't wait to see how you two do in close quarters. He looked at Devin and they both laughed. Devin found a stuffed frog May had left behind on my counter and picked it up. Yours? May's. Sure. He held it up in front of him and made faces at it. You two might want to keep this guy, he said, if only to provide some counterbalance. We've lived together before, Angie said and scowled. True, Devin said, for two weeks. But you'd just walked out on your husband, Ange, and neither of you spent too much time around each other back then, if I remember. Patrick practically moved into Fenway Park, and you were always out nights clubbing your way through Kenmore Square. Now, you'll be forced together for the length of this investigation. Could be months, even years before it's over. He spoke to the frog. What do you think of that? I looked out the window as he and Oscar giggled and Angie fumed. Lyle descended the scaffolding, radio and cooler grasped awkwardly in one hand, bottle of Jack sticking out of his back pocket. Watching him... Something bugged me. I'd never known him to work past five. And it was 8.30 now. Beyond that, he'd told me this morning that his tooth hurt. Got any chips around here? Oscar said. Angie stood, went to the cabinets over the oven. With Patrick, a good food supply is never a safe bet. She opened the left cabinet, rummaged through some cans. This morning, May and I ate breakfast. But that was after I'd talked to Lyle. After I'd talked to Kevin. I'd come back in the kitchen. Called Bubba. What'd I tell you? Angie said to Oscar and opened the middle cabinet. No chips here either. You two will get along just fine. Devin said. 
After Baba, I'd asked Lyle to keep his music down because May was still asleep. And he said, Last try. Angie reached for the right cabinet door. He didn't mind because he had a dentist appointment and was only working a half day. I stood up and looked out the window, down into the yard below the scaffolding, as Angie screamed and jumped back from the cabinet. The yard was empty. Lyle was gone. I looked at the cabinet and the first thing I noticed were eyes staring back at me. They were blue and they were human and they weren't attached to anything. Oscar grabbed his walkie-talkie. Get me Bolton now. Angie stumbled back along the table. Oh, shit. Devin, I said. That house painter. Lyle Dimmick, he said. We ran a check on him. That wasn't Lyle, I said. Oscar caught on to our conversation as Bolton came over the walkie-talkie. Bolton, Oscar said. Fan your men out. Arujo's in the area dressed like a cowboy house painter. He just left. Heading in which direction? I don't know. Fan out your men. We're rolling. Angie and I took my back stairs three at a time and vaulted the porch railing into my backyard, guns drawn. He could have gone in three directions. If he'd gone west through backyards, he'd still be doing it because there wasn't a cross street on this side for four city blocks. If he'd gone north toward the school, he would have run to the FBI. That left south to the block behind mine, or east to Dorchester Avenue. I took south, and you went east. And neither of us found him. And neither did Devin or Oscar. And none of the FBI had any luck either. By nine... A helicopter flew over the neighborhood and they'd brought in dogs and agents were doing house-to-house -house searches. My neighbors weren't too keen on me last year when I nearly brought a gang war to their doorsteps. I could only imagine what ancient Celtic curses they were hurling at my soul tonight. Evandro Rujo had bypassed the security system by posing as Lyle Dimmick. Any neighbor looking out a window and seeing a ladder propped up on my third-floor windows would just have assumed Ed Donegan now owned my building, too, and had hired Lyle to paint it. The motherfucker had been inside my home. The eyes, it was assumed, belonged to Peter Stimovich, who'd been found without his own, a detail Bolton had omitted. Thanks for telling me, I said. Kenzie, he said with his perpetual sigh, I'm not paid to keep you in the loop. I'm paid to bring you into it only insofar as it suits our needs. Under the eyes, which a federal M.E. lifted gelatinously from my cupboard and placed in separate plastic bags, I'd been left another note, a white envelope, and a large stack of flyers. The note said, So nice to see you again, in the same typeface as the first two. Bolton took the envelope before I could open it, then looked at the other notes I'd received in the last month. How come you never came forward with these? I didn't know they were from him. He handed them to a lab tech. Kenzie and Gennaro's prints are on file with Agent Erdem. Take the bumper stickers, too. What do you make of the flyers? Devin said. There were over a thousand of them in two neat stacks bound by rubber bands, some yellowed by age, some wrinkled, some only ten days old. They all showed photographs in the left corner of missing children, with vital statistics listed below the photos. And they all bore the same legend. Have you seen me? Well, no, I hadn't. Over the years, I'd received hundreds of these flyers in the mail, I suppose. And I always looked closely just to be sure, before tossing them in the trash. But in all that time, I'd never seen a face I recognized. Receiving them once a week or so. It was easy to forget about them. But now, leafing through them with rubber gloves bound over my hands so tightly I could feel the sweat bleeding from the pores of my palms, it was overwhelming. Thousands of them. Gone. A country unto themselves. A half-dreamt litter of misplaced lives. So many of them, I assumed, were dead. 
Others, I'm sure, had been found, always worse off than when they'd disappeared. The rest of them were cast adrift and floating like a traveling carnival across our landscape, passing like blips through the hearts of our cities, sleeping on stone and grates and discarded mattresses, hollow-cheeked and sallow-skinned, eyes blank, and hair filled with nits. It's the same as the bumper stickers, Bolton said. How so? Oscar said. He wants Kenzie to share his postmodern malaise. That the world is off its hinges and can't be reattached. That a thousand voices shout inane opinions at one another, and not one will change any of the others. That we are constantly at cross-purposes and there's no holistic shared accumulation of knowledge. That children disappear every day and we say, how tragic, pass the salt. He looked at me. Sound right? Maybe. Angie shook her head. No. Bullshit. Excuse me? Bullshit, she said. Maybe that's part of it, but it isn't all of his message. Agent Bolton, you've accepted that we probably have two killers, not just one little Evandro Arujo in our hands, correct? He nodded. The second one, he's been waiting, or hell, incubating for two decades. That's the prevailing theory, right? That's it? She nodded. She lit a cigarette and held it up. I've tried to quit smoking several times. You know how much effort that takes? You know how much I would have appreciated it at this moment if you'd succeeded? Bolton said, ducking from the cloud of smoke which filtered over the kitchen. Too bad, she shrugged. My point is that we all have our addiction of choice, the one thing that gets us to our soul, that is us, in a way. What couldn't you live without? Me, he said. You. He smiled and looked away, slightly embarrassed. Books. Books! Oscar laughed. He turned on him. What's wrong with that? Nothing, nothing. Go on, Agent Bolton. You the man. What kind of books? Angie said. The great ones, Bolton said, a little sheepish. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Joyce, Shakespeare, Flaubert. And if they were outlawed, Angie said. I'd break the law, Bolton said. You wild man, Devin said. I am appalled. Hey, Bolton glared at him. What about you, Oscar? Food, Oscar said and patted his belly. Not health food, but real tasty heart attack food. Steaks, ribs, eggs, chicken, fried steak and gravy. Devin said, what a shock. Damn, Oscar said, just when I made myself hungry. Devin? Cigarettes, he said. Booze, probably. Patrick. Sex. You, Oscar said, are a whore, Kenzie. Fine, Angie said. These are the things that get us through, make life bearable. Cigarettes, books, food, cigarettes again, booze, and sex. That's us. She tapped the stack of flyers. What about him? What can't he go without? Killing, I said. That'd be my guess, she said. So, Oscar said, if he's been forced to take a vacation for 20 years, no way he'd make it, Devin said. No fucking way. But he hasn't been calling attention to his kills, Bolton said. Angie lifted a stack of flyers. Until now. He's been killing kids, I said, for 20 years, Angie said. Erdem came in at 10 to report that a man wearing a cowboy hat and driving a stolen red Jeep Cherokee had blown a red light at an intersection on Williston Beach. Quincy police had given chase and lost him on a steep curve of 3A in Weymouth, which he maneuvered and they didn't. Chasing a fucking Jeep on a curve? 
Devin said in disbelief. These Mary Andretti slide out, but a somersault machine like a Cherokee holds the curve? That's the size of it. Last seen heading south over the bridge by the old naval yard. What time was that? Bolton said. Erdem checked his notes. 9.35 on Wollaston. 9.44 when they lost him. Anything else? Bolton said. Yeah. Erdem said slowly, looking at me. What? Malin. Field stepped into the kitchen holding a stack of small tape recorders and at least 50 feet of coaxial cable. What's that? Bolton said. He bugged the entire apartment. Field said, refusing to look at me. The recorders were fastened by electrical tape to the underside of the landlord's porch. No tapes inside. The cables fed into a junction poured up on the roof, mixed in with the cable TV and electrical and phone lines. He ran the cables down the side of the house with the rest of the wires, and you'd never notice unless you were looking for it. You're shitting me, I said. Fields gave me an apologetic shake of his head. Afraid not. By the amount of dust and mildew I found on these cables, I'd say he's been listening to everything going on inside your apartment for at least a week. He shrugged. Maybe more. <laughs>